The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy. How the New World Order, Man-Made Diseases, and Zombie Banks are Destroying America. By Jim Mars. Read by John Pruden. Copyright 2010 by Jim Mars. Production Copyright 2010 by HarperCollins Publishers. Introduction Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of the day, but a series of oppressions begun at the distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers too plainly proves a deliberate systematic plan of reducing us to slavery. Thomas Jefferson Today, Jefferson's words might read, an occasional act of tyranny may be excused as a momentary lapse of judgment by officials, but a continuous series of such acts pursued through both Democratic and Republican administrations clearly proves there is a deliberate and systematic plan to reduce once free Americans to slavery. To be a zombie is to exist under the most onerous bonds of slavery, bonds that allow for no thought to one's actions. Zombies are controlled both mentally and physically by some outside force, whether through a virus causing them to seek blood or voodoo magic. A zombie is neither dead nor alive, and usually under the control of someone else, as in the old Hollywood films. Zombies stumble about, largely unaware of the world around them intent on purposes that others have created for them through alchemy or electromagnetism. In old horror movies, actors Bela Lugosi and John Carradine controlled zombies, causing them to commit acts that ran against human nature. And now zombies are everywhere. They're highly popular grists for movies, books, comics, and computer games. Is it just a coincidence that zombies are so popular? Or is it possible that Americans like zombies because they offer us a reflection of how we perceive ourselves as barely alive and living mindlessly? Many individuals today stumble through their daily chores without caring or knowing why they do so. These people might be numbed by drugs, or the incessant bombardment by the broadcast media. But whatever the case, many Americans seem like zombies in so many ways. The term zombie is being applied to more and more aspects of life in modern America. Adderall is one of the most popular of the faddish new psychiatric drugs to combat attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder. This drug consists of equal amounts of the stimulants amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. In fact, ADHDtreatment.org describes a side effect of Adderall as zombie demeanor. The word zombie has so pervaded our society that it has worked its way into the scientific community's lexicon. In mid-May 2009, Researchers at the University of Texas and Texas A&M's AgriLife Extension Service in East Texas reported that they had found a way to control the state's fire ant infestation. They discovered that the tiny forid fly, a native of the South American region where the fire ants in Texas originated, could dive bomb the ants and lay eggs on them. The eggs would hatch inside the ants and eat away their brains turning them into what scientists called zombie ants. The ants would wander aimlessly for about two weeks until their heads fell off. Not only does the word describe how we view our own existence, but it has, and can still be, applied to the dissolution of the pillars of our society, most notably our banks. During the recent financial fiasco, the banks whose liabilities exceeded their assets were called zombie banks. As author Bill Sardi, a regular contributor to LouRockwell.com, explained, 
Zombie banks are defined as a financial institution with an economic net worth that is less than zero, but which continues to operate because its ability to repay its debts is shored up by implicit or explicit government credit support. In a sense, they were dead but still going through the motions of life. America is now confronted with an economic situation that is being compared to the Great Depression. And the only solutions seem to lie in aggregating debt, deflating the value of the dollar, and moving riches around. Not only that, but the scale of our economic problems has vastly increased. On October 1, 2008, the national debt was $10 trillion. But during 2009, it climbed to nearly $12 trillion, the single largest increase in a year. If every American man, woman, and child were to liquidate every asset he or she owns, the total could not equal this debt. The term trillion is bandied about lightly by the mass media, yet most people cannot truly conceive of the significance of such a number. A trillion square miles would encompass 3.7 million states the size of Texas, which covers approximately 270,000 square miles. A trillion dollars, on the other hand, could be made of one-dollar bills stretching all the way to our sun and back. If banking institutions that operate at a deficit are called zombie banks, then couldn't we call a country whose debts exceed its assets a zombie nation? And perhaps this epithet could also be applied to its citizens. In 2008, many saw the nation turn from National Socialism to Marxist Socialism when the totalitarian Bush administration turned over power to the Obama administration an administration that favors socialist Medicare policies and redistributions of wealth. America's zombies now face a further loss of individual freedoms due to corrupt politics, corporate malfeasance, and legislation that continues to curtail individual freedom. As readers of Rule by Secrecy and The Rise of the Fourth Reich will understand, the global financiers the global plutocrats of Wall Street, London, and Switzerland, have manipulated Western history for at least the past century. First, by creating the Federal Reserve in America by deceitful political machinations. Then communism in Russia by funding the Bolsheviks rather than the white Russians. And followed by financing National Socialism, the Nazis, in Germany. Now these global financiers have taken control of the United States and are changing it in such ways that we now live in a society unimaginable to citizens of just two decades ago. For instance, in the 1950s, Ronald Reagan publicly warned against socialized medicine. Today the argument is just how socialized it will be. The information highway is a traffic jam of hype misinformation, disinformation, distractions, and propaganda. New attempts to transform technology, health care, education, and the political system are being reported every day. More and more Americans have been forced to focus on the dark side of contemporary life. Now, we live under the tyranny of a new world order, a world that has been reordered by a small group of wealthy financiers and industrialists centered within secret societies such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group. Also, one must consider how this new world has become more and more a surveillance society and police state, existing under a financially unstable infrastructure and fed by corporations that hold monopolies on food, water, and drugs. Are we living in a fascist government? Possibly. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language defines fascism as a philosophy or system of government that advocates or exercises a dictatorship of the extreme right, typically through the merging of state and business leadership together with an ideology of belligerent nationalism. 
Today, of course, the dictatorship would be of the extreme left, but nevertheless would include the power of both the government and the corporations that have their hands in public affairs. Many people today believe the United States is going to hell in a handbasket, that the United States is no longer a vibrant republic based on constitutional law, but rather a brain-dead and decaying empire being taken over by an entrenched financial elite who seek a worldwide socialist order to dominate. This belief grows among Americans as they read the daily headlines and listen to the electronic mass media. People are seeking true change, not mere political rhetoric, but they feel befuddled as they can't understand who precisely has hijacked their country. Some Americans are acting out. In tea parties and in a massive demonstration in Washington on September 12, 2009, Tens of thousands of Americans displayed their dissatisfaction with where the nation is going. What does one call a country that seems to be merely mimicking the robust republic it used to be, whose population has been dumbed down by controversial educational programs, drugged out by an ever-growing pharmaceutical industry, and frightened into submission by constant threats of terrorism and economic collapse? Would this not be a zombie nation? A nation that goes through the motions in commerce, politics, health, and education, but without a spark of life, verve, or enthusiasm. This is the true horror story. What happened? How did the nation get this way? Was it simply a case of inattention by the electorate? The natural evolution of a society grown prosperous and complacent? Overreaching greed and lust for profit by corporate leaders? Or could it have been a conspiracy? Part 1. A Zombie Nation I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Attributed to Abraham Lincoln Economic Decline Times are tough for America. Thanks to what Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner called the failure of America's financial system, by the start of 2010, more than $5 trillion of household wealth had evaporated. About one in every eight mortgages was in default or foreclosure. It is predicted that there will be 10 million foreclosures on homes through 2012. One in every eight adults and one in four children now subsist on government food stamps. All of these problems were exacerbated by high rates of unemployment. According to an Associated Press report, one in every five Americans is unemployed or underemployed, with the number expected to rise in 2010, causing the second highest unemployment figure since World War II. Dissension and dissatisfaction are widespread, and they're linked to the poor economy. If the economy were the hands of a zombie, those hands would be bound by debt. Charles K. Rowley is a professor of economics at George Mason University and general director of the Locke Institute in Fairfax, Virginia. He's widely considered to be a major voice in political and economic thought. In an article for the United Kingdom's Daily Telegraph, Rowley wrote, The U.S. economy suffers from a growing culture of indebtedness that has increasingly contaminated the federal government since 2001 and has spilled over dramatically into private household behavior. He also raised a popular question asking, If excessive government indebtedness is a major source of the problem, why increase the government debt? Why encourage households to go yet further into debt? Ominously, Rowley predicted, It is not impossible that the U.S. will experience the kind of economic collapse from first to third world status experienced by Argentina 
under the national socialist governance of Juan Perón. In other words, if the U.S. government cannot find ways of living within its means, as most families are forced to do, the nation may fall into third world status, complete with scarcities of food and water, consumer goods, and socialized government control. One of the barely noticed aspects of the financial crisis is the substantial drop in tax revenues. Even as the Obama administration and Congress spend more money to stimulate the economy. According to CNN, through the end of August 2009, the federal government collected 25% less tax revenue than for the same eight month period in 2008. The Congressional Budget Office predicted tax receipts would fall to 14% of the gross domestic product, a sharp decline from the historical average of 18.3%. Additionally, individual income tax revenues fell 20%, while corporate income taxes dropped a whopping 56%. Predictions for 2010 were not much better. And the loss of governmental revenue has filtered down to local governments. Increasing unemployment has caused 32 state unemployment insurance trust funds to fall below the recommended federal level, indicating these states will require massive federal loans to continue assistance for the jobless. Officials in Vigo County, Indiana, announced in mid-2009 that they could no longer afford to bury a dead person if that dead person had no savings, insurance, or family money set aside for a funeral. In Atlanta, citizens' groups have tried to stop city plans to demolish its remaining public housing units. More than 20 counties in Michigan have reverted paved roads to gravel in an effort to save money, according to the County Road Association of Michigan. The Wall Street Journal has reported that 90% of all U.S. businesses are family-owned or controlled. The financial crisis has forced many to close their doors. In fact, the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated between the fourth quarter of 2007 and the fourth quarter of 2008, some four million firms with 19 or fewer employees went out of business. The American public in 2009 managed to actually increase their savings, but runaway deficit spending by the government undermined their efforts. Peter Schiff, the author of Crash Proof, explained, The simple truth is that government debt is our debt. So if a family manages at some cost to their lifestyle to squirrel away an extra $1,000 in savings this year, but the government adds $20,000 in new debt per household, each family's approximate share of the $1.8 trillion fiscal 2009 deficit, that family ends up owing $19,000 more than they did at the beginning of the year. Socialism and Loss of Individuality Socialism is a key word in understanding what has happened to America. Most dictionaries define socialism as the collective ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods and services. Invariably, a centralized authority is needed to administer these means. The communist leader, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, foresaw a worker's paradise where each person will be voluntarily engaged in work according to his capacities, and each will freely take according to his needs. But, as Lenin noted, before a person could freely take from the state, that person must become subordinate to the state. All our lives we fought against exalting the individual, said Lenin. Espousing the same agenda of the early-day Western globalists who funded the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution of 1917, Lenin proclaimed, The aim of socialism is not only to abolish the present division of mankind into small states and all national isolation, not only to bring the nations closer to each other, but also to merge them. He also may have foreseen the methods being used to bring down the American Republic when he said, The surest way to destroy a nation is to debauch its currency. And, Give me four years to teach the children, 
and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. As former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Paul Craig Roberts stated in a treatise on the first principles of freedom, a person born before the turn of the 20th century was born a private individual. He was born into a world in which his existence was attested by his mere physical presence, without documents, forms, permits, licenses, orders, lists of currency carried in and out, identity cards, draft cards, ration cards, exit stamps, customs declarations, questionnaires, tax forms, reports in multiplicate, social security number, or other authentications of his being, birth, nationality, status, beliefs, creed, right to be, enter, leave, move about, work, trade, purchase, dwell. Many people take private individuals for granted, and they will find what I am saying far-fetched. But private individuals do not exist in the Soviet Union or in China, where the claims of the state are total, and even art and literature must be subservient to the interests of the state. Roberts presented an example of how bureaucracy has begun to erode the liberties of American citizens. In the 1970s, U.S. District Judge Wilbur Owens instructed the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia to use involuntary transfers of faculty members between system institutions to achieve racial balance among the faculties. As long as the involuntary transfers of teachers was intra-city and confined to elementary and high school teachers, my liberal colleagues saw it as social progress. But once they faced intercity involuntary transfers, they called it fascism. It is true that until the liberal progress of the 1960s, government direction of labor in this century was unique to the Hitler and Stalin regimes. As is often the case, People realize the consequences of statist ideas only when their own private individualities are touched. But the fleecing of America did not merely start in the 1970s. It's been going on for many more decades. Consider a 1934 editorial cartoon published in the Chicago Tribune entitled Planned Economy or Planned Destruction. In the drawing, there are men identified as young pinkies from Columbia and Harvard, who are shoveling money from a cart. Beneath the cart sits a disheveled Leon Trotsky writing, Plan of Action for U.S. Spend, 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 under the guise of recovery. Bust the government, blame the capitalists for the failure, junk the Constitution, and declare a dictatorship. This cartoon might well have been drawn by a conservative cartoonist of today. A few older citizens may recall the words of Norman Mattoon Thomas, a pacifist who ran for president six times between 1928 and 1948 under the Socialist Party of America banner. The American people will never knowingly adopt socialism, he said, but under the name of liberalism they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. In a 1948 interview, Thomas said he was retiring from American politics because both the Democratic and Republican parties had adopted every plank of the Socialists' platform, and there was no longer a need for the alternative Socialist Party. If Thomas was possibly correct in 1948, he is undoubtedly correct now. Many people see what was once termed creeping socialism in the United States now full-blown policy in Washington. This perception was reflected on the February 16, 2009 cover of Newsweek that declared, We are all socialists now. Many Americans cringed at the nationalization of the banking and auto industries. They feared more would follow. Tea Parties Beginning in April 2009, protests against out-of-control government spending, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the squabble over health care spread nationwide in citizen meetings termed Tea Parties. The name came from the original Boston Tea Party of 1773, when American colonists tossed shipments of tea into Boston Harbor in protest of the British government's 
taxation without representation. Many modern wits have pointed out, if the colonists thought taxation without representation was bad, they should see taxation with representation. In 2009, the spirit of protest spilled over into several town hall meetings where members of Congress, off for the summer recess, were shouted at and, in some cases, chased from the hall by constituents angered by what they saw as President Obama's socialist health care plan and general government malfeasance. This groundswell of public protest continued into 2010, with even more tea parties and demonstrations of anger over perceived socialist giveaway programs, the health care crisis, corporate bailouts, and the destruction of the U.S. economy, all of which will be discussed later. New World Order Many concerned citizens turned to alternative radio talk shows and Internet blogs to learn more about a plan by globalists to control the world, one that President George H.W. Bush called the New World Order. It's a term that Adolf Hitler once used. Self-styled globalists are those people who believe themselves above petty nationalism. These men and women deal with the planet Earth as their sphere of influence. Many view the United States as a not-so-profitable division of their multinational corporations. Globalists adhere to the old Illuminati philosophy of the end justifies the means. Although most would disdain any connection to that elder secret society or the Nazis who carried this philosophy to its political extremes. In the book Shadow Elite, Janine Waddell described globalists as flexians, members of a transnational elite, the mover and shaker who serves at one and the same time as business consultant, think tanker, TV pundit, and government advisor, and glides in and around the organizations that enlist his services. It is not just his time that is divided. His loyalties, too, are often flexible. Despite the scoffs of flexians within the corporate mass media and bought-off politicians, the New World Order does exist, and it often makes far-reaching plans. President T. Woodrow Wilson wrote that the bulk of money sent to Russia from the United States at the time of the Russian Revolution went to the Bolsheviks, the forerunners of the Communists. These funds came from the Rockefellers and other Wall Street capitalists such as Jacob Schiff, Elihu Root, J.P. Morgan, and the Harriman family. W. Averill Harriman became U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union during World War II. These men and others also provided initial funding for the Council on Foreign Relations. When these same globalists became fearful of worldwide communism, they needed separate national or economic blocks to play off against each other for the tensions necessary for maximum profit and control. They supported National Socialism in Germany. German Army Intelligence Agent Adolf Hitler was funded to provide a bulwark against the Communist tide by enlarging his National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis, in turn sowing the seeds of World War II. Three prominent Americans who were instrumental in funding the Nazis were National City Bank, now Citicorp, Chairman John J. McCloy, Schroeder Bank attorneys Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, and Prescott Bush, a director of Union Banking Corporation and the Hamburg America shipping line. It is interesting to note that following World War II, McCloy became the High Commissioner of Occupied Germany. John Foster Dulles became President Eisenhower's Secretary of State. Alan Dulles became the longest-serving CIA director. And Bush, as a senator from Connecticut, was instrumental in forming the CIA. It might also be noted that both McCloy and Alan Dulles sat on the largely discredited Warren Commission assigned by President Lyndon B. Johnson to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. After World War II, the globalist agenda was advanced by the creation of the United Nations. 
An earlier attempt to create a transnational organization, the League of Nations, failed because the U.S. Senate thought that ratification would end American sovereignty. Nick Rockefeller, a participant in the World Economic Forum and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, may have revealed the agenda of the New World Order in a casual comment. According to the late Hollywood producer Aaron Russo, Rockefeller told him, The end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the bankers and the elite people control the world. Catherine Austin Fitz, Assistant Secretary of Housing during the George H.W. Bush presidency, wrote in early 2009, In the fall of 2001, I attended a private investment conference in London to give a paper, The Myth of the Rule of Law, or How the Money Works, The Destruction of Hamilton Securities Group. The presentation documented my experience with a Washington Wall Street partnership that had engineered a fraudulent housing and debt bubble illegally shifted vast amounts of capital out of the U.S., used privatization as a form of piracy, a pretext to move government assets to private investors at below market prices, and then shift private liabilities back to government at no cost to the private liability holder. Other presenters at the conference included distinguished reporters covering privatization in Eastern Europe and Russia. As the portraits of British ancestors stared down upon us, we listened to story after story of global privatization throughout the 1990s in the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Fitz reiterated Rockefeller's statement about a new world order ruled by a global elite. She noted, As the pieces fit together, we shared a horrifying epiphany. The banks, corporations, and investors acting in each global region were the exact same players. They were a relatively small group that reappeared again and again in Russia, Eastern Europe, and Asia, accompanied by the same well-known accounting firms and law firms. Clearly, there was a global financial coup d'etat underway. Walter Cronkite, the legendary anchor of CBS News, often referred to as the most trusted man in America, also stated his belief that the country was ruled by a small elite. Shortly before his death, in July 2009, Cronkite was asked if there was a ruling class in America. I'm afraid that there is, he replied. I don't think it serves the democracy well. But that is true. I think there is. The ruling class is the rich who really command our industry, our commerce, our finance. And those people are able to so manipulate our democracy that they really control the democracy, I feel. With the bulk of the public both manipulated and distracted by political parties and the corporate mass media, no one seems capable of discerning, much less opposing, this new world order of elitists with corporate, family, and class connections and common interests. Until the real rulers of America are identified and confronted, no amount of hand-wringing, letter-writing, or demonstrating can have any meaningful effect. Dissension in the Ranks The financial calamity of 2008 exposed the New World Order to be in slight disarray even before it was firmly established. Though the Obama administration is rife with men and women well connected to the centers of wealth and power, as will be seen, Control over both the economic and social conditions in the United States appeared to be getting out of their hands. There was even dissension in the ranks at the University of Chicago, which many consider to be the center of globalist thinking. The university's 1995 Nobel Memorial Prize winner in economic sciences, Robert E. Lucas, claimed the Obama administration's stimulus plans are schlock economics while his colleague, professor of finance John H. Cochran, stated they were based on discredited fairy tales. Their cry was reminiscent of the term voodoo economics used by George H. W. Bush against Ronald Reagan's free enterprise plans during the Republican presidential primaries in 1980. Paul Krugman, a New York Times op-ed columnist, and winner of the 2008 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences wrote, 
As I see it, the economics profession went astray because economists, as a group, mistook beauty, clad in impressive-looking mathematics, for truth. Until the Great Depression, most economists clung to a vision of capitalism as a perfect or nearly perfect system. That vision wasn't sustainable in the face of mass unemployment. But as memories of the Depression faded, economists fell back in love with the old idealized vision of an economy in which rational individuals interact in perfect markets, this time gussied up with fancy equations. The central cause of the profession's failure was the desire for an all-encompassing, intellectually elegant approach that also gave economists a chance to show off their mathematical prowess. Unfortunately, this romanticized and sanitized vision of the economy led most economists to ignore all the things that can go wrong. They turned a blind eye to the limitations of human rationality that often lead to bubbles and busts, to the problems of institutions that run amok, to the imperfections of markets, especially financial markets, that can cause the economy's operating system to undergo sudden, unpredictable crashes, and to the dangers created when regulators don't believe in regulation. Conspiracy theorists have long been ridiculed for their claims that the Great Depression was manufactured by globalist bankers. Krugman added much weight to that argument with a narrative involving a statement by the current chairman of the Fed's Board of Governors, Ben Bernanke. At a 90th birthday celebration for Milton Friedman, Ben Bernanke declared of the Great Depression, You're right. We did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, it won't happen again. The clear message was that all you need to avoid depressions is a smarter Fed. So we see that a plan is in play to debase the U.S. economy and impose a socialist system whether Obama's Marxist socialism or Bush's national socialism apparently makes no difference to those wealthy or powerful enough to control the central bureaucracy of the state. These globalists, who have manipulated world history for decades, if not centuries, are working a plan to turn the once free and prosperous Republic of the United States into a socialist state populated by dumbed-down and destitute zombies by draining dry the nation's money supply. It is truly a trillion-dollar conspiracy. Part 2. How to Create Zombies All socialism involves slavery. Herbert Spencer, British author, economist, and philosopher, 1884. Free people can travel anywhere, at any time they like. They can start a business or a new profession or even take a vacation for as long as they wish. One sure way to create a slave is to ensure a person is indebted. After all, anyone who cannot do any of the things a free person can do because he or she has a mortgage, bills of all sorts, and the need for a monthly paycheck should be considered a slave of sorts, a debt slave. Political Hacking Government is not reason. It is not eloquent. It is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. George Washington We shall consider politics the representative head of a zombie nation. Politics is a necessary partner in any widespread high-level conspiracy. There is an inseparable blend of political and financial control in modern America. This powerful combination can be found within the Federal Reserve System, in the corridors of Washington and Wall Street, and even in corporate news stories dealing with both politics and finance. Americans do not need an economics degree to figure out that the nation is past bankruptcy. Using the most conservative estimates, there is more than $70 trillion of American debt compared with about $13 trillion in gross domestic product. This does not include the $300 trillion or more in toxic derivative debt. Foreign Trade and Bonds 
International trade deficits have been draining the nation's reserves by $30 billion to $150 billion each year, and have been for the past 20 years. Furthermore, our industrial mining and agricultural institutions have not only been weakened, but in many ways decimated by the movement toward globalization. No new steel foundries have been built in the United States since World War II. The issue of debt is fundamental to understanding the machinations that formed the current economic crisis. By 2008, industry, banking, government, households, and individuals were smothered in debt. Eliminating debt will result in a society that looks far different from the one we have experienced in the past. The New York Times noted in a May 9, 2009 front-page report, the forces that enabled and even egged on consumers to save less and spend more, easy credit and skyrocketing asset values, could be permanently altered by the financial crisis that spun the economy into recession. The forces mentioned in the Times article means bloated salaries, one of the few remaining options to corporations for cutting expenses and balancing the budget. What is seen, then, is the culmination of a restructuring process that has taken place for more than two decades. Whereas the living standard has increased in many former dictatorships, such as Russia and China, it has decreased in the United States, thanks to these forces, controlled by the New World Order plutocrats. Given the consistent transfer of money between nations, is it possible that the economic meltdown was not accidental? Some people claim the so-called bailout is nothing but the largest transfer of wealth in Western history, a panicked effort to shore up the U.S. dollar. Additionally, not only was the U.S. dollar in danger, but its bonds were, too. Dollar-based grand net bonds net inflow dropped from an early 2007 high of about $950 billion to a 2009 low of nearly $200 billion, indicating a lack of faith in U.S. money. The foreign creditors are moving away from the United States plain and simple, wrote statistical analyst Jim Willie. Willie went on to say, The U.S. dollar stewards are not demonstrating control, discipline, or even anything remotely resembling honesty or integrity. If not for the U.S. Fed buying most of the U.S. Treasury bonds issued, the long-term interest rates would be rising rapidly and with alarm, hyperinflation. They put the U.S. dollar at grave risk. The Weimar territory lies directly ahead. The Chinese financial market is actually leading the U.S. market on directional turns. Sadly and tragically, the U.S. dollar is stuck in mud, running out of time, awaiting a meat cleaver by foreign creditors. Both China, the world's largest holder of foreign currency reserves, and Russia wield that cleaver. And both have called for a new global currency to replace the dollar as the dominant place to store reserves. One little-known and also one of the most unsettling aspects of the 2008 financial tsunami was the 2009 report that China's State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission or SASAC, might support large enterprises in defaulting on the derivatives contracts that they purchased in 2008 from international banks. The Chinese business had purchased the contracts to protect themselves from rising commodity prices. And if they default on these contracts, it would deal a serious blow to investment banks hoping to sell more derivative hedges in China which is the world's fastest expanding major economy and top commodities consumer. Another side to the problem is simply that any money China spends on bonds and derivatives is money they cannot loan to us. If China really wanted to spur domestic consumption, the best way to do so would be to stop buying our debt. Even better, they could sell treasuries they already own and distribute the proceeds to their citizens to spend wrote Peter Schiff, author and president of Euro-Pacific Capital. However, the Obama administration is heavily lobbying the Chinese to get them to step up to the plate and buy record amounts of new Treasury debt. Obama cannot have it both ways. 
He cannot claim he wants the Chinese to spend more, but then beg the Chinese government to take money away from Chinese consumers and loan it to the United States Treasury. In the end, Obama will get precisely what he publicly claims to desire, but privately dreads. The Chinese government will come to its senses and stop buying treasuries. This will cause the U.S. dollar to collapse, but it will also allow Chinese citizens to fully enjoy the fruits of their labor. Yet, as the Chinese people begin to buy more of their own products, it will mean fewer products available for export to America. And as they spend more money on goods and services, there will be less money to loan to America. This could only lead to a deeper economic crisis. The situation the United States finds itself in today is in many ways worse than that of the 1930s. More banks have failed than during the Great Depression, and unemployment is reaching levels of that time. But unlike the individuals of the 1930s, many of whom had come from an agricultural background and knew how to fend for themselves, the people in modern America can only look to government for their basic necessities. Could this push to government-regulated socialism be the real agenda behind the contrived financial meltdown of recent years? The difference between today and the Great Depression is primarily about the worth of money. The 1930s experienced a monetary depression. Money retained its value because it was simply hard to come by and prices were depressed to reflect its scarcity. Today, America is experiencing an inflationary depression. Prices continue to rise because of an inflated money supply. The more money that's in circulation, the less it's worth. Liars Loans William K. Black, a professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri School of Law in Kansas City, suggested that more than simple greed and incompetence brought about the economic crisis of 2008. In the 1980s, Black led the prosecution against miscreants in the savings and loan scandal. According to Black, the mortgage debacle was centered on the creation of AAA-rated bonds that did not use verified incomes, assets, or employment. These were known as liar's loans. Black pointed out that the liar's loans were deceitful and fraudulent, and the banks involved knew it. Fraud is deceit, and the essence of fraud is, I create trust in you, and then I betray that trust, and get you to give me something of value. And as a result, there's no more effective asset against trust than fraud, especially fraud by top elites. And that's what we have, Black told PBS commentator Bill Moyers in April 2009. The Bush administration essentially got rid of regulation. So if nobody was looking, you were able to do this with impunity. And that's exactly what happened. Where would you look? You'd look at the specialty lenders. The lenders that did almost all of their work in the subprime, and that's what's called Alt-A, Risky Alternative A Paper Loans, Liars Loans. They knew that they were frauds. Black said liars loans were accomplished by failing to check the information provided by those seeking the loan. He said that often loan applicants were even told they could get a better deal if they inflated their income, job history, and assets. We know that they said that to borrowers, said Black. He pointed out that IndyMac, the federal savings bank that failed on July 11, 2008, specialized in liars' loans. In 2006, it sold $80 billion worth of them, thus producing more losses than the entire savings and loan debacle of the 1980s. And it was all based on fraud. Black explained, Liars' loans were known to be extraordinarily bad, and now it was getting triple-A ratings. Now, a triple-A rating is supposed to mean there is zero credit risk. So you take something that not only has crushing risk, and you create this fiction that it has zero risk. That itself is a fraudulent exercise. And again, there was nobody looking during the Bush years. When they finally did look, after the markets had completely collapsed, they found the appearance of fraud in nearly every file. 
Black and others have compared the bad loans to the Ponzi scheme charged against Wall Street investment consultant Bernie Madoff. Everybody was buying a pig in the poke with a pretty pink ribbon, and the pink ribbon said triple A, said Black. Although there is no specific law against liars' loans, Black argued that the bankers involved knew they had been made under false representation and that they would never be repaid. The loans were based on deceit, which lies at the heart of the legal definition of criminal fraud. Why was no one prosecuted for these acts of fraud? According to Black, federal investigators did not begin to scrutinize the major lenders until the market had actually collapsed, despite early warnings. The FBI publicly warned in September 2004 that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud, that if it was allowed to continue, it would produce a crisis at least as large as the savings and loan debacle, said Black. But the investigation didn't happen. Due to the war on terrorism, the Bush Justice Department transferred 500 white-collar specialists in the FBI to national terrorism and refused to replace them. Today, Black noted, there are one-fifth as many FBI agents detailed to investigating mortgage fraud as worked the savings and loan crisis. Graham and deregulation. One of the protections against banksters, a derogatory term combining bankers with gangsters, was the Glass-Steagall Act, which went into effect in 1934 following government hearings revealing how big banks of that day had looted customers for the benefit of a small group of insiders. The act separated normal banking activities, checking and savings accounts and commercial loans, from speculative investment banking, hedge funds, derivatives, and Wall Street investments in the eyes of the law and allowed for regulation of the latter type of activity. According to former U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC, chairperson Brooksley Bourne, Beginning in the Clinton years, almost all such protective regulation was stripped away. In a 2003 interview with Washington Lawyer, she stated, One major issue was the enormous growth of over-the-counter, or OTC, derivatives. OTC derivatives had been legally permitted for the first time in 1993 by a regulatory exemption that Wendy Lee Graham had adopted as virtually her last act as CFTC chair. This allowed the growth of a business that is now estimated at over a hundred trillion dollars annually in terms of the notional value of contracts worldwide. Alan Greenspan had said that the growth of this market was the most significant development in the financial markets of the 1990s. The market was virtually unregulated and many, many times as big as the trading on the futures exchanges. The Commission had kept some nominal authority over this market but there were no mechanisms for enforcing the rules. For example, anti-fraud rules were retained, but no reporting was required. The market was completely opaque. Neither the Commission nor any other federal regulator knew what was going on in that market. While Mrs. Graham was chairing the CFTC from 1988 to 1993, that body exempted Enron, from regulation in trading of energy derivatives. Graham later resigned from the CFTC and took a seat on the Enron Board of Directors where she served on its audit committee. Enron, the giant energy corporation whose bankruptcy in late 2001 was the largest in U.S. history to that date, drained more than $10 billion from shareholders and resulted in new regulations and legislation to enhance the reliability of financial reporting for public companies. Due to the massive fraud involved, several Enron executives, including founder Kenneth Lay and President Jeffrey Skilling, were sentenced to prison terms. The accounting firm of Arthur Anderson was found guilty of shredding Enron documents and eventually dissolved, putting 85,000 persons out of work. It should be noted that Wendy Lee Graham is the wife of former Texas Republican Senator Phil Graham, who was forced to resign as senior economic advisor in John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign after describing Americans, 
protesting the economic losses due to malfeasance as a nation of whiners. As a senator, Graham was the chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs during the Clinton administration, and he led efforts to pass banking deregulation laws such as the landmark Graham-Leach-Bliley Act in 1999. The act removed Depression-era laws that prevented banks from engaging in insurance and brokerage activities and was passed by an overwhelming majority of the House and by the Senate unanimously and was signed into law by President Clinton. Supporters of the bill used an old trick that was used to pass the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Like the Federal Reserve Act, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act was introduced on the last day before the Christmas holiday and was never debated by either congressional body. This bill, fully initiated by and supported by Republicans and passed with the support of Democrats during a Democratic administration, clearly demonstrates the collusion of the two political parties when it comes to corporate business. Many economists claim the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act's undermining of the Glass-Steagall Act was a significant cause of the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis and the 2008 global economic crisis. Economist Paul Krugman has described Phil Graham as the high priest of deregulation and named Graham and Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan as the top two culprits responsible for the economic crisis. Graham's culpability was echoed by CNN, Time, and Britain's The Guardian. Brooksley Bourne described how, during the Clinton years, her commission questioned the bailout of large OTC derivatives dealers because they held $1.25 trillion worth of contracts, yet held a mere $4 billion in supporting capital, which meant the dealers had far overextended themselves leaving the market vulnerable to the very meltdown that occurred in 2008 and 2009. I became enormously concerned about OTC derivatives and thought the market was a nightmare waiting to happen, recalled Bourne. I was particularly concerned that there was no transparency. No federal regulator knew what kind of position firms like Long-Term Capital Management and Enron had in the derivatives markets. Warren Buffett later called OCT derivatives the financial weapons of mass destruction. Bourne said the Fed and Congress rebuffed the CFTC's efforts to reinstate some public protection over the financial field. It wasn't a regulatory effort. We were just asking questions. The concept release didn't propose any rules. Alan Greenspan, Arthur Levitt, and Robert Rubin all said that these questions should not be asked and urged Congress to pass a bill that would forbid the Commission from taking any regulatory steps on over-the-counter derivatives. There were no hearings on that bill. But during a Congressional Conference Committee meeting on an appropriations bill, an amendment was added preventing the Commission from taking any action on over-the-counter derivatives for six months. This occurred within a month after long-term capital management's collapse. Professor William Black pointed to the experience with AIG, American International Group, as an example of how the lack of regulation led to obscene profits and market manipulation. The taxpayer-backed bailout of AIG in late 2008 ended up totaling more than $180 billion, a cost equaling the entire savings and loan scandal of the 1980s. In September 2008, AIG's credit ratings were downgraded and the Fed issued $85 billion in credit to keep the international insurance giant afloat. But the Fed also took a stock warrant for nearly 80% of AIG's equity. The government eventually increased AIG's credit to as much as $182.5 billion. Public outrage ensued from news reports that AIG had retained millions of dollars in bailout money, some of it going for executive bonuses and lavish junkets. AIG bondholders and counterparties were paid at 100 cents on the dollar by taxpayers. Yet the taxpayers had no claim to future profits. In other words, the benefits of the bailout went to the AIG banks while the taxpayers suffered the costs. AIG made bad loans but with guarantees and charged big fees up front, Black explained. So they booked a lot of income, paid enormous bonuses, and they got very, very rich. 
But, of course, then they had guaranteed this toxic waste. Those liars' loans are going to have enormous losses. And so, you have to pay the guarantee on those enormous losses. And you go bankrupt. Except that you don't in the modern world. Because you've come to the United States, and the taxpayers play the fool. Under Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner, and Under Secretary Henry Paulson, before him, took $5 billion in U.S. taxpayer money and sent it to a huge Swiss bank called UBS through AIG. UBS was defrauding the taxpayers of America, and we were bringing a criminal case against them. We eventually get them to pay a $780 million fine, but wait, we gave them $5 billion. So the taxpayers of America paid the fine of a Swiss bank. And why are we bailing out somebody who is defrauding us? Some suggested that UBS was given $5 billion because AIG was the largest contributor to Obama's campaign and held much of the toxic derivative paper of Goldman Sachs, the major globalist investment firm once headed by Paulson. Though many Americans saw the AIG deal as simply a massive theft that debased our economy, no one in upper management other than former figurehead and NASDAQ chairman Bernard L. Bernie Madoff, was ever charged with the crime. According to TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program, Inspector Neil Barofsky, even by mid-October 2009, AIG executives still hadn't repaid half of the $45 million they promised to return. But by March 2009, the public became enraged when it learned that AIG had paid at least $165 million in executive bonuses from the $180 billion in taxpayer loans to keep the company afloat. AIG Chief Executive Officer Edward M. Liddy told a House committee hearing that he had asked employees to voluntarily give back at least half of their bonuses, although he admitted he had no authority to force them to do so. In December 2008, the U.S. government also took hold of the financing arm of one of the nation's largest manufacturers, General Motors. William Black and others have criticized the government takeover of General Motors, GM, as mere nationalization and have questioned why the president of GM was fired while the bankers who created the economic mess were not. There are two reasons, Black said. One, Government officials are much closer to the bankers. These are people from the banking industry, and they have a lot more sympathy. In fact, they're outright hostile to auto workers, as you can see. They want to bash all of their contracts. But when they get to banking, they say, contracts, sacred. But the other element of your question is, we don't want to change the bankers, because if we do, if we put honest people in, who didn't cause the problem, their first job would be to find the scope of the problem, and that would destroy the cover-up. Geithner is covering up, just like Paulson did before him. Geithner is publicly saying that it's going to take two trillion dollars. A trillion is a thousand billion. Two trillion taxpayer dollars to deal with this problem. But they're allowing all the banks to report that they're not only solvent, but fully capitalized. Both statements can't be true. It can't be that they need $2 trillion because they have massive losses and that they're fine. These are all people who have failed. Paulson failed. Geithner failed. They were all promoted because they failed. Geithner denied any failure, claiming he was never supposed to regulate the banking business. During congressional testimony in March 2009, Geithner, who was the president of the New York Fed during much of the credit boom, indicated he had little interest in scrutinizing other banks' activities. I've never been a regulator for better or for worse, stated Geithner with surprising candor, adding, and I think you're right to say that we have to be very skeptical that regulation can solve all of these problems. We have parts of our system that are overwhelmed by regulation. Overwhelmed by regulation, lamented journalist Bill Moyers over Geithner's comments. It wasn't the absence of regulation that was the problem. 
It was despite the presence of regulation, you've got huge risks that build up. Black agreed, saying, Well, he may be right that he never regulated, but his job was to regulate. That was his mission statement. As president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, he was responsible for regulating most of the largest bank holding companies in America. And he's completely wrong that we had too much regulation in some of these areas. I mean, he gives no details, obviously. But that's just plain wrong. As 2009 drew onward, more financial institutions fell by the wayside, even as the media pumped out heartening stories of an economic rebound and more stimulus activity. In the face of criminal charges, the Alabama Bank Colonial Bank Group Incorporated was closed by regulators in August 2009, becoming the 77th failed bank since the start of the year. It was also the largest bank failure since the loss of Washington Mutual Incorporated in 2008. Colonial posted a $606 million second quarter loss in 2009, primarily due to loans to developers and home builders in Florida, a state where the housing industry tanked quickly. The bank failed to meet capital requirements to qualify for TARP funds because it simply did not have enough financial reserves to be eligible for TARP support. One problem, said Robert Auerbach, formerly an economist with the Financial Services Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, is that central bank officials are often too close to the banks they are meant to keep in check. The boards of directors of every Fed bank, including the New York Fed, have nine directors. Six of them are elected by the banks in the district, said Auerbach, so you have the banks in New York electing the directors that are supposed to supervise them. One proven means for keeping the true condition of some banks from the public eye during any reorganization is to retain the officers responsible for the problem in the first place. As long as I keep the old CEO who caused the problems, is he going to go vigorously around finding the problems, finding the frauds? asked Black in Moyer's interview. He added, we adopted a law after the savings and loan crisis called the Prompt Corrective Action Law, and it requires bank officers to close these institutions, and they're refusing to obey the law. When asked if Geithner and others in the Obama administration have engaged in a cover-up along with the banks, Black responded, Absolutely, because they are scared to death of a collapse. They're afraid that if they admit the truth, that many of the large banks are insolvent. They think Americans are a bunch of cowards and that we'll run screaming to the exits and we won't rely on deposit insurance. Downsizing America People like Black and Moyers, who are in prestigious positions, fail to mention that the motive behind Geithner's and the bank's financial antics can be traced to secretive globalist organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations. Moyers also usually fails to mention that he is a member of the CFR, having obviously passed its stringent globalist eligibility requirements. It is in examples such as this that one can see the guiding hand of the globalists in both the world of commerce and of journalism. Another person close to secretive society members was Henry Hank Paulson, the George W. Bush Treasury Secretary who oversaw the bailout of AIG. During both the Bush and Obama administrations, AIG was used to funnel taxpayer funds to certain banks like UBS and Goldman Sachs, where Paulson had previously been the CEO. In 2006, when Bush named Paulson to head the Treasury, the CFR explained the President's agenda in an op-ed piece Bush essentially set five goals for the new Treasury Secretary. Keep taxes low. Curb federal government spending to curb the budget deficit. Deal with international imbalances. Keep investment markets open. Support innovation and risk-taking in the private sector to boost U.S. economic growth. Paulson is the right man at the right time to take on issues like these. Despite the fact that IndyMac had failed only days before, on July 20th, 2008, Paulson reassured the public that it's a safe banking system, a sound banking system. 
Our regulators are on top of it. This is a very manageable situation. Paulson had been identified as a key figure in the economic debacle that began in 2008. Time magazine stated, If there is a face to this financial debacle, it is now his. Noting that Goldman Sachs got the lion's share of taxpayer bailout money, $12.9 billion, William Black declared, Now, in most stages in American history, that would be a scandal of such proportions that he wouldn't be allowed in civilized society. The tragedy of this crisis is it didn't need to happen at all. Black, along with many other commentators, saw losses in workers' income, securities, pensions, and futures as the result of the misconduct of a relatively few very well-heeled people in very well-decorated corporate suites and their ideologies which swept away regulation. Forbes magazine in 2006 estimated Paulson's personal wealth at $700 million. Black and others acknowledged that the destruction of the U.S. financial system came about due to a lack of integrity on the part of several high government and banking officials, as well as massive conflicts of interest and a loss of morality. But this is simply the view of those unwilling to address the true issue. Conspiracy After studying three separate government reports predicting a coming fiscal doomsday, the chairman of the investment counseling firm, the Weiss Group, Martin D. Weiss, had yet another word in mind. When our leaders have no awareness of the disastrous consequences of their actions, they can claim ignorance and take no action. Or when our leaders have no hard evidence as to what might happen in the future, they can at least claim uncertainty. But when they have full knowledge of an impending disaster, they have proof of its inevitability in any scenario, and they so declare in their official reports, but still don't lift a finger to change course, then they have only one remaining claim. Insanity, he wrote. But it would be insane to actually believe that the nation's money masters are truly insane. The only alternative is conspiracy. The financial meltdown happened because it was engineered to happen. The belief that the economic collapse was orchestrated even reached the mainstream media. In early 2009, Washington insider Dick Morris pointed out to Fox News commentator Sean Hannity how the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, was attempting to bring the U.S. economy under international control by using the excuse that it would merely be coordinating regulatory efforts. The conspiracy theorists who have talked about the New World Order and the U.N. taking control, they are right, it's happening, he exclaimed. No matter how clearly Dick Morris saw things, only a few in Congress seemed to be getting the message. Texas Republican Representative K. Granger got it. In an August 2009 letter to constituents, she wrote, Something happened this week that has serious consequences for each and every one of us, but you probably didn't even know it happened. On Tuesday, August 25, 2009, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, released their mid-session review. The mid-session review showed that our country is going to be $2 trillion deeper in debt than the White House originally told us at the beginning of this year. That's nearly $6,700 more debt for every man, woman, and child in America. If this doesn't show that the policy of spend, spend, spend isn't working, I don't know what does. The only answer that Washington seems to come up with to deal with all problems is to spend more money on central government programs. Is this merely ineptitude, or is this proof of a hidden agenda, one designed to force the American Republic into a tightly controlled socialist society? Debt Slaves Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. 
an oft-repeated paraphrase of Amschel Mayer Rothschild's 1838 quote, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. Economics is the lifeblood of any nation. Many compared President Barack H. Obama's $787 billion economic stimulus package in 2009 to giving blood to a corpse. They feared the stimulus was simply throwing good money after bad, especially in light of health and data-gathering provisions that seemed out of place in financial legislation. As the U.S. economy deteriorated, President Obama expanded the Bush administration's policies for bailing out banks and other financial institutions. President Obama explained that sending money directly to taxpayers might seem more appealing, but said it wouldn't be as effective in stimulating the economy, saying that a dollar of capital in a bank can actually result in eight or ten dollars of loans to families and businesses, a multiplier effect that can ultimately lead to a faster pace of economic growth. Stimulus Package Obama did not comment on criticism raised of the many improprieties connected to the economic crisis, nor did he comment on the argument that his economic growth actually was nothing other than an austerity budget based on war. Michel Chosudovsky, a professor of economics at the University of Ottawa and director of the Center for Research on Globalization, noted that Obama's austerity measures hit all major federal spending programs with the exception of defense and the Middle East War, the Wall Street bank bailout, and interest payments on a staggering public debt. At first sight, the budget proposal has all the appearances of an expansionary program, a demand-oriented Second New Deal geared towards creating employment, rebuilding shattered social programs, and reviving the real economy. The realities are otherwise. Obama's promise is based on a mammoth austerity program. The entire fiscal structure is shattered, turned upside down. Understandably, Chosidovsky concluded that the Obama plan largely serves the interests of Wall Street, the defense contractors, and the oil conglomerates. He warned that the Bush-Obama bank bailouts will lead America into a spiraling public debt crisis. The economic and social dislocations are potentially devastating, he added. What this means is that the American taxpayer has been made the lender of last resort for the two government-sponsored private enterprises, the Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac whose combined debt of $5.4 trillion has been effectively transferred to the nation's balance sheet. In addition to personal debt, every American now has a financial responsibility for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as well as other financial institutions. What is even more maddening was the use of some bailout funds to create extravagant golden parachute retirement and severance payments, to financial executives who would have to leave their failing companies. These garnered unfavorable publicity in late 2008, as did the revelations of shady dealings between Wall Street and its regulators. Take, for instance, Charles Millard, former director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, or PBGC, an independent federal corporation that protects the pension plans of nearly 44 million American workers and retirees. In May 2009, Millard was called to testify before the Senate Aging Committee over charges that he had cozy and improper contacts with Wall Street firms. Millard, citing his constitutional right to avoid self-incrimination, declined to answer questions. The PBGC, which insures corporate pensions, announced in late May 2009 that it had suffered a $33.5 billion deficit for the first half of the fiscal year, up considerably from a $10.7 billion deficit in 2008. 
According to hearing testimony by PBGC Inspector General Rebecca Ann Batts, Millard directly participated in granting more than $100 million in PBGC contracts to the international investment firms of BlackRock, Incorporated, J.P. Morgan, and Goldman Sachs, against the advice of senior corporate management. Telephone and email records showed Millard had contacts with his prospective bidders prior to hiring them to manage real estate and private equity investments. Millard's experience illustrates both the incestuous relationship between persons in government who are supposed to be protecting the public and Wall Street. It is also noteworthy that Millard invoked the Fifth Amendment just like mafia gangsters in the past. If there had been no wrongdoing, then why refuse to testify? Before the Crash Before the market crash in 2008, stress reached deep into certain strata of American life. Many retirees who once believed their money was safe saw principal losses of up to 80 or 90 percent of their investment. Serious market slowdown began when investment banks across the globe refused to buy one another's credit, an unusual move, and when mortgage purchasing companies Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae decided they could make more money by buying subprime mortgages. It was all part of the Bush administration's policy of conforming to the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which were unveiled in 2000. These goals addressed such issues as the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, universal primary education, gender equality, health improvement, and ensuring environmental sustainability. It was laudable goals such as these that led to government pressure on lending institutions to issue subprime mortgages. The result? Hundreds of thousands of unsold homes. Although it's well known that the economic mess began with the banks, mortgage lenders, and real estate companies, the current housing and mortgage mess actually was the result of maneuvering by both Democrats and Republican politicians, a fact that adds considerable weight to the argument that both major parties are controlled by the same globalists seeking to install a worldwide socialist system. During the 1990s, Bill Clinton's Democratic administration was pressuring Fannie Mae, the nation's largest underwriter of home mortgages, to expand mortgage loans to low- and moderate-income borrowers. After all, granting low-income families the chance for home ownership sounded good on paper. Fannie Mae has expanded home ownership for millions of families in the 1990s by reducing down payment requirements. Franklin D. Raines, chairman and CEO of Fannie Mae, told the New York Times in 1999. The newspaper noted that at least one study seemed to indicate racial prejudice in this lending as it reported that 18% of such subprime loans went to black borrowers as compared to 5% for all other groups. With great prescience, Times writer Stephen A. Holmes noted in 1999 in moving, even tentatively, into this new area of lending, Fannie Mae is taking on significantly more risk, which may not pose any difficulties during flush economic times. But the government-subsidized corporation may run into trouble in an economic downturn, prompting a government rescue similar to that of the savings and loan industry in the 1980s. While Fannie Mae was lowering loan qualifications, its stockholders were pressuring for greater profits, creating a recipe for financial disaster. And, as usual, both the political and financial machinations involved crossed party lines, but not the agenda of the globalists. Larry Summers, a Treasury Secretary under Clinton, Obama's head of the National Economic Council and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, is an advocate of cutting both corporate and capital gains taxes and convinced Clinton to sign into law several Republican bills that allowed banks to expand their powers. One of these bills repealed the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act, which prevented the merger of commercial banks, insurance companies, and brokerage firms 
such as Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. Additionally, Summers supported the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, just before the 2000 election, which denied the governmental Commodity Futures Trading Corporation the ability to conduct oversight on the trading of financial derivatives. In the wake of Obama's stimulus package in April 2009, Summers was criticized for collecting $2.7 million in speaking fees from Wall Street companies that had received government bailout money. Summers was paving the way for the abuse of America's financial system. Meanwhile, his protege, Undersecretary for International Affairs, Timothy Geithner, was making political gains. In 2002, during the first George W. Bush administration, Geithner left the Treasury Department to join the Council on Foreign Relations as a senior fellow in the International Economics Department. Also a protege of Henry Kissinger, Geithner had previously served as president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. By 2009, Geithner was Obama's Treasury Secretary. Again, here we see two men, Summers and Geithner, connected to the same secretive globalist society, the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR, freely moving between both Democratic and Republican administrations. The CFR is secretive because it does not publicly announce its agenda or decisions, nor does it allow anyone to join without an invitation, and then only after careful vetting of the candidate's propensity to favor globalization. Princeton-educated economics researcher William F. Engdahl wrote that Treasury Secretary Geithner's dirty little secret was that during the credit crisis, he only tried to save the five largest banks, banks that held 96% of all U.S. bank derivative positions in terms of nominal value and an eye-popping 81% of the total net credit risk exposure in the event of default. A derivative is a financial instrument whose worth is derived from another resource, whether property, goods, or services called the underlying asset. Derivatives have been used in complex financial dealings to hedge against loss by allowing speculators to sell or trade the derivative and to gamble on gaining great profit by acquiring derivatives in the hope that the underlying asset will maintain or increase its value. In declining order, the five banks that had the most derivatives are J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, and the recently merged Wells Fargo, Wachovia. The leadership of these five banks is full of CFR members. Bank Stress Tests in early May 2009, after months of foot-dragging, federal regulators finally released the results of their bank stress tests, which test whether or not a certain bank can repay its debts and survive harsh economies. From the five banks just listed, only J.P. Morgan Chase passed the test. This means it was not required to raise more capital to prevent further losses. The Charlotte-based Bank of America tested the worst on the stress tests. Government regulators informed the bank that it needed almost $34 billion in additional capital, which accounted for almost half of its total deficit. This news worsened problems for the banking giant, already under criticism for receiving more than $45 billion in government aid and for acquiring the investment bank Merrill Lynch. Bank of America wasn't the only one with problems. Among others, Wells Fargo needed to raise $13.7 billion. GMAC Financial Services, formerly known as General Motors Acceptance Corporation, needed $11.5 billion, and Citigroup needed $5.5 billion. All told, the nation's large banks needed $74.6 billion to build a capital cushion according to federal regulators. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke was publicly upbeat about the tests, describing them as a fair and comprehensive effort. 
Markets can be reassured that banks will be strong and be able to lend even if the economy is worse than currently expected, he told CNBC. However, banks that failed the government stress test would be required to quickly come up with a plan to raise additional resources. One such plan was for the federal government to convert preferred shares bought by the U.S. Treasury into common stock. Douglas Elliott, a former J.P. Morgan Chase investment banker now with the Brookings Institution, told the Associated Press, Essentially, what we'll be doing is swapping a kind of loan for actual ownership of a part of the bank. So it increases the taxpayer's risk, but also increases the potential return. Increased taxpayer risk? This does not seem such a good idea in shaky financial times. Continuing to pour taxpayer money into these five banks without changing their operating system is tantamount to treating an alcoholic with unlimited free booze, said F. William Engdahl. The government bailout of AIG at more than $180 billion as of April 2009 has primarily gone to pay off AIG's credit default swap obligations to counterpart gamblers Goldman Sachs, Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Bank of America the banks who believe they are too big to fail. In effect, these institutions today believe that they are so large that they can dictate the policy of the federal government. Some have called it a banker's coup d'etat. It is definitely not healthy. So the big bank pockets the money and the poor strapped taxpayers are left with the bill, not to mention ownership of banks that continue to be troubled financially well into 2010. By mid-2009, Americans were driving less and spending less, and the economy was deflating. Even though products became cheaper in the face of inflation, people stopped buying what they couldn't afford. The housing market, which is a key indicator of economic strength, continued to lag far behind projections. Housing startups were doing particularly poorly. In April 2009, the U.S. Department of Housing and Development announced that non-government-backed housing starts, even after seasonal adjustments, were 54 percent lower, 458,000, than the April 2000 rate of 1,000,000. Privately backed housing starts are any homes being built that are not being financed by the government. These have long been a prime indicator of the national economy. There was also blame tossed at the unequal distribution of money. Chuck Collins, director of the Program on Inequality and the Common Good for the Institute of Policy Studies, said, In our view, extreme inequalities contributed to the economic collapse. This matters because wealth is power, the power to shape the culture, to distort elections, and shape government policy. A plutocracy is a rule by wealth, and more and more the priorities of the society are shaped by the interests of organized wealth. Improprieties and Death Apparently the stress created by the gargantuan amounts of money involved in the economic squeeze can be hazardous to your health as well as your wealth. Stress may have contributed to the untimely deaths of at least five high-profile financial officers who died in the months following financial collapse in October 2008. In January 2009, German billionaire Adolf Merkel apparently threw himself under a train after losing money shorting Volkswagen stock. Patrick Roca an Irish property speculator who was close to both President Bill Clinton and British Prime Minister Tony Blair, was found shot in the head following the crash of the real estate market. Chicago real estate mogul Steve Good was found fatally shot in his car. Financial advisor René Thierry Magon de la Villouche reportedly committed suicide in his Manhattan office just before Christmas 2008, after losing both his and his clients' money in the Bernie Madoff scandal. One particularly troubling death was that of Freddie Mac acting chief financial officer David Kellerman, who was found, the apparent victim of suicide, in his Vienna, Virginia home on April 22, 2009. 
In 2008, the U.S. Treasury Department had to pump $45 billion into the government-sponsored mortgage firm to shore up $50 billion in losses. Questions immediately arose over reports about Kellerman's role in the massive losses at Freddie Mac and about the nature of his death. One police spokesman told All Headline News that Kellerman died from a gunshot wound. Strangely enough, however, another police officer initially said he had hanged himself. There was one more controversy when reporters found that Kellerman was deeply involved in the Securities and Exchange Commission's and the U.S. Justice Department's investigations into questionable bookkeeping practices with Freddie Mac. Kellerman figured in several recent controversies at Freddie Mac, reported the Washington Post in April 2009. He and a group of company attorneys tussled with regulators in early March as the firm prepared to file its quarterly earnings report with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Kellerman's group insisted that Freddie Mac inform shareholders of the cost to the company in helping carry out the Obama administration's housing recovery plan. The regulators urged the company not to do so. This isn't the story of a guy who was trying to cover something up. It's the story of a guy who was trying to do the right thing, commented one housing industry veteran who asked for anonymity apparently suspecting the possibility of danger in telling the truth in such matters. More than one conspiracy-minded researcher believed that something more than suicide was at work in Kellerman's death and that there may have been other deaths connected to an effort to silence insiders who might have knowledge of the situation that someone does not want made public. In a statement from his political action committee, perennial office seeker and conspiracy advocate Lyndon LaRouche said, There is no evident motive for suicide in this case, but there is a motive for suppressing making Kellerman's views known. The guy is killed, probably murdered. He deserves justice. His right to justice is overriding. The question is, what else did David Kellerman know which influential circles did not want him to reveal? The rich get richer. It has long been said that the rich get richer while the poor get poorer. Many researchers equate the term plutocracy, rule by the wealthy, with the new world order. Although the belief that an organized plutocracy controls the world has long been derided as merely a conspiracy theory, G. William Domhoff, a professor in psychology and sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, has the statistics to prove its existence. Domhoff's first book, Who Rules America?, was a controversial 1960s bestseller that argued that the United States is dominated by an elite political and economic ownership class. Using updated figures, Domhoff stated in a posting, in the United States, wealth is highly concentrated in a relatively few hands. As of 2007, the top 1% of households, the upper class, owned 34.3% of all privately held wealth, and the next 19%, the managerial, professional, and small business stratum, had 50.3% which means that just 20% of the people owned a remarkable 85%, leaving only 15% of the wealth for the bottom 80%, wage and salary workers. In terms of financial wealth, the total net worth minus the value of one's home, the top 1% of households had an even greater share, 42.2%. Domhoff defined total assets as the gross value of owner-occupied housing, plus other real estate owned by the household, cash and savings deposits, money market accounts, stocks and bonds, retirement plans, and other financial securities. He defined total liabilities as mortgage debt, consumer debt, including auto loans, and any other debt. According to Domhoff, wealth distribution has been extremely concentrated throughout American history. During the 19th century, the top 1% of wealth owners owned 40 to 50% of assets in large port cities like Boston, 
New York, and Charleston. He said this disparity remained stable during the 20th century. Although there were small declines in the aftermath of the New Deal and World War II, when most people were working and could save a little money, there were progressive income tax rates, too, which took some money from the rich to help with the government services. Then there was a further decline, or flattening, in the 1970s, but this time in good part due to a fall in stock prices, meaning that the rich lost some of the value in their stocks, wrote Domhoff. By the late 1980s, however, the wealth distribution was almost as concentrated as it had been in 1929, when the top 1% had 44.2% of all wealth. It has continued to edge up since that time, with a slight decline from 1998 to 2004. Before the economy crashed in the late 2000s, and little people got pushed down again. Domhoff recorded that as of 2007, income inequality in the United States was at an all-time high for the past 95 years, with the top 0.01% receiving 6% of all U.S. wages, which is double what it was for that tiny slice in 2000. The top 10% received 49.7%, the highest since 1917. The numbers are even more shocking when viewed on a global scale. Using numbers from the World Institute for Development Economics Research, Domhoff concluded the top 10% of the world's adults control about 85% of global household wealth. That compares with a figure of 69.8% for the top 10% for the United States. The only industrialized democracy with a higher concentration of wealth than the top 10% than the United States is Switzerland, at 71.3%, he noted. At the same time, the U.S. government's income is declining. According to the White House, 2008 individual income tax receipts were estimated at $1.168 trillion. Yet when the tax receipts were tallied, the total was $155 billion less than that at $1.043 trillion. Domhoff's work presents a strong argument that wealth indeed equals power. Such power comes with the ability to donate to political parties engage lobbyists, and provide grants to experts to think up new policies beneficial to the wealthy. Money also can hire public relations firms to improve one's image or make large donations to universities and cultural entities such as museums, music halls, and art galleries. Wealth in the form of stock ownership can be used to control whole corporations, which today have inordinate influence in society, media, and government. And just as wealth can lead to power, so can power lead to wealth. Recent presidents, such as Lyndon B. Johnson and Richard M. Nixon, entered office without an extraordinary amount of money, but left as millionaires. This is because those who control a government can use their positions to feather their own nests. Domhoff said this can be done by means of a favorable land deal for relatives at the local level or perhaps a huge federal government contract to a new corporation run by friends who will hire you when you leave government. If we take a larger historical sweep and look cross-nationally, we are well aware that the leaders of conquering armies often grab enormous wealth and that some religious leaders use their positions to acquire wealth, commented Domhoff. Public debt, private profit. Whether rich or poor, most Americans believe their finances are safe, thanks to a federal government corporation created in the Great Depression year of 1933. About 8,400 American banks participate in the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, an independent agency created by the Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system by ensuring deposits, supervising banks for safety and soundness, and managing receiverships. These banks allocate a small portion of their profits to collectively insure bank deposits in cases where a bank fails. 
and fail they did in late 2008 and 2009. Between the two years, 111 banks failed, and many more teetered on collapse, effectively depleting the FDIC Reserve Fund from $52.8 billion in 2008 to a mere $10.4 billion in the first quarter of 2009, its lowest point since the height of the savings and loan scandal in 1992. But what is more disturbing is that this reserve fund, much like Social Security, is merely an illusion. In 2008, the former chairman of the FDIC, William M. Isaac, wrote an article titled, The Mythical FDIC Fund, in which he revealed the FDIC's insolvency. When I became chairman of the FDIC in 1981, the FDIC's financial statement showed a balance at the U.S. Treasury of some $11 billion. I decided it would be a real treat to see all of that money, so I placed a call to then-Treasury Secretary Don Regan. The conversation went like this. Isaac, Don, I'd like to come over to look at the money. Regan, what money? Isaac, you know, the $11 billion the FDIC has in the vault at Treasury. Regan, uh, well, you see, Bill, uh, that's a bit of a problem. Isaac, I know you're busy. I don't need to do it right away. Regan, well, it's not a question of timing. I don't know quite how to put this, but we don't have the money. Isaac, right. <laughs> Regan, no, really, the banks have been paying money to the FDIC. The FDIC has been turning the money over to the Treasury, and the Treasury has been spending it on missiles, school lunches, water projects, and the like. The money's gone. Isaac, but it says right here on this financial statement that we have over $11 billion at the Treasury. Regan, in a sense, you do. You see, we owe that money to the FDIC, and we pay interest on it. Isaac, I know this might sound pretty far-fetched, but what would happen if we should need a few billion to handle a bank failure? Regan, that's easy. We'd go right out and borrow it. You'd have the money in no time. Same day service, most days. Isaac, let me see if I've got this straight. The money the banks thought they were storing up for the past half century, sort of saving it for a rainy day, is gone. If a storm begins brewing and we need the money, Treasury will have to borrow it. Is that about it? Regan. Yep. Isaac. Just one more thing while I've got you. Why do we bother pretending there's a fund? Regan. I'm sorry, Bill, but the President's on the other line. I'll have to get back to you on that. There is no record that Regan ever got back to Isaac. Why do we bother pretending there's a fund? asked Daryl Robert Schoon, economic commentator and author of How to Survive the Crisis and Prosper in the Process. The answer is obvious. Modern economics, i.e. central banking, is a shell game where bankers, with the aid of governments, have foisted a highly lucrative fraud on society. And while the fraud of the FDIC fund is egregious, it is no more egregious than the fraud of the Fed or the economy itself. And the fraud does not stop with the FDIC. Schoon and others believe modern banking is essentially a Ponzi scheme on a global scale, in which bankers loan non-existent money and receive repayment of the non-existent funds, plus compounding interest in return. In economies based on the fraudulent issuance of money as debt, there are only predators and victims. Bankers are the predators, society is the victim. Businessmen are victims who often believe they're predators. And governments are the well-paid-off referees in the rigged game being played out in today's capital markets, Schoon wrote. At the heart of this combination Ponzi scheme and shell game lies the privately owned Federal Reserve System. But you and I, dear listener, will get to that. Chris Martinson, a businessman with a doctorate in neurotoxicology from Duke University and an MBA in finance from Cornell, wrote, Our entire monetary system, and by extension our economy, 
is a Ponzi economy in the sense that it really only operates well when in expansion mode. Even a slight regression triggers massive panics and disruptions that seem wholly inconsistent with the relative change. Unless one understands that expansion is more or less a requirement of our type of monetary and economic system. Without expansion, the system first labors and then destroys wealth far out of proportion to the decline itself. What fuels expansion in a debt-based money system? Why, new debt or credit, of course. So one of the things we keep a very close eye on, as they do at the Federal Reserve, is the rate of debt creation. Martinson and others believe a major theme in the current credit bubble collapse is the extent to which private credit has been crumbling while the Federal Reserve has been purchasing debt and the federal government has been increasing its borrowing. In essence, public debt purchases and new borrowing has attempted to plug the gap left by a shortfall in private debt purchases and borrowing. That's the scheme right now. The Federal Reserve is creating new money out of thin air to buy debt, while the U.S. government is creating new debt at the most fantastic pace ever seen. The attempt here is to keep aggregate debt growing fast enough to prevent the system from completely seizing up, explained Martinson. Martinson, who said he continually seeks to accept or reject his own hypotheses based on the evidence at hand, explained that the Federal Reserve has been monetizing far more U.S. government debt than has openly been revealed by allowing foreign central banks to swap their agency debt for Treasury debt. This is not a sign of strength and reveals a pattern of trading temporary relief for future difficulties, Martinson wrote. When the full scope of this program is more widely recognized, more pressure will fall upon the dollar as more and more private investors shun the dollar and all dollar-denominated instruments as stores of value and wealth. This will further burden the efforts of the various central banks around the world as they endeavor to meet the vast borrowing desires of the U.S. government. One possible result of the abandonment of these efforts is a wholesale flight out of the dollar and into other assets. To U.S. residents, this will be experienced as rapidly rising import costs, and increasing costs for all internationally traded basic commodities, especially food items. For the rest of the world, the results will range from discomforting to disastrous, depending on their degree of dollar linkage. The shell game that the Fed is currently playing does not change the basic equation. Money is being printed out of thin air so that it can be used to buy U.S. government debt. It has been long understood that creating more money leads to inflation since the more currency in circulation, the less it's worth, especially paper money that has no intrinsic value. As to the government buying private debt, a crude example of what has happened goes like this. Tom has a mortgage on a very nice house. He has a good job and his credit is good. Dick lives in a run-down home badly in need of serious repairs and has been in and out of jobs, so he has a low credit score. Yet, due to government pressure on the lending industry to provide housing to all, Dick has a mortgage on his home. Through a scheme called bundling, Tom's mortgage and a few others like his are combined with Dick's mortgage and many others like his. By sleight of hand, this combined package of mortgages is given an A1 rating, and the package is sold to venture capital firms as a good investment. With these investment packages growing in number, the economy booms. But when the housing bubble breaks, the investment firms, many of the largest filled with globalists, turn to the government for relief, with the argument that if they go bankrupt, the whole national economy will suffer. The government then pays these firms for their investment at full value even though many of the houses are substandard, subprime, and not worth full value. The government pays with taxpayer money, then orders more money printed to cover the shortfall. The investment firms are also paid with the condition that their money comes in the form of government bonds, which means even more paper is spread around, causing further inflation and devaluation. 
It is robbery on a grand scale with the strapped taxpayer taking the hit, while the middlemen of financiers continue to make a profit. To add insult to injury, many of these financiers are banks and investment houses outside the United States, which means U.S. taxpayers are paying back foreign investors for making bad investments. How it all began. Our nation's economic decay did not start with the Obama administration or even with the George W. Bush regime. Rather, it began decades earlier, in the early 20th century, with the founding of a privately owned banking syndicate known as the Federal Reserve System, a government-sanctioned cartel of private banks that was created in a conspiratorial manner and is under heavy criticism to this day, even being blamed for the current financial woes. Joan Vion, a businesswoman and international reporter who has covered more than a hundred global conferences on financial and trade matters, wrote that the recent bailouts were simply the latest moves by the globalists to solidify their control over the United States. The bailout of Freddie and Fannie provided us with the latest excitement in the diabolical saga of the raping, robbing, and pillaging of America. Interestingly enough, it took place 13 months after the beginning of the credit crunch. It was planned and managed destruction in order to accomplish the final transfer of America's financial sovereignty, she noted. Former Secretary of Housing Catherine Austin Fitz agreed, stating that in the attempt to build a global American-run military empire, trillions of dollars have been shifted out of the United States by both legal and illegal means, to reinvest in Asia and emerging markets through taxpayer bailout money, coupled with Fed loans to foreign banks. In doing so, she said we have left economic sovereignty behind. Finally, the expense and corruption of empire resulted in bailouts of 12 to 14 trillion dollars, delivering a new financial war chest to the people leading the financial engineering, the globalists. Now we have exploding unemployment, an exploding federal deficit, an inspector general for the TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program, bailout program predicting that the ultimate bailout cost could rise to $23.7 trillion, said Fitz. With this lost money came lost jobs. Unemployment figures are usually a good gauge of the nation's economy. In mid-2009, unemployment was officially 9.4%. If for some reason this number seems low, one must note that these numbers do not include those who would like a job but have stopped looking, so-called discouraged workers, and those who are working fewer hours than they want, said Dennis Lockhart, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. With these numbers included, the unemployment rate would move from the official 9.4% to 16%. As 2010 progressed, so did the unemployment figures, which began to match the numbers of the Great Depression. Yet, unlike the 1930s, money was still available, and money is the lifeblood of a zombie nation. The trappings of wealth and bankers' lifestyles are often admired by outsiders with a fervency bordering on religious, yet only those who live these lifestyles understand the inner workings of the money cult and they work hard to keep these inner workings secret. Consider the 1966 essay, Gold and Economic Freedom, by Alan Greenspan, who from 1987 to 2006 was chairman of the Fed. Greenspan wrote, Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the statist's antagonism toward the gold standard. In other words, spending paper money you don't have runs up debt that, with interest due, earns much more than the original debt, especially if it is not repaid promptly. This is the hidden confiscation of wealth. Paper money can be devalued. 
but a gold piece will always retain some value and is therefore a good hedge against both inflation and devaluation, which is why the globalists seeking a strong central authority, statists, are generally opposed to a gold standard because it robs them of the means of robbing the public through high interest rates, service charges, late payments, and monetary exchanges. Following a talk by Greenspan at the Economic Club of New York in 1993, Dr. Lawrence Parks, the executive director of the Foundation for the Advancement of Monetary Education, FAME, approached the Fed chairman and asked if he still agreed with his 1966 conclusions on deficit spending and gold. Absolutely, Greenspan responded. Parks then asked why Greenspan did not speak out about his knowledge, and the response was, Some of my colleagues at the institution I represent, the Fed, do not agree with me. Whether Greenspan was fibbing or he was mistaken about his colleagues, the Fed actually shared Greenspan's opinion on gold. They just didn't want the public to know. The nonprofit Gold Antitrust Action Committee, Incorporated, or GATA, was organized in 1999 to oppose the illegal collusion over the price and supply of gold and related financial securities. According to the committee, in 2009, the Federal Reserve System disclosed to Congress that it had made gold swap arrangements with foreign banks, but it does not want the public to know about them. This disclosure directly contradicted the Fed's earlier denials of making gold swaps to GATA back in 2001. A GATA news release also suggested that the Fed was indeed very much involved in the surreptitious international central bank manipulation of the gold price particularly and the currency markets generally. Earlier in 2009, GATA sought information on current gold swaps, a practice denied by Alan Greenspan, then Fed chairman, back in 1995. But this question was rebuffed by the Fed, which claimed this information was exempt from Freedom of Information Act requests. GATA appealed to the Fed's board. But in a September 2009 letter to GATA's lawyer, Federal Reserve Board member Kevin M. Warsh upheld the denial of information by stating, In connection with your appeal, I have confirmed that the information withheld under Exemption 4 consists of confidential commercial or financial information relating to the operations of the Federal Reserve Banks that was obtained within the meaning of Exemption 4. This includes information relating to swap arrangements with foreign banks on behalf of the Federal Reserve System, and is not the type of information that is customarily disclosed to the public. This information was properly withheld from you. Gatta claimed the letter was not the first admission of the Fed making gold swaps, but that it comes at a sensitive time in the currency and gold markets. According to a Gatta news release, the U.S. dollar is showing unprecedented weakness. The gold price is showing unprecedented strength. Western European central banks appear to be withdrawing from gold sales and leasing, and the International Monetary Fund is being pressed to take the lead in the gold price suppression scheme by selling gold from its own supposed reserves in the guise of providing financial support for poor nations. It is now expected that a lawsuit will be filed in federal court to appeal the Fed's denial of GATA's Freedom of Information request concerning gold swaps. Those people stocking up on gold for safekeeping might keep in mind that gold and silver, in fact, just about anything considered a financial asset, may be seized by federal authorities in wartime or any officially declared emergency. Those who hoard gold against the possible devaluation or collapse of the dollar might remember that during the Great Depression, the hoarding and use of gold as a medium of exchange was outlawed. According to the GATA website, government confiscation of gold has never been a serious or imminent threat, but in any emergency, this could swiftly change. While the U.S. government in 1933 did demand the exchange of circulating government-issued coins for paper money, proceeding to devalue the paper money after the gold was surrendered, that gold then was a huge part of the country's money supply. And amid the national economic collapse at that time, the government could make a plausible complaint against hoarding. 
there are no such circumstances today, gold no longer being in general circulation as currency. But of course, lately, the arrogance and imperiousness of the U.S. government have far exceeded even the paranoia of precious metals investors. Certainly, capital controls may be imposed in the United States in the next currency crisis, and it's not far from capital controls to even more brutal interventions in the economy. Such concern intensified with the 2005 letter to Gata, in which the former chief counsel for the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, Sean M. Thornton, explained the scope of the government's power in making financial seizures. It took Gata six months and a little prodding to get answers from the Treasury, but the Treasury's reply, when it came, was remarkably comprehensive and candid. The government's authority to interfere with the ownership of gold, silver, and mining shares arises from the Trading with the Enemy Act, which became law in 1917 during World War I and applies during declared wars, and from 1977's International Emergency Economic Powers Act, which can be applied without declared wars. While the Trading with the Enemy Act authorizes the government to interfere with the ownership of gold and silver particularly, it also applies to all forms of currency and all securities. So the Treasury official stressed that it could be applied not just to shares of gold and silver mining companies, but to the shares of all companies in which there is a foreign ownership interest. Further, there is no requirement in the law that the targets of the government's interference must have some connection to the declared enemies of the United States, or, really, some connection to foreign ownership. Anything that can be construed as a financial instrument, no matter how innocently it has been used, is subject to seizure under the Trading with the Enemy Act and the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Usury Usury is a term that has all but disappeared from our language. Once, usury was defined as any interest charged for a loan, but modern dictionaries softened this definition to merely excessive interest. The Texas Constitution once defined usury as any interest in excess of 6%. This ceiling was increased over the years until the whole concept was deleted. Those who knew the Bible recall that Jesus was crucified by those in power for chasing money changers out of the temple. Public anger today is being directed at all the financial moguls of both Wall Street and Washington, D.C. Charging interest on pretended loans is usury, and that has become institutionalized under the Federal Reserve System, argued G. Edward Griffin, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. This has been accomplished by masking the operations of the Fed in secrecy and arcane economic terms. The mechanism by which the Fed converts debt into money may seem complicated at first, but it is simple if one remembers that the process is not intended to be logical, but to confuse and deceive, Griffin added. Former Washington Post editor William Grider wrote, The details of the Fed's actions were presumed to be too esoteric for ordinary citizens to understand. Some believe this ignorance may be a blessing. Henry Ford was quoted as saying, it is well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Most Americans have no real understanding of the operation of the international moneylenders, stated the late Senator Barry Goldwater. The bankers want it that way. We recognize in a hazy sort of way that the Rothschilds and the Warburgs of Europe and the houses of J.P. Morgan, Kuhn, Loeb and Company Schiff, Lehman, and Rockefeller possess and control vast wealth. How they acquire this vast financial power and employ it is a mystery to most of us. International bankers make money by extending credit to governments. The greater the debt of the political state, the larger the interest returned to the lenders. The national banks of Europe are actually owned and controlled by private interests. These same private interests now own and control the Federal Reserve System. Money for Faith and Debt According to William Grider, the Fed has assumed a cult-like power. 
To modern minds, it seems bizarre to think of the Federal Reserve as a religious institution. Yet the conspiracy theorists, in their own demented way, were on to something real and significant. The Fed did also function in the realm of religion. Its mysterious powers of money creation, inherited from priestly forebearers, shielded a complex bundle of social and psychological meanings. With its own form of secret incantation, the Federal Reserve presided over awesome social ritual, transactions so powerful and frightening they seemed to lie beyond common understanding. Above all, money was a function of faith. It required implicit and universal social consent that was indeed mysterious. To create money and use it, each one must believe and everyone must believe. Only then did worthless pieces of paper take on value. Money today is increasingly mere electronic blips on a computer, accessed by plastic cards at ATMs. There is nothing to back it up. As money is loaned at interest by great institutions, its worth decreases as more and more of it comes into existence. This is called inflation, which in some ways is a built-in tax on the use of money. And inflation can be manipulated upward or downward by those who control the flow of money, whether it be through paper or the electronic blips. The result of this whole system is massive debt at every level of society today, wrote author William Bramley. The banks are in debt to the depositors and the depositors' money is loaned out and creates indebtedness to the banks, making this system even more akin to something out of a maniac's delirium is the fact that banks, like other lenders, often have the right to seize physical property if its paper money is not repaid. The Federal Reserve Anomaly In America, the bankers of the Federal Reserve System have the greatest control of the nation's money. Because the Fed is at the center of U.S. monetary policy control, it has become the central bank of the United States. By changing the supply of money in circulation, the Fed influences interest rates, which in turn affects millions of families' mortgage payments. It also can cause financial markets to boom or collapse and the economy to expand or contract into recession. The Fed is the crucial anomaly at the very core of representative democracy, an uncomfortable contradiction with the civic mythology of self-government wrote William Grider. His 1987 book, Secrets of the Temple, How the Federal Reserve Runs the Country, disparages nativist conspiracy theories, yet presents an eloquent conspiracy argument for the Fed's control. Consider that a paper bill is simply a promissory note to be traded at some point for something of value. It thus makes sense to perceive paper money as valuable as real goods or services, this viewpoint worked well before the invention of interest. The early goldsmiths in Europe who warehoused gold coins used their stockpiles as the basis for issuing paper money, since it was highly unlikely that everyone would demand their gold back at the same time. The smiths became bankers, loaning out a portion of their stockpile at interest for profit. This practice loaning the greater portion of wealth while retaining only a small fraction for emergencies, became known as fractional reserve or fractional banking. This system worked well until everyone suddenly wanted their deposits back and started a run on the bank. Bank runs, or depositors demanding their money back all at one time, were a major cause of financial damage during the Great Depression of the 1930s. But runs are not just history. In early 2008, Northern Rock Bank, the fifth largest bank in the United Kingdom, was nationalized by the government due to financial problems created by the subprime mortgage crisis and a run on its branch banks. After the invention of fractional banking came the implementation of fiat money, intrinsically worthless paper money made valuable by law or decree of government. An early example of this system was recorded by Marco Polo during his visit to China in 1275. 
Polo noted the emperor forced his people to accept black pieces of paper with an official seal on them as legal money under pain of imprisonment or death. The emperor then used his fiat money to pay all his foreign debts. One is tempted to marvel at the emperor's audacious power and the subservience of his subjects who endured such an outrage, wrote G. Edward Griffin. But our smugness rapidly vanishes when we consider the similarity of our own Federal Reserve notes. They are adorned with signatures and seals. Counterfeiters are severely punished. The government pays its expenses with them. The population is forced to accept them. They, and the invisible checkbook money into which they can be converted, are made in such vast quantity that it must be equal in amount to all the treasures of the world. And yet, they cost nothing to make. In truth, our present monetary system is an almost exact replica of that which supported the warlords of seven centuries ago. Nowhere was the art of making money out of money more developed than in the ancient Khazar Empire, which evolved from nomadic raider clans operating in the east-west caravan routes in the Caucasus mountain region north of Iraq and between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea. By the 10th century, the Khazars had created a wealthy empire that stretched from north of the Black Sea to the Ural Mountains and west of the Caspian Sea to the Dnieper River. The warlords of the Khazars thought that exchanging and loaning money would be more profitable and less hazardous than raiding caravans. There was one problem. The Khazar Empire was almost evenly divided among Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Both Christians and Muslims believed that charging interest on a loan, then called usury, was a sin. Only Jews could openly charge interest on loans. Whether they did it out of pragmatism or actual religiosity, the Khazar aristocrats professed a conversion to Judaism. According to the Random House Encyclopedia, some scholars believe they, the Khazars, are the progenitors of many Eastern European Jews. This would include the renowned Rothschild family who financially ruled Europe for more than a century. Conspiracy researchers claim they still dominate the world financial order and have been the financial backers of the Rockefellers and other wealthy families. It might be noted that none of these converted Khazarians had any connection whatsoever to Palestine, yet these were among the Russian progenitors of the political movement known as Zionism. The 1917 Balfour Declaration, a statement by British Foreign Secretary Alfred Balfour that guaranteed a Jewish home in Palestine and was later approved as a mandate by the League of Nations, is acknowledged as the foundation for the creation of the State of Israel. This letter originally was a reply to a leading Zionist, Baron Walter Rothschild, the first unconverted Jewish peer in England's House of Lords. The money management methods of the Rothschild banking dynasty have been emulated for decades by the globalist financiers, whether Jewish or otherwise. One key component of this management is secrecy. Utilizing bought-off politicians who catch the public rage and scrutiny, major globalists are able to operate out of the public eye almost with impunity. Derek Wilson, who chronicled the Rothschild Empire in his 1988 book, Rothschild, The Wealth and Power of a Dynasty, wrote, Even when in later years some of them, the Rothschilds, entered Parliament, they did not feature prominently in the assembly chambers of London, Paris, or Berlin. Yet all the while they were helping to shape the major events of the day, by granting or withholding funds, by providing statesmen with an official diplomatic service, by influencing appointments to high office, and by an almost daily intercourse with the great decision-makers. The invention of the printing press, which allowed for the printing of paper money as well as the Bible, led to the Age of Enlightenment and the decline of the Roman Church. Money replaced religion as the new control mechanism of the wealthy elite. And despite the popular myth the American colonial revolt against England occurred more over concern for its own currency than a small tax on tea. Benjamin Franklin wrote, 
the inability of the colonists to get the power to issue their own money permanently out of the hands of George III and the international bankers was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. As previously discussed, wealth equals power, and the American revolutionists knew that to gain true freedom, they had to break the power of the Rothschild-dominated Bank of England, which had outlawed their money, colonial script. Once America's freedom was secured, founding fathers Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton began arguing over whether or not to adopt a central bank. Hamilton believed in a strong central government with a central bank overseen by a wealthy elite. No society could succeed which did not unite the interest and credit of rich individuals with those of the state, Hamilton wrote. Supporters of Hamilton's elitism formed America's first political party, the Federalists. Hamilton, once described as a tool of the international bankers, argued that a national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. It will be a powerful cement to our nation. It will also create a necessity for keeping up taxation to a degree which, without being oppressive, will be a spur to industry. America's first central bank, the Bank of North America, was created in 1781 by Continental Congressman Robert Morris, who modeled the bank after the Bank of England. The bank was formed before the Constitution was drafted and was wrought with fraud and plagued with inflation caused by the creation of baseless fiat currency. The bank lasted for three years. Morris's former aide, Alexander Hamilton, became Secretary of the Treasury, and in 1791 headed the next attempt at a central bank by establishing the first bank of the United States. He was strongly opposed by Jefferson and his followers. In 1811, the charter of the first bank of the United States was not renewed. Jefferson knew from British and European history that a central bank trading on interest could quickly become the master of a nation noting to John Taylor in 1816 that the other nations of Europe have tried and trodden every path of force or folly in fruitless quest of the same object. Yet we still expect to find in juggling tricks and banking dreams that money can be made out of nothing. Banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. Jefferson added, Already they have raised up a money aristocracy. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Jefferson believed that instituting a central bank would be unconstitutional. I consider the foundation of the Constitution as laid on this ground, enshrined in the Tenth Amendment, that all powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states or to the people. To take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specially drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power, no longer susceptible of any definition. The incorporation of a bank and the powers assumed by this bill have not, in my opinion, been delegated to the United States by the Constitution. Despite Jefferson's lobbying, the financial chaos that resulted from the War of 1812 prompted Congress to issue a 20-year charter to the Second Bank of the United States in 1816. Andrew Jackson, the first president from west of the Appalachian Mountains, denounced the central bank as unconstitutional and a curse to a republic inasmuch as it is calculated to raise around the administration a moneyed aristocracy dangerous to the liberties of the country. This central bank ended in 1836, after President Jackson vetoed a congressional bill to extend its charter. Much to bankers' dismay, Jackson fully eliminated the national debt by the end of his two terms as president. It was probably no coincidence that America's first assassination attempt was made on Jackson by a man named Richard Lawrence, a man who claimed to be in touch with the powers in Europe, who had promised to intervene if any attempt was made to punish him. Lawrence was a painter, 
and many speculate that at the time the lead in his paints had caused him to become mentally unbalanced and fancy himself the rightful king of England. After stalking Jackson for several weeks, on January 30th, 1835, a particularly humid day, he approached the president coming from a funeral. Stepping suddenly from behind a pillar, Lawrence pulled two pistols, but both misfired, most likely due to damp powder. Lawrence was swiftly wrestled to the ground by onlookers, including Congressman Davy Crockett, aided by Jackson. At his trial, Lawrence was prosecuted by Francis Scott Key, the author of The Star-Spangled Banner. The jury took only five minutes to find Lawrence insane, and he spent the rest of his life in mental institutions, dying in 1861. Although many persons, including Jackson, believed Lawrence was part of a larger conspiracy, at the time there was no evidence to prove whether he was merely a lone nut assassin or an early-day patsy somehow manipulated into attacking Jackson, an implacable enemy of the international bankers. However, it might be worth noting that in two successful presidential assassinations, those of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy, both men were attempting to thwart the international bankers, Lincoln by issuing his own money, greenbacks, and Kennedy in bypassing the Fed with his U.S. notes in 1963. While most people understand what took place when the American Revolution was fought, Many are not aware of the permanent financial revolution that was being fought over the world's monetary system since 1694 when the Bank of England was created, explained international reporter Joan Vion. At that time, a group of private individuals decided that they could make a great deal of money if they changed the laws of the land to shift control of the country's finances from the government to them. The Bank of England, which is England's central bank, is a private corporation which earns a continuous stream of income when the British government borrows from them to run the country. England was the ingenious country that recognized that they could run the world's finances if they established private corporations in all the countries of the world. The combined debt of all the world's countries would create an income stream of unbelievable amounts. In 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act creating our central bank. Most Americans don't know that this organization is a private corporation established to control America's monetary system through the banking industry. Other attempts were made to resurrect a central bank in America, but none succeeded until the creation of the Federal Reserve System at the hands of a well-documented conspiracy. The situation we are confronted with did not happen in the last few years but began in 1913 when a group of cunningly deceitful legislators passed the Federal Reserve Act on December 24th at 11.45 p.m. after those who were opposed went home for Christmas, beyond noted. There was an occasion near the close of 1910 when I was as secretive indeed as furtive as any conspirator. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System, wrote Frank A. Vanderlip, one of the men who created the Fed. He went on to become president of New York's National City Bank, a forebearer of today's Citibank. What Vanderlip was referring to was a secretive trip on the night of November 22nd, 1910, by seven men who perhaps held as much as one-fourth of the world's wealth. Jekyll Island was J.P. Morgan's fashionable hunting retreat off the coast of Georgia, and the men went under secrecy so strict that they only used first names when addressing one another and brought in new servants who were unaware of their identities. During their week on Jekyll Island, the men worked on a plan for a banking reform that the government deemed necessary after a series of financial panics in 1879, 1893, and 1907. In fact, Princeton University president and future U.S. president Woodrow Wilson proclaimed that the solution to the financial panics laid in the appointment of a committee of six or seven public-spirited men like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of our country. 
cries arose for a stable national system that could regulate banking and prevent crises and panics. Today, many researchers believe these panics were artificially created as a pretext for the reforms. The seven men were Vanderlip, who represented William Rockefeller and Jacob Schiff's investment firm of Kuhn, Loeb & Company, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Abraham Piot Andrew, Senior Partner of J.P. Morgan Company Henry P. Davidson, First National Bank of New York, a Morgan-dominated institution, President Charles D. Norton, Morgan Lieutenant Benjamin Strong, Kuhn, Loeb & Company partner Paul Moritz Warburg, and Rhode Island Republican Senator Nelson W. Aldrich. Though Aldrich was not technically a banker, he was an associate of J.P. Morgan. He was also the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Paul Warburg, an original funder of the Council on Foreign Relations, was the brother of Max Warburg, chief of the M.M. Warburg Company Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. In just a few years, Max Warburg would aid Lenin in crossing wartime Germany to found communism in Russia. It must also be noted that Senator Aldrich was chairman of the National Monetary Commission, charged with stabilizing the U.S. monetary system. Aldrich and his commission toured Europe at taxpayer expense and consulted with the top central banks of England, France, and Germany, which were all dominated by the Rothschilds. After spending $300,000 of tax dollars, the Commission subsequently released a 38-volume history of European banking, focusing on the German Reichsbank, whose principal stockholders were the Rothschilds and M. M. Warburg Company. The National Monetary Commission's final report was prepared by the very men who had secretly journeyed to Morgan's Jekyll Island Hunt Club ostensibly to hunt ducks. These men concluded that having one central bank in the United States was insufficient. Rather, several would be needed, and they would have to be operated under the auspices of what would look like an official agency of the U.S. government. They also agreed that no one was to utter the words central or bank, a pact that held up well. The Fed was never publicly referred to as the central bank, until well into the 1980s, when the term was no longer as loaded. Speaking before the American Bankers Association, Aldrich stated, The organization proposed is not a bank, but a cooperative union of all the banks of the country for definite purposes. Paul Warburg had conceived of constructing a cooperative banking union in which restrictions on the banker would be removed in a manner palatable to both the bankers and the public. But too many people saw the Aldrich plan as a transparent attempt to create a system by the bankers and for the bankers. The Aldrich plan is the Wall Street plan, warned Representative Charles A. Lindbergh, father of the famed aviator. When Aldrich proposed his plan as a bill, it never got out of committee. Aldrich needed a new tactic. It came by way of the House Banking and Currency Committee Chairman, Representative Carter Glass of Virginia, who attacked the Aldrich plan by openly stating it lacked government control and created a banking monopoly. Glass drafted an alternative, the Federal Reserve Act. Jekyll Island planners Vanderlip and Aldrich spoke out venomously against Glass's bill, even though entire sections of the bill were identical to the Aldrich plan. By putting on a front of banker opposition, Aldrich and Vanderlip ingeniously garnered public support for the glass bill in the major newspapers. Meanwhile, another tactic was being played out in the political arena, dethroning the president. President William Howard Taft was already on the record pledging to veto any legislation creating a central bank. A more compliant leader was needed by the bankers. This leader was Woodrow Wilson the academic who had been retained as president of Princeton University by his former classmates Cleveland H. Dodd and Cyrus McCormick, Jr., both directors of Rockefeller's National City Bank of New York. For nearly 20 years before his nomination, Woodrow Wilson had moved in the shadow of Wall Street, wrote author Ferdinand Lundberg. 
Wilson, who had praised J.P. Morgan in 1907, had been made governor of New Jersey. With the approval of the nation's bankers, Wilson's nomination for president was secured by Colonel Edward Mandel House, a close associate of Warburg and Morgan. House would go on to become Wilson's constant companion and advisor. The Schiffs, the Warburgs, the Kahns, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans all had faith in House, noted Professor Charles Seymour, who edited House's papers. But there was a problem. Early polling indicated that the Democrat Wilson could not defeat the Republican Taft. In a political maneuver that has been used successfully several times since, former President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, also a Republican, was encouraged to run as a third-party candidate. Large sums of money were provided to his progressive party by two major contributors closely connected to J.P. Morgan. The maneuver worked as well with the 1912 campaign as it would with the subsequent campaigns of George Wallace, John B. Anderson, Ross Perot, Ralph Nader, and Chuck Baldwin. Roosevelt pulled enough votes away from Taft for Wilson to be elected by a narrow margin. Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act on December 23, 1913. The same day, the House-Senate Conference Committee had passed it along and the day before Christmas Eve. Congress was already home, and the average citizen's attention was focused on the holidays. Congress was outflanked, outfoxed, and outclassed by a deceptive but brilliant psychopolitical attack, commented G. Edward Griffin. Today... The Federal Reserve System is composed of 12 Federal Reserve Banks that operate under the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Each serves a different section of the country. These banks are administered by a Board of Governors, which is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The confirmation is usually a rubber stamp procedure. As previously noted, the current Chairman of the Fed's Board of Governors is Ben Shalom Bernanke who succeeded Alan Greenspan in 2006 and was renamed chairman by President Obama in August 2009. In 2008, Bernanke was photographed leaving the yearly meeting of that secretive globalist group known as the Bilderbergers, see Jim Marr's Rule by Secrecy for the History of the Bilderbergs, in Chantilly, Virginia. Also on the board of governors is Daniel Tarullo, a Georgetown law professor who specializes in international economic regulation, banking law, and international law, and who has served as a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. The youngest governor in the history of the board is Kevin Maxwell Warsh, a vice president of Morgan Stanley, who was age 35 at his appointment in February 2006. Warsh was trained as a lawyer, not as an economist. Today, most people recognize that the Fed is a pivotal force in the world economy, but few understand who controls it and why. It is a private organization owned by its member banks, which are owned by private stockholders. And who are these stockholders? An examination of the major stockholders of the New York City Bank shows clearly that a few families, related by blood, marriage, or business interests, still control the New York City banks, which in turn hold the controlling stock of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, wrote Eustace Mullins. In his 1983 book, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, Mullins presented charts connecting the Fed and its member banks to the families of the Rothschilds, Morgans, Rockefellers, Warburgs, and others. It is interesting to note that those who sit at the very top of the corporate academic and labor power hierarchy are listed as 2009 directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This list includes James Diamond, chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, Charles V. Waite, president, CEO, and chairman of the Adirondack Trust Company of Saratoga Springs, New York, Jeffrey R. Immelt, chairman and CEO of General Electric Company, Fairfield, Connecticut, Lee C. Bollinger, President of Columbia University. Catherine S. Wild, President and CEO of Partnership for New York City. And Board Chairman Dennis M. Hughes, President of the New York State AFL-CIO. 
Some suspicious researchers have speculated on why so many secret society members, Greenspan, Bernanke, Torillo, all members of the CFR, and attorneys are needed to supervise the U.S. monetary system. It might be that bankers need their legal expertise. According to early conspiracy researcher and author Gary Allen, using a central bank to create alternate periods of inflation and deflation and thus whipsawing the public for vast profits had been worked out by the international bankers aided by legal and public opinion experts to an exact science. In 1913, Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh said that the Federal Reserve System establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this act, the invisible government by the money power will be legitimized. The new law will create inflation whenever the trusts want inflation. From now on, depressions will be scientifically created, he warned. Most Americans understand that the Fed controls our money system but they believe it's part of our government, as would be expected of any organization holding that much power over the destiny of our country, explained Stephen Zarlenga, director of the American Monetary Institute in New York State. Americans also erroneously believe the banking business consists of accepting deposits from clients and then reloaning them to borrowers at a higher rate of interest. Though the number is definitely growing, most Americans have no idea that money, or more accurately, interest-bearing bank credits acting as a purchasing media which serves as money, is created by the banking system when loans are made through the fractional reserve provisions. This is understood by few novices, and often economists and even bankers fail to comprehend that they function as part of a money creation system when they issue credits and deposit them into their clients' accounts when loans are extended. Therefore, most Americans would be surprised to learn that almost all of what we use for money is not issued by our government, but by private banks. They have been allowed to form erroneous assumptions about our money and banking system that are far from reality, and that serves to shield from closer scrutiny from questions such as whether the Fed is truly operating in the public interest or advancing more private agendas, either on purpose or by default. Bruce Wiseman, president of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and former chairman of the History Department at John F. Kennedy University, explained the Fed's operations. When the Fed prints the money or clicks the mouse, they have no money themselves. They are just creating it out of thin air. They just print it or send it digitally. And then they charge interest on the money they lent to the Treasury. A hundred dollar bill costs four cents to print, but the interest is charged on the one hundred dollars. Go ahead, listen again. The words won't change. The interest on the national debt last year, 2008, was four hundred and fifty one billion one hundred and fifty four million forty nine thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars and sixty three cents that's one point two three billion dollars a day these are the same people that are now running our banks insurance companies and automobile manufacturers reason weeps sure I oversimplified it the Fed doesn't own all the debt and they do some other things but these are the basics. That is how a central bank works. Wiseman and many others believe the goal of the current financial crisis is to destroy the U.S. dollar as the currency of world finance and, in the resulting chaos, put in its place a globalist-run monetary authority that pledges such a crisis shall not happen again. Financial Stability Board the Global Financial Authority Wiseman alluded to may be found in the Financial Stability Board, or FSB, created in April 2009 during the G20 London Summit. The acronym G20 refers to the group of 20 finance ministers and central bank governors from 19 nations and the European Union. The FSB includes representatives from all G20 nations. The FSB evolved from the Financial Stability Forum, or FSF, 
which was established in 1999 as a group within the Bank for International Settlements to promote international financial stability. It is clear now that the forum's agenda of stability did not work out so well. Following the G20 London summit, this group expanded from the Discussion Group Forum, FSF, to a policy-making board, FSB, that can set standards, policies, and regulations, and then pass them on to the respective nations. Today, the FSB is made up of central bankers from Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Singapore, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the United States, plus representatives of the World Bank, the European Union, the IMF, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. Europe, in other words, has six of the twelve national members. It has been noted that the G20 will enlarge the FSB to include all its member nations. However, Observers see a definite pro-European bias. The United States will have one vote, equal to that of Italy. The governor of Italy's central bank, Mario Draghi, chairs the FSB and is former executive director of the World Bank. Like former Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, Draghi is a former executive with Goldman Sachs. Both Paulson and Draghi left the global investment firm in 2006 when Paulson went to Washington to head up the Treasury and Draghi went to Rome to oversee Italy's financial system and the FSF. America's commitment to the FSB was made on April 2, 2009, when President Obama signed the G20 communique in London and announced America's agreement to the new global economic union. Henceforth, our SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission, Commodities Trading Commission, Federal Reserve Board, and other regulators will have to march to the beat of drums pounded by the Financial Stability Board, a body of central bankers from each of the G20 states and the European Union, warned Dick Morris, best-selling author and former advisor to President Clinton. The Europeans have been trying to get their hands on our financial system for decades. It is essential to them that they rein in American free enterprise so that their socialist heaven will not be polluted by vices such as the profit motive. Now, with President Obama's approval, they have done it. Morris also opined on the FSB's ability for implementing tough new principles on pay and compensation and to support sustainable compensation schemes and the corporate social responsibility of all firms. That means that the FSB will regulate how much executives are to be paid and will enforce its idea of corporate social responsibility at all firms. Bruce Wiseman interprets President Barack Obama's signing of the United States into the FSB as essentially turning over the financial control of the country and the planet to a handful of central bankers who, besides dictating policy covering everything from your retirement income to shareholder rights, will additionally have access to your health and education records. Although the Fed is technically owned through shares held by its 12 regional banks, these banks are entirely owned by the private member banks within their respective districts. And who controls these banks? Their investors, many of whom may not even be Americans. Stephen Zarlenga argues that there may not even be reason for concern here, however. Stories that the Federal Reserve is owned by foreign bankers are not accurate, and these types of rumors have mainly served to discredit wholesome criticism of the banking system. The control of the Federal Reserve system is more difficult to untangle and is not just a matter of counting shareholder votes. While foreign bankers might indirectly own shares of the regional Federal Reserve banks through ownership of American banking companies, such ownership would be reported to the SEC if any entity held more than 5% of the American corporation. But, according to Zarlanga, there is one significant caveat. The strong, potentially undue foreign influence, for example, through the Bank for International Settlements, or BIS. Bringing the BIS into the financial mix is cause for further concern. 
into abyss. In a 2003 article titled, Controlling the World's Monetary System, the Bank for International Settlements, Joan Vion noted that the BIS is where all of the world's central banks meet to analyze the global economy and determine what course of action they will take next to put more money in their pockets, since they control the amount of money in circulation and how much interest they are going to charge governments and banks for borrowing from them. When you understand that the BIS pulls the strings of the world's monetary system, you then understand that they have the ability to create a financial boom or bust in a country. If that country is not doing what the money lenders want, then all they have to do is sell its currency. The BIS has even seemed to be cryptically signaling that it may try to exert more global financial control. In September 2009, a BIS report stated, The global market for derivatives rebounded to $426 trillion in the second quarter of 2009 as risk appetite returned, but the system remains unstable and prone to crises. Within days of this report, the former chief economist for the BIS, William White, warned that the world has not tackled the problems at the heart of the economic downturn and is likely to slip back into recession. He added, The only thing that would really surprise me is a rapid and sustainable recovery from the position we're in. Considering the growing power of the BIS over the U.S. economy and the bank's Nazi history, BIS developments should be of serious concern to all Americans. It deserves much closer scrutiny than that provided by the corporate mass media. For one, the public should be aware that the BIS is essentially a sovereign state. Its personnel have diplomatic immunity for their persons and papers. No taxes are levied on the bank or the personnel's salaries. The grounds on which BIS offices sit are sovereign, as are the buildings and offices. No government has legal jurisdiction over the bank, nor do any governments have oversight over its operations. It should also be noted that the BIS was originally owned in part by the Fed. The Morgan-affiliated First National Bank of New York, the Bank of England, Germany's Reichsbank, the Bank of Italy, the Bank of France, and other major central banks. The BIS, considered a central banker's bank, was created in 1930 in Basel, Switzerland, ostensibly to handle German war reparations. The BIS was also heavily manipulated by secret societies. According to Carol Quigley, a historian and a mentor to former President Bill Clinton, it was part of a plan to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent meetings and conferences. The BIS continued to control the finances between Germany and the Allied nations throughout World War II. According to Quigley, the BIS was administered by a multinational staff and was considered the apex of the system of bankers who secretly exchanged information and planning during World War II. Even worse, by the start of the war, the BIS was under total Nazi control. According to the bank's charter, which was agreed to by the governments that formed the bank, the bank was immune from seizure, closure, or censure, even if its owners were at war. The BIS bank soon turned out to be a money funnel for American and British funds to flow into Hitler's coffers and to help Hitler build his war machine, stated author Charles Higgum. Over the years, I have watched as the BIS has continued to push the envelope further in a borderless world, wrote Joan Vion. Some of their growing powers have come directly from governments like ours that have transferred the regulatory power they used to have over the banking system to the central bank, while the rest comes from the simple fact that they do indeed control the monetary system of the world. Vion, who had occasion to visit BIS headquarters, believes the bank has gained more power in global finance than most people know. 
This power stems from the BIS's very powerful committees, which include the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which has been working on how to regulate not only international banks of the world, but eventually every national bank as well. The Committee on the Global Financial System, which monitors financial markets around the world with the objective of identifying potential risks for financial stability. And the Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems, which looks to strengthen the infrastructure of financial markets with regard to rules on how to transfer monies and how to make payments between member banks. The Wall Street Journal reported on a 2003 meeting which included economist Dr. Jakob Frenkel, former U.S. Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, and Nobel Laureate and Columbia Economics Professor Dr. Robert Mundell. Their theme was, Does the Global Economy Need a Global Currency? The thesis was that if the euro can replace the franc, mark, and lira, why can't a new world currency merge the dollar, euro, and yen? I submit to you that this is the next agenda of the central bankers. When this change occurs, I can assure you they will make money on a new global currency. Time will tell if we do. The globalist bankers make money on each dollar they print because the American taxpayer is available to make up for any losses incurred. G. Edward Griffin quoted Paul Warburg, one of the founders of the Fed and its first chairman, as admitting, While technically and legally the Federal Reserve note is an obligation of the United States government, in reality it is an obligation, the sole actual responsibility for which rests on the reserve banks. The government could only be called upon to take them up on their obligation after the reserve banks had failed. The man who masterminded the Federal Reserve System is telling us that Federal Reserve notes constitute privately issued money with the taxpayers standing by to cover the potential losses of those banks which issue it. Griffin explained. Again, we see a clear example of private profit but public debt. The Reserve Bank takes the profit, while the taxpayers take the losses. Perhaps Jefferson and Lindbergh were right after all when they warned about private control over a central bank. With the creation of the Fed, the major bankers finally fulfilled a long-standing goal, taxpayer liability for the losses of private banks. Some have called it corporate socialism whereby liabilities are assumed by the public treasury, but profits are for the private gain of the bank officers and investors. A taxpayer bailout was made manifest in the fall of 2008. The money that was used to cover government overspending and private corporation bailouts comes from a national income tax, which was invented by the same men who were behind creating the Fed. Sounding eerily like today's politicians, Wilson proclaimed his government was more concerned about human rights than about property rights. Using this rhetoric as a smokescreen, Wilson pushed through more progressive legislation than any previous American administration. He created the Internal Revenue Service of the Treasury Department to enforce a graduated income tax, the Federal Farm Loan Act, which created 12 banks for farmers, and the Federal Trade Commission to regulate business. To many people at the time, all of this legislation appeared necessary. Some still would argue that perhaps it is better that knowledgeable bankers be in charge of our nation's money supply. After all, a 1963 Federal Reserve publication states, The function of the Federal Reserve is to foster a flow of money and credit that will facilitate orderly economic growth, a stable dollar, and long-run balance in our international payments. Attempts to Audit the Fed If the true functions of the Fed are to protect the nation's money, then it has failed miserably. In 2009, its failure brought demands for an audit of the Fed and possibly for its abolishment. Because no government audit of the Fed has been allowed since its inception, there has been no way to examine the Fed's true operating expenses or activities. As far back as 1975, consumer advocate Ralph Nader asked, Since other departments of government, including the Departments of Defense and Treasury and other agencies that regulate banks, 
have long been subject to the audit of the General Accounting Office, or GAO, the investigative arm of the Congress. Why has the Federal Reserve been excluded? The answer is found in the secretive mixture of big power and big money of the banking goliaths and their Federal Reserve servants that for decades has kept such matters away from both the public and Congress in order to retain their unperturbed control. No matter how obscure the functions of the Fed are to the average citizen, according to Nader, its decisions and policies affect the level of inflation, unemployment, home buying, consumer credit, and other prices consumers and workers must bear. It also adds up to how few or how many financial corporations will dominate the economy. Despite Nader's support, as well as the backing of savings and loans institutions, credit unions, and some small bankers, a bill to provide for annual congressional audit of the giant Federal Reserve System was never passed in the 1970s. Nothing much has changed more than 30 years later. Explanations that come from the Internet of how the Fed operates almost always come from government or Fed sources. Nevertheless, efforts have continued to rein in the Fed. On the pro-business site Forbes.com, Texas Representative and Dark Horse presidential campaign contender Ron Paul wrote in May 2009, One of the fallacies of modern economics is the idea that a central bank is required in order to keep inflation low and promote economic growth. In reality, it is the central bank's monetary policy that causes inflation and depresses economic growth. Inflation is an increase in the supply of money which in our day and age is directly caused or initiated by central banks. After noting the crumbling economy, Paul observed, The necessary first step to restoring economic stability in this country is to audit the Fed, to find out the multitude of sectors in which it has involved itself, and, once the audit has been completed, to analyze the results and determine how the Fed should be reined in. Proposals to push the Fed back into the shadows or to give it an even greater role as a guarantor of systemic stability, are as misguided as they are harmful. On February 26, 2009, Ron Paul introduced Bill H.R. 1207, stating, Serious discussion of proposals to oversee the Federal Reserve is long overdue. I have been a longtime proponent of more effective oversight and auditing of the Fed. Since its inception, the Federal Reserve has always operated in the shadows, without sufficient scrutiny or oversight of its operations. While the conventional excuse is that this is intended to reduce the Fed's susceptibility to political pressures, the reality is that the Fed acts as a foil for the government. Whenever you question the Fed about the strength of the dollar, they will refer you to the Treasury, and vice versa. The Federal Reserve has, on the one hand, many of the privileges of government agencies, while retaining benefits of private organizations such as being insulated from Freedom of Information Act requests. The Federal Reserve can enter into agreements with foreign central banks and foreign governments, and the GAO, the government's General Accountability Office, is prohibited from auditing or even seeing these agreements. Why should a government-established agency, whose police force has federal law enforcement powers and whose notes have legal tender status in this country, be allowed to enter into agreements with foreign powers and foreign banking institutions with no oversight, particularly when hundreds of billions of dollars of currency swaps have been announced and implemented, the Fed's negotiations with the European Central Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and the other institutions should face increased scrutiny, most especially because of their significant effect on foreign policy. If the State Department were able to do this, it would be characterized as a rogue agency, and brought to heel. And if a private individual did this, he might face prosecution under the Logan Act. Yet the Fed avoids both fates. More importantly, the Fed's funding facilities and its agreements with the Treasury should be reviewed. The Treasury's supplementary financing accounts that fund Fed facilities allow the Treasury to funnel money to Wall Street without GAO or congressional oversight. Additional funding facilities such as the primary dealer credit facility and the term securities lending facility, allow the Fed to keep financial asset prices artificially inflated and subsidize poorly performing financial firms. 
the Federal Reserve Transparency Act would eliminate restrictions on GAO audits of the Federal Reserve and open Fed operations to enhanced scrutiny. By opening all Fed operations to a GAO audit and calling for such an audit to be completed by the end of 2010, the Federal Reserve Transparency Act would achieve much-needed transparency of the Federal Reserve. National polls indicated deep and widespread public support for Paul's proposed audit. A mid-2009 Gallup poll showed that only 30% of those surveyed thought the Fed was doing a good job. Additionally, a Rasmussen poll stated that 75% of respondents wanted Congress to audit the Fed. Taking these poll numbers into consideration, the passage of legislation to audit the Fed is a litmus test to see who wields more power in the United States, the people or the banking interests. As of February 2010, Paul's attempt to pass legislation to audit the Fed had gained 319 co-sponsors in the House and 32 sponsors in the Senate, where it was known as the Federal Reserve Sunshine Act of 2009, S-604. In early 2009, H.R. 1207 was referred to the House Committee on Financial Services, chaired by Massachusetts Democrat Barney Frank. In a letter to a constituent, Frank wrote, I agree with the general thrust of Ron Paul's bill. There have already been some moves forward in increasing the transparency of the Federal Reserve, and I agree that there are further steps we can take. I do believe that the Federal Reserve is exercising that power with some good effects recently, but it is not a power that should exist in a democratic society in the hands of an entirely unelected entity. On July 6, 2009, South Carolina Republican Senator Jim DeMint attempted to amend the Legislative Branch Appropriations Act by adding the entire text of Ron Paul's bill, but he was stopped by senior Nebraska Democratic Senator Ben Nelson, who said the amendment violated Senate Rule 16, which prevents tacking legislation onto an appropriations bill. After DeMint pointed out that other GAO audits in the appropriations bill violated Rule 16, Vice President Joseph Biden, who also is president of the Senate, agreed but took no action and the bill passed without the amendment. After two readings, S-604 was referred to the Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs in March 2009. On November 19, 2009, the House Committee on Financial Services approved an amendment to the Financial Stability Improvement Act of 2009, H.R. 3996, that included many provisions of Paul's bill, such as the removal of some GAO audit restrictions and review of Fed policies and agreements with foreign institutions. This amendment was opposed by Fed Chairman Bernanke, Treasury Secretary Geithner, and other Obama administration officials. After further changes to the amendment, including a provision that provided for audits of the Fed's balance sheet, but not its monetary policies, in December, the Financial Stability Improvement Act was combined with several other financial bills to form the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2009. Financial Stability Improvement Act of 2009, H.R. 4173, which was passed on December 11th in the House with a 223 to 202 vote. No Republicans voted for the bill, including Paul, who apparently saw this combining maneuver as an attempt to water down his original audit proposal. Paul's vote apparently was especially addressed to those who continued to support a hands-off attitude of the Fed, such as Forbes columnist Thomas F. Cooley, the Paganelli Bull professor of economics and Richard R. West, dean of the NYU Stern School of Business, who writes a weekly column for Forbes. In a spring 2009 Forbes column, Cooley argued that it is important to have an independent central bank. An independent central bank can focus on monetary policies for the long term, that is, policies targeting low and stable inflation and a monetary climate that promotes long-term economic growth. Political cycles, alas, are considerably shorter. Without independence, the political cycle would subject the central bank to political pressures that, in turn, would impart an inflationary bias to monetary policy. Politicians in a democratic society are short-sighted because they are driven by the need to win their next election. 
This is borne out by empirical evidence. A politically insulated central bank is more likely to be concerned with long-run objectives. Cooley quoted a Ron Paul statement that auditing the Fed is only the first step towards exposing this antiquated insider-run creature to the powerful forces of free market competition. Once there are viable alternatives to the monopolistic fiat dollar, the Federal Reserve will have to become honest and transparent if it wants to remain in business. In response to this, Cooley wrote, Great! Obviously, monetary policy is so falling off a log simple that your elected representatives can insert themselves via the demand for transparency into decisions of true complexity and subtlety. Why am I not feeling reassured? He added, Anything that threatens the independence of the Fed threatens the long-term viability of monetary policy. It is really important that the expanded role of the Fed in the current crisis not threaten that viability. But does that viability include secrecy and arrogance? Fed Arrogance The arrogance of the Fed today is such that its board members refuse to even reveal what they have done with this nation's wealth. The amounts of wealth involved are staggering both in losses, bailouts, and unaccounted-for funds. In mid-May 2009, Federal Reserve Inspector General Elizabeth A. Coleman stunned a congressional panel by verifying that her office could not account for $9 trillion worth of off-balance sheet transactions made by the Fed between September 2008 and May 2009. We're actually conducting a fairly high-level review of the various lending facilities collectively, she said. She added that she could not provide any information on those investigations and that she had no authority to look into Fed practices, but only to oversee the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. Her inability to answer questions regarding the missing taxpayer funds prompted Florida Democratic Representative Alan Grayson to state, I am shocked to find out that nobody at the Federal Reserve, including the Inspector General, is keeping track of this. Even the Fed Chairman apparently wasn't keeping an eye on the store. On July 21, 2009, Grayson confronted Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke concerning the whereabouts of more than half a trillion dollars that the Fed had made as credit swaps with foreign banks. Bernanke's response? I don't know. Many Americans saw the Fed's economic recklessness as nothing less than an attempt by the financial rule makers to break the rules for themselves and their cronies in order to privatize profits and socialize losses. Americans were also concerned about the Federal Reserve System's great power over American monetary policy. Despite this concern, and despite his desire to see the Fed audited, Barney Frank, the chairman of the Financial Services Committee, and others in Congress have suggested that the Fed supervise the entire U.S. monetary system. A number of financial analysts disagreed. I have intense concerns with the Fed as a regulator, said economist William K. Black. Fed regulators have no power within the institution, and the institution is inherently hostile to vigorous regulatory action against the big banks. Conrad de Quadros, a former economist at fallen investment giant Bear Stearns, agreed with Black's point, writing, There were obviously some significant lapses at the Fed, so widening their regulatory authority isn't really what the system needs. The Reuters news agency put the usual mild spin on the economists' criticisms by stating in an April 2009 article, Yet given the institution's opaqueness and its failure to prevent the current financial crisis, Critics say the country would not be well served if the central bank were anointed as an all-powerful supra-regulator. Opaqueness is an understatement. In November 2008, the worldwide financial information network Bloomberg filed suit against the Fed under the Freedom of Information Act after the central bank refused to disclose details concerning 11 Fed-created lending programs that paid out more than $2 trillion in U.S. taxpayer money. Not only did Fed officials decline to say who received this staggering amount of money, 
but they also would not detail what assets the Fed had accepted as collateral. Bloomberg LP, majority owned by New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, sued on behalf of its Bloomberg News Unit. The Fed responded to Bloomberg by reiterating its non-government standing and claiming that although it had found 231 pages of records on the transactions, it was allowed to withhold such information as trade secrets and commercial information. Fed officials further argued the United States is facing an unprecedented crisis in which loss in confidence in and between financial institutions can occur with lightning speed and devastating effects. The Bloomberg Freedom of Information Act suit had argued that knowing what collateral was received in exchange for public money is central to understanding and assessing the government's response to the most cataclysmic financial crisis in America since the Great Depression. However, in an email response to Bloomberg News, Jennifer J. Johnson, secretary for the Fed's Board of Governors, wrote, It is considered judgment, and in view of certain circumstances, it would be a dangerous step to release this otherwise confidential information. Various Internet wags have suggested the don't delay us with questions or the whole economy will collapse. Tactic has been used all too frequently to stall or prevent public scrutiny of financial wrongdoing. If they told us what they held, we would know the potential losses that the government may take, and that's what they don't want us to know, explained Carlos Mendez, a senior managing director at New York's global private investment house ICP Capital LLC. In late August 2009, Manhattan Chief U.S. District Judge Loretta Preska rejected the Fed's argument of confidentiality and ordered the central bank to disclose details of the emergency loans. New Jersey Republican Representative Scott Garrett wrote that Preska's decision was strikingly good news. This is what the American people have been asking for. But because Judge Preska's decision is expected to be appealed by the Fed, there is now more reason for the central bank to be audited. Perhaps the reason more Americans are not upset by the financial improprieties today has something to do with what they ingest. Debilitating Food and Water Nazi German chemists worked out a very ingenious and far-reaching plan of mass control that was submitted to and adopted by the German general staff. This plan was to control the population of any given area through mass medication of drinking water supplies. The real reason behind water fluoridation is not to benefit children's teeth. The real purpose behind water fluoridation is to reduce the resistance of the masses to domination and control and loss of liberty. Charles Elliot Perkins U.S. chemist sent to reconstruct the I.G. Farben chemical empire after World War II. It is both paradoxical and tremendously ironic that the American public has more unlimited access to healthy food than any population in human history. Long after World War II, a banana was considered a costly delicacy in England. Yet Americans are, on average, unhealthy, obese, and over-medicated. Many nutritionists believe the problem lies not only in the quantity of food consumed, but the quality as well. Bad Food and Smart Choices By 2010, the food industry tried to bolster its responsibility with a new front-of-pack nutrition labeling program called Smart Choices. According to the food industry, the program was designed so that shoppers could make smarter food and beverage choices within product categories in every supermarket aisle. The Smart Choices website said the program was motivated by the need for a single trusted and reliable front-of-pack nutrition labeling program that U.S. food manufacturers and retailers could voluntarily adopt to help guide consumers in making smarter food and beverage choices. According to the program's website, to qualify for the Smart Choices program, a product must meet a comprehensive set of nutrition criteria based on the dietary guidelines for Americans and other sources of nutrition science and authoritative dietary guidance. 
The Smart Choices program covers food and beverages in 19 distinct product categories, including cereals, meats, fruits, vegetables, dairy, and snacks, allowing shoppers to compare similar products. Critics, such as syndicated columnist and former Texas Agricultural Commissioner Jim Hightower, claim the program is nothing less than an industry scam, created and paid for by such outfits as Coca-Cola, ConAgra, General Mills, Kellogg's, Kraft, and PepsiCo. Under this handy consumer program, hundreds of approved food products in your supermarket are getting a bold green check mark printed right on the front of the package, along with the reassuring phrase, smart choices. No need to read those tedious lists of ingredients on the back for the simple green check mark is henceforth your guarantee of nutritional yumminess. For example, you'll find it on such items as Fruit Loops and Fudgesicle Bars, groused Hightower. But even by industry standards, this is goofy. I mean, come on, Fruit Loops? A serving of this stuff is 41% sugar. That's a heavier dose than if you fed cookies to your kids for breakfast. Wow, talk about setting a low bar for nutritional quality. Indeed, food manufacturers can slap a smart choice label on a product just by adding some vitamin C to it even if the product also contains caffeine, saccharin, and chemical additives known to cause cancer and other diseases. That's not smart. It's stupid and deceptive. Deceptive or just shrewd business? And do others do better or worse for eating non-nutritious food? A recent issue of the journal Cancer Causes and Control reported that a 1996 through 2003 study of Ohio's Amish community showed significantly lower incidences of cancer. The Amish, known for their horse-drawn wagons and simple diets, are far healthier than the rest of the American population. An inadequate diet diminishes the ability of the body to fight disease and leads to lingering illness and even death. This plays well into the globalists' scheme to reduce the human population, as shall be seen. And they control the corporate food industry, along with the mass media. False Claims and Recalls Sometimes even a manufacturer's standard marketing presentation leads to legal action. In early 2009, the Coca-Cola Company was notified of a class action lawsuit filed by the Center for Science in the Public Interest, the CSPI, that claimed the company made deceptive and unsubstantiated claims on its vitamin water line of beverages. Coke markets vitamin water as a healthful alternative to soda by labeling its several flavors with such health buzzwords as defense, rescue, energy, and endurance, stated a CSPI news release, which pointed out that the company makes a wide range of dramatic claims, including that its drinks variously reduce the risk of chronic disease, reduce the risk of eye disease, promote healthy joints, and support optimal immune function. However, CSPI nutritionists claim the 33 grams of sugar in each bottle of vitamin water do more to promote obesity, diabetes, and other health problems than the vitamins in the drink do to perform the advertised benefits listed on the bottles. CSPI also criticized Miller Coors, in the wake of a previous settlement with competitor Anheuser-Busch over advertising for new beverages directed toward the youth market. CSPI described Miller Coors's Sparks as an alcoholic energy drink that contained stimulant additives that are not approved for use in alcoholic drinks, including caffeine, taurine, ginseng, and guarana. Often called AlcoSpeed, Sparks contains more alcohol than beer according to CSPI, which added, No studies support the safety of consuming those stimulants and alcohol together, but new research does indicate young consumers of these types of drinks are more likely to binge drink, become injured, ride with an intoxicated driver, or be taken advantage of sexually than drinkers of conventional alcoholic drinks. Following a settlement with 13 state attorneys general, Miller Coors agreed to remove stimulants from Sparks. Many people still feel that the food they prepare from a supermarket or local grocery must be safe. After all, doesn't the federal government assure it's safe? 
in 1993. More than 500 people were sickened and four died in the northwest from E. coli 0157H7, then termed hamburger disease, because it was found in undercooked beef. This particular pathogen, however, was found in other foods, including salami, lettuce, apple cider, and even raw milk, and it, as well as similar infectious bacteria, can survive and even multiply at refrigerator temperatures. A public outcry resulted, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, issuing its Pathogen Reduction Hazard and Analysis and Critical Control Points, or HACCP, rules in 1996. Under these regulations, the food industry was given the responsibility of ensuring the safety of its products. The government only had to verify this was being done. In 2008-2009, a wide variety of food items were recalled for potential salmonella contamination. These recalls included everything from snacks, cakes, candy, seafood, and dips, to vegetables, fruits, eggs, meats, infant formula, and mouth rinse. An extensive listing of recalled products is available at www.recalls.org slash food dot html. Eating on the run may help explain the rise in both cases and concern over tainted or unsafe food. In the United States, two out of three people ate their main meal away from home at least once a week in 1998. According to a 1997 study entitled Impact of Changing Consumer Lifestyles on the Emergence and Reemergence of Foodborne Pathogens, a typical consumer, more than eight years old, ate food away from the home at least four times per week. It also reported that half of each food dollar spent by Americans went to food prepared outside the home. The nation's growing dependence on prepared food means that by the time consumers eat the food, it has been transported numerous times, cooked and cooled, and touched by many different people. Each step in processing could increase the risk of pathogens. Although food once was grown and distributed locally in America, today large corporations produce food in centralized facilities and ship nationally and internationally, which means that a processing mistake will be felt nationwide or all over the world instead of just locally. Improper holding temperatures, inadequate cooking, contaminated equipment, food from unsafe sources, and poor personal hygiene by packagers can all lead to foodborne illnesses. According to Answers.com, in 1998, Sarah Lee recalled 35 million pounds of hot dogs and lunch meat due to the presence of listeria. This is food contamination on a scale unprecedented a generation ago, stated the site. It's enough to make even a glutton think twice about the food he or she eats. Growing Hormones Recently, genetically modified food crops using growth hormones have come under increasing scrutiny for causing health irregularities. Monsanto first synthesized the hormone in large quantities in 1994 utilizing recombinant DNA technology. Cattle now are routinely given growth hormones to make them gain weight faster, thus reducing both the time and feed required prior to slaughtering. Regulation of these hormones is not possible because it is impossible to tell the difference between the added hormones and those made by the animal's own body. Since the introduction of artificial growth hormones, Several reports have shown that boys are growing pubic hair and girls are developing breasts at younger ages than in the past. According to the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, studies in the United States have shown an earlier onset of puberty in recent decades, and there is evidence that the onset of puberty is changing, possibly related to environmental exposure to endocrine-disrupting chemicals that mimic estrogen in the body. It is hormone signals from the brain that trigger the onset of puberty. Some experts argue that such premature puberty is merely the result of cosmetics and the desire for kids to emulate favorite celebrities. However, this does not explain why premature puberty has been noted in the United States and not in Europe. 
according to a May 2009 study cited in the New York Times, which added, This discrepancy has led to speculation that the changes observed in the United States may really be due to differences in data collection methods among large-scale studies and changing ethnic demographics in that country. But such rationalization fails to mention growth hormones. As the use of growth hormones in beef and milk-producing cattle escaped the consideration of these researchers, if the hormones will increase growth in the cows, it surely must promote accelerated growth in humans. In a recent report based on a 15-year study of young girls in Denmark, researchers determined that the average age of breast development has begun a full year earlier compared with girls studied in the early 1990s. This may mean that as the use of growth hormones spreads, so does the accelerating maturation of youngsters. This may not be just another conspiracy theory as, according to the New York Times, studies have documented that a number of chemicals, such as bisphenol A, used to make hard, clear plastic containers, may act as endocrine disruptors and have estrogenic effects on the body. Few large epidemiological studies have been conducted to determine whether early puberty is associated with growth hormone-treated foods, and some that have, such as a study of recombinant bovine growth hormone, or RBGH, were done by the manufacturer. So, no clear connection has been established between chemicals having estrogenic effects and premature puberty. It is reminiscent of how the cigarette industry once fought health studies over the hazards of smoking. Concerns over food safety can be dated back to 1902, when USDA chemists found that food preservatives contained harmful chemicals, a discovery that added to growing public concern. In 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act were passed in an effort to assure the public that the government was attempting to protect them from impure foods and drugs. But then, in 1933, Arthur Callot and F. J. Schlink published 100 Million Guinea Pigs, Dangers in Everyday Foods, Drugs, and Cosmetics, a popular book attacking the 1906 Food and Drug Act and stating that the federal government was incapable of protecting the public from unsafe food and drugs due to incompetence and ineffective laws. The authors stated their book was written in the interest of the consumer who does not yet realize that he is being used as a guinea pig. Noting the close connections between the government and the giant corporations that produce both the nation's food and drugs, they foresaw that if the poison is such that it acts slowly and insidiously, perhaps over a long period of years, then we poor consumers must be test animals all our lives. And when, in the end, the experiment kills us a year or ten years sooner than otherwise we would have died, no conclusions can be drawn and a hundred million others are available for further tests. The Rise of the FDA Due to the popularity of Callant and Schlink's book, as well as federal whistleblowers speaking out publicly, the mass media that tended to stand with the corporations was bypassed, leading to demands that action be taken to safeguard food and drug consumption. The result was passage of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDCA of 1938. Today this act is considered the foundation of government food and drug regulation. It was meant to be enforced by the Food and Drug Administration, which was created in 1927 when existing federal offices were combined. The FDCA expanded the definition of contamination to include harmful bacteria or chemicals and allowed the FDA to inspect food manufacturing and processing facilities and monitor animal drugs, feeds, and veterinary devices. The Act also required ingredients of non-standard foods to be listed on labels, prohibited the sale of food prepared under unsanitary conditions, and authorized mandatory standards for foods, such as setting the allowable amount of rat feces in foodstuffs. Some claimed such legislation was not enough. According to a citizen petition to the USDA, 
filed by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in 2001. The prevalence of foodborne illnesses in this country caused by eating fecally contaminated meat and poultry remains staggeringly high, providing clear evidence that current inspection methods and regulations are insufficient and misdirected. The petition claimed that current inspection policies pertained only to that feces which is visible to the naked eye and does not protect consumers from unseen particulates. Further promises of public protection came in August 1996 with passage of the Food Quality Protection Act, the FQPA, that allowed the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to regulate pesticides used in the food production. However, the FQPA also eliminated the 1958 Delaney Clause to the 1938 law that prohibited even tiny amounts of any cancer-causing substance added to food products. The Delaney Clause, an amendment named after New York Democratic Congressman James Delaney, had set a fixed risk standard of zero cancer risk for pesticide residue in food. Whereas the FQPA softened this to a mere reasonable certainty that no harm would result from any type of exposure, including drinking water. Some saw the hand of the corporate globalists in this move to lessen public protection. One method to protect corporate interests is to fill government posts with persons connected to both sides. One prime example of the revolving door between government regulation and corporate foodstuffs is Michael Taylor, who was named President Obama's new Deputy Commissioner for Foods at the FDA in early 2010. Fresh out of law school in 1976, Taylor began his career as an FDA staff attorney. He then moved to the law firm of King & Spaulding, which represented Monsanto as it was developing genetically engineered bovine growth hormone, or BGH. Returning to the FDA in 1991 as Deputy Commissioner for Policy, Taylor, while instituting tougher anti-contamination measures for foods, supported the FDA decision to approve Monsanto's bovine growth hormone. He also was partly responsible for a controversial policy permitting milk from BGH-treated cows not to be labeled as such. Taylor then moved to the U.S. Agricultural Department in 1994 to oversee its food safety program before returning to work for Monsanto as a vice president for public policy. After a time at George Washington University in July 2009, Taylor became an advisor to the FDA commissioner. Genetically Modified Foods Another public concern has been over non-traditional genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, in foods. Such organisms have had their genes altered by scientists in a laboratory to help the crop resist weeds, insects, and diseases, increase its nutrients, or lengthen its shelf life. Beginning in 2006, more than 1,200 lawsuits were filed against Bayer Crop Science AG, claiming damages caused by the firm's genetically modified, or GM, rice seeds. Although the rice was not approved for human consumption, Bayer, along with Louisiana State University, had been testing the rice for resistance to the company's Liberty herbicide. Farmers in five states claimed that the modified rice had escaped and contaminated commercial rice supplies in more than 30 percent of America's rice lands. When the USDA announced that trace amounts of the GM rice had been found in U.S. long-grain rice stocks, there was a 14 percent decline in rice futures which meant lower prices paid for crops. Growers claimed this cost them $150 million. Bayer did not keep track of its genetically modified seed, argued attorneys for the rice growers. This is a living, growing organism. That's why you have to be so careful. But a major focal point of concern for the debate over GMOs is Monsanto. Headquartered in Crevker, Missouri, this multinational agricultural biotechnology corporation is the world's leading producer of GM seeds as well as pesticides. In 2005, Monsanto was reaching into other areas of food. The company applied for two patents with the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, in Geneva, 
for exclusive ownership of GM pigs. If these patents are granted, Monsanto can legally prevent breeders and farmers from breeding pigs whose characteristics are described in the patent claims or force them to pay royalties, warned Greenpeace researcher Christopher Then. It's a first step toward the same kind of corporate control of an animal line that Monsanto is aggressively pursuing with various grain and vegetable lines. Some semblance of sanity was brought to this issue on March 29, 2010, when U.S. District Court Judge Robert W. Sweet struck down two patents on human genes that had been linked to ovarian and breast cancer. This decision sent a chill through the multi-billion dollar corporations that today claim patent rights on about 20% of human genes. Judge Sweet's 152-page decision, involving gene patents of the Myriad Genetics Company, stated the patents were improperly granted as they involved a law of nature. He agreed with gene patent opponents who argued that the idea that isolating a gene made it patentable was merely a lawyer trick that circumvents the prohibition of the direct patenting of the DNA in our bodies, but which in practice reaches the same result. Some researchers see Monsanto as attempting to dictate what farmers will grow and what consumers will eat. The agricultural giant produces patented seeds, termed terminator seeds, designed to not reproduce, meaning farmers each year will have to buy more Monsanto seeds. Several recent court cases involved Monsanto attorneys suing farmers who illegally, or even unknowingly, thanks to the winds, ended up with Monsanto's patented crops growing in their fields. Such activity has made Monsanto a prime target for anti-globalization and environmental activists. Interest in modifying genetic material increased after a March 2009 report was released that stated that South African farmers lost millions of dollars when 82,000 hectares of Monsanto GM corn failed to produce hardly any seeds. Although the manufacturer, Monsanto, offered compensation for the losses, Miriam Mayet, director of the Africa Center for Biosecurity in Johannesburg, demanded an immediate ban on all GM foods and a government investigation. But at least in this case, only crops were lost. During 2008, an underreported epidemic took place in India when thousands of desperate farmers were driven to suicide when they could not get out of debt. While Monsanto claimed that their weevil-resistant cotton would produce larger crops, they failed to mention that they would require much more water, an ingredient in short supply. In 2003, more than 17,000 Indian farmers had committed suicide. The numbers have simply grown ever since, creating both mystery and controversy. Although the suicides were caused primarily by bankruptcy, many believe these bankruptcies in part came as a result of the promotion of Monsanto GM seeds. Though the suicide epidemic seems complex to those studying it, there has been more and more scrutiny directed at the role of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, and the biochemical firm Monsanto. Curiously, the suicides began around 1998, the same year the WTO allowed corporate giants like Monsanto into India's seed market. Non-renewable genetically modified crops soon replaced the self-sustainable farming system that India had used for thousands of years. Farmers were obligated to purchase not only GM seed, but also the chemical pesticides produced by Monsanto for those crops. According to Jessica Long of Montreal's nonprofit Center for Research on Globalization, 75% of cultivable Indian land exists in dry zones. Non-GM rice utilizes 3,000 liters of water in order to produce one kilo, while non-renewable hybrid rice requires 5,000 liters per kilo. Continuous GM cotton crop failures resulted in the state of Andhra Pradesh, the seed capital of India, prohibiting the sales of Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacterium used as a pesticide, cotton varieties by Monsanto. Due to the ongoing controversy over the use of GM seeds, 
In 2008, the Indian government forced Monsanto to reduce royalties received from its patented seeds. The economic disparity of Indian farmers only increases as they try to keep up with the lowest import prices. It is estimated that they are losing $26 billion annually, stated Long. While 90% of farm loans come from moneylenders, they are charged anywhere from 36 to 50% interest, placing them in a cyclical mode of poverty. Surely poverty alone cannot be responsible for such massive amounts of bloodshed. After all, poverty has always existed. So what is it about current conditions that have led to all this bloodshed? The fact is that mass suicides have transformed these farmers into agrarian martyrs for peasants everywhere. Monsanto officials denied that their firm was behind the deaths, explaining on the company website. The reality is that the tragic phenomena of farmer suicides in India began long before the introduction of Bolgard, Monsanto's herbicide, in 2002. Farmer suicide has numerous causes, with most experts agreeing that indebtedness is one of the main factors. Farmers unable to repay loans and facing spiraling interest often see suicide as the only solution. Although bankruptcy was the obvious cause of most of India's suicides, many blamed Monsanto's genetically modified crops, which required more water than traditional crops, as well as Monsanto's herbicides, for farmers' losses. By claiming global monopoly patent rights throughout the entire food chain, Monsanto seeks to make farmers and food producers and ultimately consumers entirely dependent and reliant on one single corporate entity for a basic human need. It's the same dependence that Russian peasants had on the Soviet government following the Russian Revolution. The same dependence that French peasants had on feudal kings during the Middle Ages. But control of a significant proportion of the global food supply by a single corporation would be unprecedented in human history, warned Brian Thomas Fitzgerald of Greenpeace. In January 2010, a study published in the International Journal of Biological Sciences reported that researchers after analyzing the effects of genetically modified foods on mammalian health, linked Monsanto's GM corn to kidney and liver damage in rats. Monsanto officials were quick to state that the research was based on faulty analytical methods and reasoning and do not call into question the safety findings for these products. However, the study's author, Gilles-Éric Serralini, responded, our study contradicts Monsanto conclusions because Monsanto systematically neglects significant health effects in mammals that are different in males and females eating GMOs, or not proportional to the dose. This is a very serious mistake, dramatic for public health. This is the major conclusion revealed by our work, the only careful reanalysis of Monsanto's crude statistical data. Awareness about GMOs in foods can be traced back as early as 2002. Although the FDA, EPA, and USDA all have stated that their research shows no long-term health risks from GMO foods, Dr. Stanley Ewan, a consultant histopathologist at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and one of Scotland's leading experts in tissue diseases, warned in a report to a government health committee that eating GM food could cause cancer. In a report to a government health committee, Ewan expressed great concern about the use of the cauliflower mosaic virus as a promoter in GM foods that could increase the risk of stomach and colon cancers. Ewan wrote that the infectious virus is used like a tiny engine to drive implanted genes to express themselves and could encourage the growth of polyps in the stomach or colon. The faster and bigger the polyps grow, the more likely they are to be malignant, he wrote, adding, It is possible cow's milk will contain GM derivatives that can be directly ingested by humans as milk or cheese. Even a lightly cooked, thick fillet steak could contain active GM material. Cancer was only one of some 50 harmful effects of GMO foods and growth hormones listed in a research article by nutritionist Nathan Battalion that included a warning from Harvard biology professor Dr. George Wald, a Nobel laureate in medicine. Our morality up to now has been to go ahead without restriction to learn all that we can about nature. Restructuring nature was not part of the bargain. This direction may be not only unwise, but dangerous. 
Potentially, it could breed new animal and plant diseases, new sources of cancer, novel epidemics, stated Wald. Monsanto's growth hormone, IGF-1, has been linked to increased risk of human colorectal and breast cancer in studies both in the United States and Canada. However, the FDA downplayed the significance of such studies. Reflecting concern over the safety of GMOs, the UN's Food Safety Agency, representing 101 nations worldwide, in 1999 ruled unanimously to continue a 1993 European moratorium on Monsanto's genetically engineered hormonal milk, RBGH. This ban was not reported in the American media, further indicating the extent of Monsanto's influence in the media. Award-winning journalists Steve Wilson and Jane Acri both were fired when they tried to expose the cover-up of such studies as well as the ban on growth hormones in Europe. According to the Goldman Environmental Prize website, as investigative reporters for the Fox television affiliate in Tampa, Florida, Wilson and Acri discovered that while the hormone had been banned in Canada, Europe, and most other countries, millions of Americans were unknowingly drinking milk from RBGH-treated cows. The duo documented how the hormone, which can harm cows, was approved by the government as a veterinary drug without adequately testing its effects on children and adults who drink RBGH milk. They also uncovered studies linking its effects to cancer in humans. Just before broadcast, the station canceled the widely promoted reports after Monsanto, the hormone manufacturer, threatened Fox News with dire consequences if the stories aired. Under pressure from Fox lawyers, the husband and wife team rewrote the story more than 80 times. After threats of dismissal and offers of six-figure sums to drop their ethical objections and keep quiet, they were fired in December 1997. The addition of unsafe, even toxic, chemicals to food and water may be attributed to laxity and greed on the part of producers, but when coupled with the public statements of leading globalists concerning the desire to reduce the human population, which will be discussed later, it takes on a much darker aspect. Codex Alimentarius One would think that a good diet with plenty of vitamins might help prevent diseases and malnutrition, but even here the New World Order may interfere. The World Health Organization, the WHO, was founded in 1948 with the goals of setting global standards of health and helping governments to strengthen national health programs. The WHO and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, work together in committees, conferences, and commissions. One of their most significant joint efforts is the Codex Alimentarius, Latin for Food Code, Commission which sets standards for food commodities, codes for hygiene and technology, pesticide evaluations, and limits on pesticide residues. It also evaluates food additives and veterinary drugs and sets guidelines for contaminants. Approximately 170 nations accepted standards and codes. In recent years, controversy has grown over the application of food standards to traditional vitamins and mineral supplements. A major cause for concern by nutritionists is that the Codex Alimentarius list is recognized by the World Trade Organization, the WTO. It is feared that the WTO will use Codex Alimentarius standards in disputes over the classification of vitamins as food. Such fears are not irrational, since in 1996 the German delegation to the Codex Alimentarius Commission advocated a ban on herbs, vitamins, and minerals sold for preventative or therapeutic reasons, and advanced a position that supplements should be classified as drugs with attendant restrictions and physician prescriptions. Though the Commission agreed, there was an aftermath of such public protest that passage of the new classifications was postponed. As protests waned in mid-2005, the Commission quietly adopted guidelines for vitamin and mineral food supplements, allowing member countries to regulate dietary supplements as drugs or other categories. 
Although the new classifications do not yet ban supplements outright, they do subject them to labeling and packaging requirements, set criteria for the setting of maximum and minimum dosage levels, and require that safety and efficacy are considered when determining ingredient sources. Should supplements become as inaccessible as prescription drugs, John Hamill, founder of International Advocates for Health Freedom, or the IAHF, believes that the average consumer will lose out on the benefits of simple remedies like herbs, vitamins, minerals, homeopathic remedies, and amino acids. The name of the game for Codex Alimentarius is to shift all remedies into the prescription category so they can be controlled exclusively by the medical monopoly and its bosses, the major pharmaceutical firms, said Hamill. Despite government denials that this could occur, the Codex Alimentarius proposals are today law in Norway and Germany, where the entire health food industry has literally been taken over by the drug companies. Hamill explained that in these countries, vitamin C above 200 milligrams is illegal, as is vitamin E above 45 IU, vitamin B1 over 2.4 milligrams, and so on. The same is true of ginkgo and many other herbs, and only one government-controlled pharmacy has the right to import supplements as medicines, which they can sell to health food stores, convenience stores, or pharmacies, he added. Opponents paint the Codex Alimentarius Commission as a shady, secretive organization that is the thinly-veiled propaganda arm of the international pharmaceutical industry that does everything it can to promote industry objectives whilst limiting individual options to maintain health, which would diminish members' profits. Behind the Codex Alimentarius Commission is the UN and the WHO. According to critics, both organizations are working for multinational pharmaceutical corporations and international banks whose owners support reducing the human population through such means as reducing the availability of necessary minerals in the human diet. This, in turn, could increase the occurrences of various debilitating diseases such as cancer and diabetes, the number three cause of death in adults in the United States. Citing a study at the University of Vancouver Medical School, neuropathic physician and author Dr. Joel D. Wallach indicated that vanadium, a soft, white, metallic element found in certain minerals, could replace insulin in adult-onset diabetics, a condition representing 85% of all diabetics. In a 2005 speech, Wallach said, I've seen it work on hundreds and hundreds of people. Now, to me, this is criminal. If you write to Hill's Packing Company that makes science diet dog food, high-tech food for animals, and say, how many minerals exactly is in science diet dog food? They'll write back, there's 40 minerals. You write Checkerboard Square in St. Louis, Ralston Purina, and say, just how many minerals are in your rat pellets for laboratory rats? They'll say that there are 28 minerals. I'll give anybody a crisp new $100 bill if you can find me a human infant formula in a grocery store that has more than 11 minerals. So dogs get 40 minerals, rats get 28 minerals, and human infants get 11. Is that fair? No. Doesn't matter if you're talking about SMA, Similac, Isomilk, Pro Soy B. In fact, that's why they call it Similac. Similac, because it lacks everything. While efforts in the United States to curtail vitamins and supplements have been stymied by public opposition, proponents found another ally in the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, which has now made Codex a trade issue. At the Uruguay Round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, which created the World Trade Organization, the United States agreed to submit its laws to the international standards which included the Codex Alimentarius Commission's Standards for Dietary Supplements. What this means is that now Codex Alimentarius is enforced by the WTO, whose international standards could supersede domestic laws without the American people's consent or vote in the matter. According to Hamill, if a country disagrees with or refuses to follow Codex standards, the WTO can apply pressure by withdrawing trade privileges and imposing crippling trade sanctions. 
The WTO was established with the understanding that it was to push the world toward greater economic integration. However, according to many, the WTO has ended up politicizing trade by putting the stamp of officialdom on some very bad policies and promotes further loss of American sovereignty to supranational organizations. According to Llewellyn H. Rockwell, Jr., president and founder of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, the WTO has the power to order Congress to change any U.S. law the WTO deems a barrier to free trade. If Congress does not obey the WTO, then American businesses and consumers will face trade sanctions. Congress has already changed America's tax laws in response to WTO commands. It is possible that the WTO will force America to adopt the restrictive regulations of foods and dietary supplements endorsed by the UN's Codex Commission. Despite centuries of human experience with healing herbs and vitamins, today's corporate medicine industry, especially the pharmaceutical giants that can be traced back to the Nazi IG Farben complex, has attempted to limit any healing agent to pharmaceuticals. Agents for this suppression of natural healing are the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission. Legitimate standardized codes for dietary supplements, such as Codex Alimentarius, require expensive clinical studies, research, tests, and analysis well beyond the financial reach of all but the largest corporations. In other words, a huge mound of personal narratives supporting natural remedies would be useless against a few reports from well-paid corporate scientists. In working to protect the business interests of vaccine manufacturers, the pharmaceutical corporations, both the FDA and FTC, have declared all-out war against any products that might offer consumers options other than vaccines, said Mike Adams, natural news editor and self-styled Health Ranger, whose articles and books have attracted a worldwide audience of nearly a million people. The FDA's official position is that there is no such thing as any herb, any plant, any nutrient, or any dietary supplement that has any beneficial effect on the human body. Thus, no herb, plant, nutrient, or supplement can ever be approved by the FDA to protect against influenza. As you figured out, the whole game is rigged from the start. Herbs that have antiviral properties will never be approved as antivirals. And frankly, for the people running natural product companies, to try to play the FDA game is useless. You can never appease tyranny. Trying to conform to the requirements of the FDA and FTC is like Jewish prisoners trying to conform to the wishes of Hitler. You've been condemned from the start, said Adams. Fluoridated Water How safe is drinking water? Controversy over the addition of the chemical sodium fluoride to municipal drinking water supplies has raged since the early 1950s. It was a time when Nazi scientists were being settled within the United States under the auspices of Project Paperclip. The Reader's Digest Oxford Complete Word Finder defines fluoride merely as any binary compound of fluorine. But fluorine was defined as a poisonous pale yellow gaseous element of the halogen group. Charles Elliot Perkins, a prominent U.S. industrial chemist, was sent by the U.S. government to help reconstruct the IG Farben chemical plants in Germany at the end of the war. In 1954, he wrote a letter to the Lee Foundation for Nutritional Research, stating that he had learned that the Nazi regime had used sodium fluoride as a means of mass control. I want to make this very definite and very positive, Perkins wrote. The real reason behind water fluoridation is not to benefit children's teeth, the real purpose behind water fluoridation is to reduce the resistance of the masses to domination and control and loss of liberty. Repeated doses of infinitesimal amounts of fluorine will in time gradually reduce the individual's power to resist domination by slowly poisoning and narcotizing this area of the brain tissue and make him submissive to the will of those who wish to govern him. 
I say this with all the earnestness and sincerity of a scientist who has spent nearly 20 years' research into the chemistry, biochemistry, physiology, and pathology of fluorine. Any person who drinks artificially fluoridated water for a period of one year or more will never again be the same person, mentally or physically. Most people do not realize that fluoride is a key ingredient in Prozac and many other psychotropic drugs. Prozac, whose scientific name is fluoxetine, is 94% fluoride. Though fluoride purportedly prevents tooth decay, it only has been shown to affect tooth decay in children under 12. Today, two-thirds of all municipal water and most bottled water in the United States contain sodium fluoride. Fluoride is a poisonous waste product of aluminum manufacture that accumulates in the human body. The use of aluminum cookware has been strongly linked to Alzheimer's disease, a progressive brain disorder that gradually destroys a person's memory and ability to learn, reason, and make judgments. A Christian Science Monitor survey in 1954 showed that 79 of the 81 Nobel Prize winners in chemistry, medicine, and physiology refused to endorse water fluoridation. Nevertheless, every U.S. Public Health Service Surgeon General since the 1950s has supported putting this rat poison ingredient into America's water supply. The experts cannot decide where the truth lies in the fluoride controversy. Virginia dental surgeon and nutritionist Dr. Ted Spencer wrote, a few years ago, I was asked by the head of our local health department to conduct a review of existing journal research on the toxicity of fluoride with emphasis on its cancer-causing potential. I went to the National Medical Library and produced for him some 40 articles on the toxicity of fluoride. When we reviewed them, there was some discrepancy in whether or not fluoride was mutagenic. Half of the articles said that it was, and half said that it was not but it cannot be both ways. We wondered what was wrong. Spencer discovered that fluoride has been banned in European nations such as Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Austria, France, and the Netherlands. It is especially interesting to note that West Germany banned the use of fluorides in 1971, a time when it was still heavily occupied by Allied soldiers. Apparently, they could no longer silence the German scientists who had proved that fluoridation is a deadly threat to the population, wrote Eustace Mullins, a former Library of Congress staffer and World War II veteran who wrote numerous books on conspiracy topics, including medicine, finance, and politics. Despite Europe's bans, America continues to pursue fluoridating all water supplies and ignoring studies like those of Dr. Dean Burke, the chief chemist emeritus of the U.S. National Cancer Institute. Burke stated, In point of fact, fluoride causes more human cancer death and causes it faster than any other chemical. Dr. Perry Cohn of the New Jersey Department of Health discovered a correlation between osteosarcoma, a principal childhood cancer, and fluoridation. After creating a 2005 survey in seven New Jersey counties, Cohn found the incidence of osteosarcoma in boys under the age of 10 was 4.6 times higher in fluoridated areas than in non-fluoridated areas. The incidence of cancer was 3.5 times higher in the 10 to 19 age group and over twice as high in the 20 to 49 age group. Studies indicate that every major city using fluoridated water has experienced an increase in the rates of cancer. Not a fair trade for good-looking teeth, commented Dr. Spencer, adding, All allopathically trained dentists are very familiar with the ADA, American Dental Association, and other authoritative positions on fluoride. They rarely mention its toxic potential or the few studies revealing increased tooth decay after fluoride use. Spencer also referred to studies that suggest fluoride causes unscheduled DNA synthesis, sister chromatid exchanges, and mutagenic effects on cells. These terms may not bother some people at all, but they mean that there will be an increase in cancer after the ingestion of fluoride, Spencer wrote. Although each person must decide for themselves the dangers of fluoride, 
Spencer did point to several studies with convoluted titles that conjure images of grotesque science experiments. Sodium fluoride induced chromosome aberrations in different stages of the cell cycle. Chronic administration of aluminum fluoride or sodium fluoride to rats in drinking water. Alterations in neuronal and cerebrovascular integrity. And toxin-induced blood vessel inclusions caused by the chronic administration of aluminum and sodium fluoride and their implications in dementia. Given the massive amounts of money being paid by the pharmaceutical corporations to the corporate mass media, it is highly doubtful that many Americans will learn of the results of these studies anytime soon. The entire history of fluoride in America is one of deceit and conspiracy. In 1946, a Wall Street attorney and former counsel to the Aluminum Company of America, now known by the acronym ALCOA, named Oscar Ewing, was appointed by President Truman to head the Federal Security Agency. Ewing became in charge of not only the U.S. Public Health Service, but also the Social Security Administration and the Office of Education. Congressman A. L. Miller, a physician turned Republican politician, accused Ewing of being placed in a highly paid position by Alcoa, a Rockefeller syndicate, to promote fluoridation. Miller stated, The chief supporter of the fluoridation of water is the U.S. Public Health Service. This is part of Mr. Ewing's Federal Security Agency. Mr. Ewing is one of the highly paid lawyers for the Aluminum Company of America. Other opponents were less kind. Leaflets handed out in New York City boldly stated, Rockefeller agents order fluoride rat poisoning of nation's water. Water fluoridation is the most important aspect of the Cold War that is being waged on us, chemically, from within, by the Rockefeller Soviet Axis. It serves to blunt the intelligence of a people in a manner that no other dope can. Also, it is genocidal in two manners. It causes chemical castration and it causes cancer, thus killing off older folks. This committee, Ewing's study of fluoride, did no research or investigation on the poisonous effects of water fluoridation. They accepted the falsified data published by the USPHS, U.S. Public Health Service, on the order of boss Oscar Ewing, who had been rewarded with $750,000 by fluoride waste producer Aluminum Company. Suspiciously, it was also reported that Ewing told fellow senators not to drink fluoridated water. Health Care Blues If the nightmares of natural health advocates come to pass, a sick person soon will have no recourse but to seek professional medical assistance, which may not exist according to recent reports. This nation's health care system is in a shambles. Health care costs are moving beyond 16% of gross domestic product. And the U.S. healthcare system is sometimes 100% more expensive than anywhere else. Yet Americans do not live as long as citizens in other nations. Every citizen in these countries is covered by a health care plan. Whereas in America, 15% of the population, about 47 million people, are uncovered at any given time. 50% of bankruptcies in the United States are due to medical bills and many workers avoid changing jobs for fear of losing medical coverage, especially when they have pre-existing conditions. Many factors contribute to the poor state of health care in America, including malpractice anxiety for physicians, which leads to defensive practice. Also at play is the lack of coverage for preventative and mental health care, which could serve as a prophylactic for expensive emergency care later on. More troubling is the profiteering of insurance and drug companies, a system that rewards physicians for over-prescribing drugs. In her book, Overtreated, Why Too Much Medicine is Making Us Sicker and Poorer, Shannon Brownlee explains that a serious part of the health care issue is the lack of clinical research needed to guide physicians' decisions. According to Brownlee, up to 80% of health decisions involve ambiguity, the variability of diagnosis and available treatments, which leads to unnecessary treatments and costs. But don't blame the doctors for the failures of the American health industry. In 2009, the Wall Street Journal reported that an increasing number of doctors, including specialists, were either opting out of Medicare entirely 
for not accepting patients with Medicare coverage, blaming low reimbursement rates and complaining that the burden of bureaucratic paperwork was not worth the effort. Dr. Michael E. Truman, a Texas family physician in practice for nearly 40 years, explained, Over the past several years, I've noticed that reimbursements for services I provide are being cut or staying the same while the cost of business has escalated a great deal. Current reimbursements for Medicare are 35% below what most other insurance carriers pay. I have no idea what they're going to do this year, but if rates are lowered 25%, most doctors will start limiting the number of Medicare patients they see because reimbursement is below their cost for doing business. I haven't seen anything in the new health proposals that will remedy this problem. Truman said most large insurance companies refuse to increase reimbursements to match inflation. We have very little to say about it except not to see their patients, and that means closing our office, he said. With decreasing reimbursement, doctors will be forced to start seeing 40 to 50 patients a day, which means the patients will pay the price. They will get about five minutes of the doctor's time. With so little time with the patient, the doctors will be ordering more tests to cover their ass and turning care over to their nurse practitioners. When I went into practice in 1972, we didn't have any PPOs or HMOs. No one stood at our front door and collected part of our fee before the patient ever got in the office. We now have to subsidize big salaries for the insurance CEOs and who knows who else. They are getting rich off every doctor in practice today and insurance premiums are going up every year to the point that many of my patients can't afford their insurance anymore and they are now paying cash. Most of the insurance companies today are nothing but parasites, offering no vitality to medical care, just sapping whatever life is left out of it. With more and more doctors dropping out of insurance plans, soon there is no guarantee that you will be able to see a physician no matter what coverage you have, said Mark Siegel, an internist and an associate professor of medicine at the NYU Langone Medical Center. Of course, we're promised by the Obama administration that universal health care insurance will avoid all these problems. But how is that possible when you consider that the medical turnstiles will be the same as they are now, only they will be clogged with more and more patients? The doctors will be even more overwhelmed. Deserting doctors may be the least of the health care problems facing a zombie nation. Analysts estimate that the Obama administration's proposed universal health care program may cost upward of $2 trillion over a 10-year period. There is difficulty in even funding existing programs. In a 2009 article for FrontPageMag.com, Mackinac Center for Public Policy Associate Tate Trussell warned that we are totally unprepared fiscally even for existing programs. Neither Social Security nor Medicare is ready for the onslaught of the 78 million Americans who will stop paying into retirement programs and who instead will begin to draw on benefits government has promised them. The first line of baby boomers began signing up for early retirement under Social Security last year, in 2008. Soon the 78 million person tsunami of seniors will expect to be covered by Medicare. But just like the FDIC and Social Security, there is no stockpile of funds to fulfill government promises of health care. Payroll taxes supplying trust funds for these programs already are inadequate. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the Obama budget plan will increase federal spending 25 percent faster than revenues during the next 10 years. Incredibly, this is almost modest dollar-wise compared to the current unfunded liability for Social Security and Medicare, noted Trussell. It totals $101.7 trillion in today's dollars. This is more than seven times the 2008 gross domestic product, or GDP, our total economy, according to calculations by the National Center for Policy Analysis. These enormous figures to fund Social Security and Medicare seem too huge to even want to be acknowledged by some policymakers. In February 2009, John C. Goodman, president of the Dallas-based National Center for Policy Analysis, outlined the coming costs for government programs. In 2012, 
Social Security and Medicare will need one out of every 10 general income tax dollars to make up for their combined deficits. By 2020, the federal government will need one out of every four income tax dollars to pay for these programs. By 2030, the midpoint of the baby boomer retirement years, it will require one of every two income tax dollars. So it is clear that the federal government will be forced either to scale back everything else it's doing in a drastic way or raise taxes dramatically. Goodman added, if health care consumers are allowed to save and spend their own money, and if doctors are allowed to act like entrepreneurs, if we allow the market to work, there is every reason to believe that health care costs can be prevented from rising faster than our incomes. Otherwise, prepare for the tax tsunami. Is it possible that the globalists foresee this looming tax tsunami only too well and are siphoning every dime out of the U.S. economy before it hits? Such calamity could provide the very excuse they need to gain total control of not only the U.S. economy, but also the economies of the nations who support the U.S. dollar. Over and above the stretched, thin health care industry and approaching financial chaos, even more medical horrors loom on the horizon. The Mycoplasma Attack The victims of the neurodegenerative-slash-systemic degenerative disease myalgic encephalomyelitis-slash-fibromyalgia are ill with a very real physical disease deriving from a subviral particle developed from the brucellosis bacterial toxin. Donald W. and William L. C. Scott, authors of The Brucellosis Triangle. In recent horror movies, tiny microorganisms infect humans and turn them into flesh-eating zombies. Often, the virus has been accidentally loosed from a covert government laboratory. Although it doesn't seem like a pathogen exists for transforming a normal person into a cannibalistic zombie, there are a number of man-made germs and toxins that have been in development since before World War II that can devastate the human body. Nazi and Japanese Biological Warfare In the wake of World War II, thousands of die-hard Nazis were arriving in the United States thanks to a technology for immunity swap arranged between Hitler's right-hand man, Martin Bormann, and America's Wall Street elite, which included John J. McCloy and his protege, Alan Dulles. According to Dr. Len G. Horowitz's research, the WHO, World Health Organization, was heavily funded and influenced by the Rockefeller family, along with the United Nations and the World Bank and the fact that John D. Rockefeller's business managers and lawyers, John Foster and Alan Dulles, had created the partnership between the world's largest oil conglomerate and IG Farben, Germany's leading industrial organization prior to World War II. Before the war, Attorney McCloy had represented the IG Farben drug combine. In The Rise of the Fourth Reich, it was detailed how the Dulles brothers and their pre-war work for Schroeder, Rockefeller & Company, City National Bank Chairman John J. McCloy and Union Banking Corporation Director Prescott Bush acted as principal agents for Hitler's Germany. It might also be noted that the UN building in New York City sits on Rockefeller donated land. McCloy, who served as High Commissioner in post war Germany, also was chairman of the Ford Foundation, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Salk Institute, E.R. Squibb and Sons and the powerful Council on Foreign Relations. Described in the New York Times as a group that fixes major goals and constitutes itself a ready pool of manpower for the more exacting labors of leadership. In his 1989 Times obituary, McCloy was termed Chairman of the Establishment. Though U.S. laws were in place to forbid post-war Germans from conducting research on chemical warfare, these were largely ignored as John McCloy hired experts as consultants and helped fund German industries to produce chemical warfare materials for the American military. At the same time, Alan Dulles was named director of the CIA. 
Prior to the war, he had served as legal representative of the Nazi Schroeder Bank and then during the war as an officer for the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, where he supervised Army Intelligence Translator Henry Kissinger, who would go on to become Secretary of State under President Richard Nixon. It was Dulles, as head of the CIA, who expunged many paperclip scientists' Nazi backgrounds. During this time, Werner von Braun, long considered the father of our NASA space program, and other top rocket scientists entered the country, along with Walter Emil Schreiber, the chief of Nazi medical science who had supervised the sterilization of men using surgery, x-rays, and drugs, and had overseen the exchange of humans and mice as recipients of a deadly typhus virus. Despite being described as the prototype of an ardent and convinced Nazi, Schreiber worked for a decade in the chemical division of the U.S. European Command and for a time at the Air Force School of Aviation Medicine in Texas. Another German immigrant, Kurt Blom, told U.S. military interrogators in 1945 that he had been ordered in 1943 to experiment with plague vaccines on concentration camp prisoners. Blom went on to work for the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. These Nazis were joined at Fort Detrick by Japanese General Ishii Shiro, the man in charge of the infamous Unit 731, the Japanese Biological Research and Development Unit responsible for the deaths of 3,000 people, including American prisoners. It was the work of such enemy researchers that was continued and expanded in the United States following World War II that may have resulted in many recent health disasters. Mycoplasmas and Prions In the early 1940s, Nazi medical scientists had managed to isolate the bacterial toxin from Brucella bacteria, usually known as brucellosis or undulant fever and mostly found in mammals, especially cows and form it into a crystalline form or agent. Brucellosis is an ancient bacteria and was selected because it was insidious, very difficult to detect, and present in almost every organ or system of the human body. When activated by the crystalline agent, brucellosis stimulates various diseases that prompt a variety of symptoms, including debilitating fatigue, high fever, shivering, aching, drenching sweats, headache, backache, weakness, and depression. Damage to major organs is possible, leading to ailments such as multiple sclerosis, arthritis, and heart disease. The paperclip medical scientists coming to America brought with them this toxin, known as mycoplasma, a distinct type of bacteria lacking a cell wall. A U.S. government report dated January 3, 1946, carried a section entitled Production and Isolation for the First Time of a Crystalline Bacterial Toxin. The Nazi bug had been reduced to a crystalline form, creating an artificial virulent disease agent derived from the original bacteria. This crystalline bacterial agent could be dispensed by aerial spraying or by infected insects. The agent also did not respond to most antibiotics, including penicillin. Acting as a parasite, it stimulated both bacterial and viral diseases, and because it attached to specific cells without killing them, was virtually undetectable by conventional medical diagnosis techniques. Such diseases are considered untreatable and usually fatal because they mostly affect the brain or neural tissue. These subviral bacterium particles have various names. They have been termed prions by Nobel Prize winner Dr. Stanley B. Prusner, stealth viruses by Dr. John Martin of the Center for Complex Infectious Diseases, amyloids by the late Dr. Carlson Gaduzic, winner of the 1976 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work on mysterious epidemics at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, and mycoplasma slash brucellosis by Donald Scott and Garth Nicholson. 
According to a paper by Stanley Prusiner, prions are unprecedented infectious pathogens that cause fatal neurodegenerative diseases by the entirely novel mechanism of altering proteins in the body. Prion diseases may present as genetic, infectious, or sporadic disorders, all of which involve modification of the prion protein, or PRP, wrote Prusiner. Paperclip scientists working on these infectious organisms were based primarily in laboratories at Fort Detrick, Maryland, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland. It was here and in hundreds of other laboratories throughout America that immediately after World War II, our former enemies' scientists were brought in under Operation Paperclip to continue their research and development of some of the most horrible weapons of mass destruction known to mankind, noted molecular researchers Garth and Nancy Nicholson in their 2005 book, Project Daylily. The husband and wife molecular researchers noted that there are 200 species of mycoplasma. Most are innocuous and do no harm. Only four or five are pathogenic. Mycoplasma fermentans incognitus strain probably comes from the nucleus of the Brucella bacterium. This disease agent is not a bacterium and not a virus. It is a mutated form of the Brucella bacterium combined with a Vizna virus from which the mycoplasma is extracted, they said. The little mycoplasma also lost some of its genetic information such as the genes that encode the thick cell wall and other genes that code for certain enzymes and metabolic pathways. Thus, it is smaller than the most common bacteria, and without the distinctive cell walls found in most bacteria, it can take on a variety of morphologies. It must hide inside animal or human cells to survive, and although originally thought to be fairly fragile, the little mycoplasma was hardier than anyone had ever imagined. Although considered primitive by bacteriological standards, the mycoplasma actually evolved from bacteria that contained cell walls, but lost its ability to make its own cell wall, probably because it no longer needed it when hiding inside host cells and tissues. But it made up for the loss of some of its genetic information by having evolved with other genetic sequences that allowed it to enter and colonize cells just like viruses. But it was not a virus because it retained the genetic and biochemical remnants of bacteria. Like a virus, however, it damaged cells by interfering with some of the cell's biochemical cycles, and it encoded some nasty molecules that caused invaded cells to slowly self-destruct and die, said the Nicholsons, noting that important targets inside cells were the mitochondria, cellular batteries that produce energy and the DNA. The Nicholsons explained that biological warfare research conducted between 1942 and now has created more deadly and infectious forms of mycoplasma. Continuing the work of Nazi scientists, researchers in the United States weaponized the mycoplasma by reducing the pathogen to a synthesized crystalline form. They later tested it on an unsuspecting public in North America. According to the Nicholsons, the U.S. military's fascination with building this kind of biological weapon lies in the fact that the creature will hide inside cells and cause unbelievable havoc. It will destroy the mitochondria, eventually sending cells into an unrelenting death program, and in the process, gene expression will go crazy and surrounding cells will become damaged. This bug will then escape from its dying host cell to go to other places to eventually colonize every organ. And because pieces of the cellular membrane are dislodged when this little mycoplasma leaves its cellular hiding places, its victims should also be presented with an array of autoimmune symptoms similar to those found in various degenerative illnesses. It may even mimic some neurodegenerative diseases. It's beautiful because it should cause diseases such as multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, but no one will ever guess that they are caused by an infection. Most physicians will never figure this out. What a delightful weapon!
Several researchers, including the Nicholsons, Dr. Leonard G. Horowitz, Dr. Joseph S. Puleo, and the authors of the Brucellosis Triangle, Donald W. and William L. C. Scott, have linked this mycoplasma pathogen to a host of increasingly common neurosystemic diseases such as Alzheimer's, bipolar disorder, Crohn's colitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, diabetes, dystonia, fibromyalgia, Huntington's, lupus, Lyme disease, multiple sclerosis, myalgic encephalomyelitis, Parkinson's disease, and even schizophrenia. Some strains of mycoplasma are now being blamed for cancer and AIDS. According to the former chief virologist for the pharmaceutical company Merck Sharp and Dome, the late Dr. Maurice Heilman, this disease agent is now carried by everybody in North America and possibly most people throughout the world. Mycoplasma researchers claim many people today suffering from various neurological diseases are actually ill with brucellosis. However, because the disease toxin pathogen has been isolated from the source bacterium in a crystalline form, there is no blood or tissue test that will confirm this fact. Weaponized mycoplasmas generate ammonias that are deposited into the infected cell nuclei. These nasty beasts intertwine with the genetic machinery and are intracellular rather than intercellular. Other infectious agents are involved in the afflicted individual. These agents are usually mosaics of naturally occurring bacteria and viruses, and the effect upon the afflicted individual depends upon the individual's genetic predisposition and immunological makeup, stated Garth Nicholson. Each person is affected differently by the infection, but all afflicted individuals share a constellation of symptoms. We have a survey that describes 120 signs and symptoms, added Nancy Nicholson. In the case of the pathogenic mycoplasmas that we investigated, we found the HIV-1 envelope gene associated with the mycoplasma. This gene renders the mycoplasma more deadly. I've always wondered how many people that have been diagnosed as HIV positive actually have the chimeric, a mosaic of the mycoplasma bacteria and HIV. Reportedly, there are 10 strains of HIV HIV-1 promotes AIDS by compromising the immunization system, whereas HIV-2 does not promote AIDS. The other eight HIV strains are included in the biowarfare arsenal. The pathogenic mycoplasma can promote a non-HIV AIDS that mimics the symptoms of AIDS. No one will talk about this, said Nancy Nicholson. The mycoplasmas have been genetically engineered with pieces of genetic material from other pathogens, such as brucella. The mycoplasmas are often cofactors with the Lyme disease microorganism. All these emerging diseases correlate to biowarfare experiments conducted during the Cold War that went seriously awry. Remember, the U.S. did approximately 208 open-air tests on the U.S. population without their knowledge or consent over a 30-year period. It is possible that the crystalline disease toxin from the pathogens is one of the mycoplasma species, a technological feat accomplished by U.S. military biochemical researchers working with Nazi paperclip scientists. In 1946, the director of the War Research Service, George W. Merck, reported the possibility of using crystalline toxins to Secretary of War Robert P. Patterson. It should be noted that the War Research Service initiated America's biological weapons program, and Merck went on to become president of the Merck & Company pharmaceutical firm. Although Merck died in 1957, his early knowledge of the disease toxin means it could have been passed along to his colleagues at Merck Pharmaceutical. That Merck was involved in such research can be seen in a New England Journal of Medicine article that noted that a study of the hepatitis B vaccine used extensively in gay and drug addict communities was supported by a grant from the Department of Virus and Cell Biology of Merck, Sharp, and Dome Research Laboratories, West Point, Virginia. After extensive study, researchers Donald W. and William L. C. Scott concluded that those suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia are actually victims of 
man-altered versions of brucellosis emanating from the triangle. That is, the areas around Fort Detrick, Washington, D.C., New York City's East Side and Long Island's Federal Animal Disease Center, and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. These locations are often mentioned in biological warfare literature. Fort Detrick and Cold Spring Harbor especially were centers of Nazi paperclip research activity. According to the Scots report, this pathogen was tested during the summer of 1984 at Tahoe Truckee High School in California via the air duct system. Individual rooms were fitted with an independent recycling air supply system and the teacher's lounge was designated as the infection target. Within months, seven of eight teachers assigned to this room became very ill. Tahoe Truckee High School was only one of several locations where the specially designed pathogens were tested. Some pathogens were distributed by aerosol sprays and others were spread through contaminated mosquitoes. The Scots reported that during the 1980s, 100 million mosquitoes a month were bred at the Dominion Parasite Laboratory in Belleville, Ontario. From there, the mosquitoes were tested by both Canadian and U.S. military authorities after being infected with brucellosis. Some observers believe the 1999 outbreak of human encephalitis in New York City, due to what was designated West Nile virus, may have been the result of these infected mosquitoes. Additionally, the Scots also claim that unsuspecting victims were tested by both the military and CIA and monitored by the National Institutes of Health and Centers for Disease Control. Encouraged by what they thought was a successful test, military leaders reportedly passed the brucellosis bioagent to Saddam Hussein, who in the mid-1980s was fighting a protracted war against Iran with the aid of the CIA. With the approval of Vice President George H.W. Bush in 1985, Sodom received a startling array of biological pathogens, the essential raw material for a disabling weapon. This included shipments of both Brucella abortus, biotypes 3 and 9, and Brucella melitensis, biotypes 1 and 3. These toxins continued to be sold to Sodom through May 2, 1986, as shipments number 21 and 22 from the American Type Culture Collection, ATCC, in Rockville, Maryland. In a 2005 article entitled Molecular Terrorism, Gary Tunsky credited both the Scots and the Nicholsons with creating a growing public awareness of the mysterious and debilitating effects of mycoplasma infection. Chances are, if you feel sick and tired, and your doctor is unable to make a definite diagnosis because lab tests, blood chemistry profiles, and tissue cultures fail to reveal any disease pathogen, you might very well be infected with mycoplasma, suggested Tunsky. Since mycoplasma cannot be successfully treated with the usual short course duration of antibiotics due to their intracellular location, slow proliferation rate, and inherent resistance to most antibiotics, the few mycoplasma experts that specialize in this field are recommending six months to one year of non-stop treatments using strong antibiotics such as Cipro and doxycycline, he added. However, if a patient does not want to destroy their body and immune system with Cipro and doxycycline, a total overhaul of every cell from head to toe using a multifaceted, non-toxic, holistic treatment approach is absolutely necessary to overcome mycoplasma infections naturally. This is why vitamins and nutritional supplementation are so important in the therapy. Tunsky said the reason so many Americans are caught up in a medical merry-go-round of being bounced from one doctor to the next without ever receiving a proper diagnosis is that mainstream medical doctors are not trained to find hard-to-detect pathogens. Since mycoplasma hides intracellularly and invades multiple organs and systems, it manifests a vast array of symptoms throughout the whole body, making a correct diagnosis virtually impossible for a mainstream doctor's linear magic bullet mentality, he explained. Such inability to make a quick and simple diagnosis lies behind the mysterious malady that struck members of the U.S. military in the Persian Gulf War of 
91. Gulf War Syndrome After Sodom obtained a stockpile of the brucellosis, it was discovered that this contagious designer bacteria had mutated and become airborne. And it was too late. According to the Scots, Sodom used his toxins on American troops during the Persian Gulf War. This attack by mycoplasma, exacerbated by the impaired immunization systems caused by untested vaccines, the depleted uranium used in anti-tank shells and oil well fires, combined in a toxic mixture resulting in the illness known as Gulf War Syndrome. Researchers could only look dumbly on when 100,000 veterans returned from the Gulf War presenting all of the brucellosis symptoms. And the Pentagon could only take up the tried and tested myth that the veterans were not really sick at all. They only imagined they were, the Scots explained. Troops initially were told that no such infection existed and that the problem was mostly in their minds. But over the years, authorities were forced to admit that something had triggered severe illness in many Gulf War veterans. Curiously, French troops who served in the Gulf War did not receive the same mix of vaccines as the British and Americans, and did not suffer from Gulf War syndrome. Apparently, their undamaged immunization systems were able to withstand the mycoplasma attack. A 1993 staff report to Senator Donald W. Regal, Jr., entitled Gulf War Syndrome, the Case for Multiple Origin Mixed Chemical Slash Biotoxin Warfare Related Disorders, contrasts the relationship between the high rate of Gulf War illnesses among troops exposed to direct agent attacks and the much lower rates among those exposed only to the indirect fallout from coalition bombings of Iraqi chemical, biological, and nuclear targets. Because the U.S. military was not likely to reveal one of its most secret biochemical weapons or face liability by admitting that it had been sold to Saddam Hussein, the report concluded that vaccines were to blame for the troops' illnesses. However, the report also hinted at the possibility of other causes, stating, While other possible causes of the Gulf War syndrome, such as petrochemical poisoning, depleted uranium exposure, and regionally prevalent diseases have been discussed, no other explanation proves as compelling. Although Regal's report was completed in September 1993, it was not made available until April 1997, when the American Gulf War Veterans Association was finally able to obtain a copy. Not only were service members being forced to take untested vaccines, Many veterans were not receiving adequate medical care due to missing medical records. The Senate Veterans Affairs Committee Report, 10397, issued on December 8, 1994, showed that the military medical records of 51% of 150 Gulf War veterans surveyed were either missing or inaccurate. Clearly, something other than mere negligence must have been at play if so many medical records were missing or inaccurate. In 2009, Gulf War infection due to man-made mycoplasma seemed to be repeating itself. In mid-August, three Canadian soldiers were quarantined at a hospital in Quebec City, Canada, after returning from Kandahar, Afghanistan. The soldiers were infected with a drug-resistant superbug formerly titled Acinetobacter baumani, but dubbed by the American troops Iraqibacter. Fearing they, too, may have contracted this bug, two civilian patients who were in contact with the soldiers were also isolated. This isn't the first case we've had. We've received military patients returning from Afghanistan with this bacterium since 2007, said a hospital spokesperson. In a 2007 report, Wound Care Canada wrote that incidences of this strain have increased in U.S. military hospitals. America's CDC has issued a report stating that an increase of Acinetobacter baumani in military hospitals treating U.S. troops serving in Iraq, Kuwait, and Afghanistan was noticed as far back as 2002. Following the Gulf War and the misrepresentations of the government, the mycoplasma spread to the civilian population whereupon many people began suffering from debilitation and tiredness. Once it was known that the contagion was spreading into the general population, 
Top officials with the National Institutes of Health and Centers for Disease Control, as well as the Defense Department and the Department of Health and Human Resources, claimed the disease was connected to the Epstein-Barr virus. They labeled it chronic mononucleosis, and it has now become known as chronic fatigue syndrome, or CFS. Like the veterans before them, victims of this ailment initially were told it was merely a psychological condition. Yet, by 2010, the CDC had acknowledged CFS as a long-term debilitating and complex disorder characterized by profound fatigue that is not improved by bed rest and that may be worsened by physical or mental activity. The CDC estimated more than one million people in the United States are affected by the syndrome and that there are tens of millions of people with similar fatiguing illnesses who do not fully meet the strict research definition of CFS. One victim, Dr. Martin Lerner of William Beaumont Hospital, told his peers in the American Society of Microbiology that the mysterious disease left his heart damaged and that he suspected that CFS was caused by viral infection. Lerner, who founded the Treatment Center for Chronic Fatigue Syndrome in Beverly Hills, Michigan, created the Energy Index Point Score in hopes it would become a standard measurement tool to evaluate the degree of disability for CFS patients. Lerner has connected the Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus 6, and cytomegalovirus and similar infections to CFS. These are the very debilitating diseases studied by Donald and William Scott, who concluded that the victims of such neurodegenerative and systemic diseases are ill with a very real physical disease deriving from a subviral particle developed from the brucellosis bacterial toxin. The idea that a man-made biological weapon may be responsible for the ill health of millions of Americans is horrifying enough. Is it possible that such a catastrophic circumstance is the result of a conscious plan by the globalists? Depopulation efforts. Researchers now believe that virtually everyone in North America, and perhaps the world, carries the crystalline pathogen, although no symptoms will become apparent until the latter stages of some serious disease. Many conspiracy theorists believe in early 2009 that something within the swine flu vaccinations would trigger the pathogen. Swine flu, officially a new strain of the H1N1 influenza virus, was first identified in the spring of 2009 following an outbreak in Mexico. Oddly, although the strain contains a combination of genes from swine, avian, or bird, and human influenza viruses, it cannot be spread by eating pork or pork products, leading many suspicious persons to suspect that swine flu is of human manufacture. Some theorists also believe that the spread of the health-destroying mycoplasma toxin fits in well with the agenda of the wealthy elite who have long supported eugenics and have been looking for ways to cull the human herd of useless eaters. Many cite a classified study made by the U.S. National Security Council under Henry Kissinger in 1974, entitled National Security Study Memorandum, NSSM 200, Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests. This study, also known as the Kissinger Report, stated that population growth in the so-called Lesser Developed Countries, or LDCs, represented a serious threat to U.S. national security. The study was adopted as official policy in November 1975 by unelected President Gerald R. Ford. In a 1981 interview concerning overpopulation, former ambassador to South Vietnam and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Maxwell Taylor, after advocating population reduction through limited wars, disease, and starvation, blithely concluded, I have already written off more than a billion people, these people are in places in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We can't save them. The population crisis and the food supply question dictate that we should not even try. It's a waste of time. As if he were reading from Taylor's script, 
England's Prince Philip was quoted in People magazine as saying, Human population growth is probably the single most serious long-term threat to survival. We're in for a major disaster if it isn't curbed, not just for the natural world, but for the human world. The more people there are, the more resources they'll consume, the more pollution they'll create, the more fighting they will do. We have no option. If it isn't controlled voluntarily, it will be controlled involuntarily by an increase in disease, starvation, and war. Years later, Philip mused, In the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. In the early 1970s, Associate Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg may have echoed the views of Ivy League intellectuals when she said she believed the Roe v. Wade abortion decision was predicated on the Supreme Court majority's desire to diminish populations that we don't want to have too many of. She added that it was her expectation that the right to abortion created in Roe was going to be then set up for Medicaid funding for abortion. Where did Ginsburg get the idea that American policy-making elites were interested in decreasing undesirable populations? Some researchers suggested that Ginsburg, at some point, became acquainted with the writings of John Holdren, or of like-minded people in the most militant branch of the population control movement. In 1977, Holdren was a young academic who helped anti-natalist guru Paul Ehrlich and his wife Anne write Eco-Science, Population, Resources, Environment. Holdren's work states, If some individuals contribute to general social deterioration by overproducing children, and if the need is compelling, they can, could be required by law to exercise reproductive responsibility, just as they can be required to exercise responsibility in their resource consumption patterns. Expressing the desire for a planetary regime by controlling all human economic activity and interactions with the environment, the authors suggested the power to enforce the agreed limits on population growth by whatever means necessary. This includes involuntary sterilization, abortion, or even mass involuntary sterilization through the infiltration of sterilizing agents into public water supplies. Internet blogger and radio host William Norman Grigg pointed out that amid the Obama administration's effort to impose centralized universal health care, John Holdren sits as Barack Obama's science czar, in which he counsels the president on the role of science in public policy. This relationship has a certain strange Lovian undercurrent, given Holdren's enthusiasm for eugenicist and totalitarian methods of population management, he noted. Prolific author G. Edward Griffin best known for his book on the Federal Reserve, The Creature from Jekyll Island, also voiced concerns over Holdren's thoughts on martial law and depopulation. Noting Holdren's advocacy of forced abortions and putting sterilization chemicals in the water supply, Griffin stated that Holdren discussed the possibility of reducing the population by insidious means. He was not concerned with the ethical or freedom issues involved with these measures, only their practicality. Now we find this same man, an academic expert on population reduction, at the right hand of the President of the United States, advocating mass vaccination against the swine flu using vaccines that half of the medical profession believes are unsafe. Remember, all of those who hold power in the governments of the world today are collectivists, self-styled globalists, and the guiding rule of collectivism is that individuals and minorities must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the state or of society. Of course, those who rule will decide what the greater good is and who is to be sacrificed, Griffin said. This, of course, is the basic problem with population control. The idea of limiting the burgeoning Earth population is probably desirable, as the increasing number of humans as well as their waste is placed as strain on the planet. The rub comes with the question of who will decide which segments of the population must forego childbearing for the good of the majority. So far, it is the wealthy elite, the globalists, who have taken the lead in creating ways of holding down population growth 
through eugenics, drugs, and birth control measures. Former Assistant Secretary of Housing Catherine Austin Fitz agreed with Griffin that one of the globalists' goals is depopulation. Perhaps it is the goal of a swine flu epidemic as well, whether biowarfare or hype around a flu season, she warned. I keep remembering my sense of urgency leaving the Bush administration in 1991. We had to do something to turn around the economy and gather real assets behind retirement plans and the social safety net. If not, Americans could find themselves deeply out on a limb. I felt my family and friends were in danger. They did not share my concern. They had a deep faith in the system. As my efforts to find ways of re-engineering government investment in communities failed to win political support, Washington and Wall Street moved forward with a debt bubble and globalization that was horrifying in its implications for humanity. Overwhelmed by what was happening, I estimated the end result. My simple calculations guessed that we were going to achieve economic sustainability on Earth by depopulating down to a population of approximately 500 million people from our then-current global population of 6 billion. By 2009, 7.7 .7 billion. I was used to looking at numbers from a very high level. To me, we had to have radical change in how we governed resources or depopulate. It was a mathematical result. Fitz noted that some government budget analysts have concluded that the nation can no longer afford previously assumed social safety nets like Social Security and Medicare. That is, unless you change the actuarial assumptions in the budget, like life expectancy, she said. Lowering immune systems and increasing toxicity levels combined with poor food, water, and terrorizing stress will help do the trick. A plague can so frighten and help control people that they will accept the end of their current benefits and the resulting implications to life expectancy without objection. And a plague with proper planning can be highly profitable. Whatever the truth of what swine flu is or vaccines rushed into production without proper testing and peer review, it is a way to keep control in a situation that is quickly shifting out of control. Manufactured AIDS Adding to fears over conscious efforts to involuntarily reduce the human population are growing concerns that some killer plagues are man-made. To this day, many citizens still believe that acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, was created by bioengineers working in the United States after the immigration of Nazi eugenicists. It was in 1983 that AIDS was publicly recognized as a deadly and rapidly spreading disease, when the CDC called AIDS a peculiar biological curiosity among New York City homosexuals. Suspicion grew around the world that AIDS was the product of germ warfare experiments designed to destroy undesirables. One theory was that it developed between 1969 and 1972 in U.S. laboratories, then released in Africa by unsuspecting WHO workers in 1975 in doses of the smallpox vaccine. It was believed by some that AIDS came to the United States in 1978 in hepatitis B vaccine laced with human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Don't discount conspiracy theories on origins of AIDS, stated a headline in Kenya's newspaper, The Daily Nation. In a December 2009 article, it was noted that 33 million persons worldwide and 13 million sub-Saharan Africans have died of AIDS. Writer Angeo Kalambuka noted, Soon after the U.S. State Department published the Global 2000 Report for the President in 1980, advising that the world population must be reduced by 2 billion people by the year 2000. Thomas Ferguson of the Office of Population Affairs elaborated in the Executive International Review that the quickest way to reduce population is through famine, like Africa, or through disease, like in the Black Death. Population reduction is now our primary policy objective. 
The belief that AIDS was manufactured by the United States is supported by a record of hearings before a subcommittee of the House Committee on Appropriations in 1969. In his testimony to the subcommittee in 1969, Dr. D.M. MacArthur, Deputy Director for Research and Technology at the Department of Defense, said, Within the next five to ten years, it would probably be possible to make a new infective microorganism which could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease-causing organisms. Most important of these is that it might be refractory to the immunological and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious disease. In other words, he meant a type of germ that would neutralize the normal human immunization system. MacArthur told the congressman that tentative plans for the development of this organism had already been drawn up between the Pentagon and the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council and that the project would cost ten million dollars. Interestingly, MacArthur admitted that such a program was highly controversial and that there were many who believe such research should not be undertaken lest it lead to yet another method of massive killing of large populations. Mycoplasmas will forever be at the heart of the U.S. Biological Warfare Program, stated Attorney Boyd Graves, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and Director of AIDS Concerns for the Common Cause Medical Research Foundation in Ontario, Canada. Graves had produced a timeline flowchart that correlated more than 20,000 scientific papers and 15 years of progress reports concerning a secret federal virus development program, which he claimed proves the man-made origins of AIDS. The 1971 flowchart makes it perfectly clear and provides absolute evidence of the United States' intent to kill its own citizens and others, declared Graves. Graves told one interviewer, no one in the U.S. government has downloaded the 1971 flowchart. There is a substantial basis in the U.S. law and fact for the allegation and the conclusion that the United States intentionally made HIV-AIDS with the purpose for use as a population control weapon, a quiet and silent holocaust of people of color toward the development of a new world order. The depopulation views of Maxwell Taylor Henry Kissinger, and others are echoes of the words from a 1996 full-page ad by Negative Population Growth Incorporated, NPG, that was published in Foreign Affairs, the official publication of the Council on Foreign Relations. We need a smaller population in order to halt the destruction of our environment and to create an economy that will be sustainable over the very long term. We are trying to address our steadily worsening environmental problems without coming to grips with their root cause, overpopulation. All efforts to save our environment will ultimately be futile unless we not only halt U.S. population growth, but reverse it so that our population can eventually be stabilized at a sustainable level, far lower than it is today. According to the ad by NGP, the population level being sought by the globalists was described as a U.S. population in the range of 125 to 150 million, or about its size in the 1940s. According to U.S. Census statistics in mid-2009, the population stood at 307,229,513. Thus, more than half the current population needs to disappear to reach the level envisioned by the globalists. Such globalist thinking continues today. On May 5, 2009, some of America's leading billionaires met in a private Manhattan home just a week before the annual meeting of the secretive Bilderbergers in Greece. Calling themselves the Good Club, attendees included Bill Gates, David Rockefeller Jr., Warren Buffett, George Soros, New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Ted Turner, and Oprah Winfrey. According to John Harlow of the Sunday Times, the group agreed with Gates that human overpopulation was a priority concern. Another guest said that there was nothing as crude as a vote, but a consensus emerged that they would back a strategy in which population growth would be tackled as a potentially disastrous 
environmental, social, and industrial threat, wrote Harlow. So to achieve the globalists' dream of a U.S. population of no more than 150 million, the current population would have to be halved. What's to happen to more than 150 million Americans? Apparently those with great wealth and power have decided to take overpopulation into their own hands. And these individuals were connected to the same families and corporations that funded communism in Russia and then National Socialism in pre-war Germany. Today with AIDS, mad cow disease, chronic fatigue, and the rest, history is apparently repeating, noted Dr. Len Horowitz. In fact, even the message is the same. The millions of Holocaust victims were told they were going into showers for public health and disinfection. That's why we are being told to get vaccinated. Virtually nothing has changed, not even the message. As an indication that nothing has substantially changed in the ruling hierarchy of the globalists, on February 8, 2009, President Barack Obama's National Security Advisor, General James L. Jones, opened a speech to the 45th Munich Conference on Security Policy in Germany by admitting that he takes his daily orders from Dr. Kissinger filtered down through General Brent Scowcroft and Sandy Berger. Donald and William Scott believed a high-level agenda to reduce the population went above Henry Kissinger. The Washington corner of the Brucellosis Triangle, with its military, NIH, Treasury, and Justice Department components, have had their ties to and have largely taken their directions from the New York corner dominated by the Rockefeller interests. And the Rockefeller interests through the agency of the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, the Rockefeller Institute and University, the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Chase Manhattan Bank have constituted a vast machine of power and baleful influence whose parts have meshed together in an effort to maintain that power. Dead Microbiologists One reason why more doctors don't want to look more closely at the mycoplasma pandemic may be that work in the field of microbiology appears to be hazardous to one's health. By mid-2009, nearly 100 scientists around the world had died, many under suspicious circumstances. Most of them were microbiologists. Researcher Mark J. Harper compiled a list of scientists in some way connected to the study of viruses or vaccines. While some of these deaths may be purely coincidental and seem to pose no connection, many of these deaths are highly suspicious and appear not to be random acts of violence. Many are just plain murders, commented Harper. While not everyone on this list died an unnatural death, the sheer number and scope is breathtaking. With this many dead, couldn't this mean that someone, somewhere, wants to get rid of those who see through the conspiracy of fraudulent pandemics and might produce effective antidotes? A full list of these names and dates of death can be found on several Internet websites, including Mark Halper's site, www.pupstheories.com That's pups, P-U-P-P-S, theories, one word. Dr. Reif's Discovery Insidiousness of control has become so pervasive that a remarkable scientist was professionally discredited and ruined for claiming to discover a cure for dangerous diseases. Today, Dr. Royal Raymond Reif's suppressed technology is making a worldwide comeback despite the opposition of the medical establishment. In the 1930s, Reif demonstrated the ability of specific radio wave frequencies to disrupt viral and bacterial cells. Every biochemical compound, including single-cell organisms, oscillate with a unique frequency vibration. Because germs are carbon-based life forms, they are susceptible to disruption by radio frequencies. When the amplitude or resonance of the frequency is intensified, the cell can be shattered and destroyed. 
by increasing the intensity of a frequency. Rife increased the natural oscillations of one-celled bacteria and viruses until they distorted and disintegrated from structural stresses. A crude analogy to this effect is a glass shattering when a singer sounds a high note. Rife's work with pathogens began as a result of his invention of the universal prismatic microscope, which was more effective in studying organisms than electron microscopes because those devices killed specimens by bombarding them with radiant energy. Using specially ground quartz prisms in an elongated microscope tube, Reif not only was able to view live specimens, but also his view was amplified up to 60,000 times. He became the first human to see and photograph live viruses and to note that they evolved and changed form just as other organisms. A 1944 report from the Smithsonian Institution entitled The New Microscope by Dr. R. E. Seidel, report number 3781, stated, Under the universal microscope, disease organisms, such as those of cancer and other disease, may be observed to succumb when exposed to certain lethal frequencies. This was strong support for claims that Rife's frequency therapy actually worked to destroy diseases. Following decades of research, Rife isolated the frequencies of numerous disease cells, including cancer, and by broadcasting them back to the cells in an intensified form, was able to shatter the original disease cell. This technology does not harm normal healthy cells or tissue. There has not been one documented case of a person harmed by a Rife-type device. In fact, there are narratives of many successes. A special research committee of the University of Southern California confirmed that rife frequencies were reversing many ailments, including cancer. By 1934, rife had isolated a virus that incited cancer cells and stopped it by bombarding it with radio frequencies. He was successful in killing both carcinoma and sarcoma cancers in more than 400 tests on animals and in using his frequencies to cure 16 cancer patients diagnosed as terminal by conventional medicine. Soon enough, the established medical community realized that this device would not only wreck the pharmaceutical industry, but damage medical practices in general. Cures meant fewer visits to the doctor. Opposition immediately came from Dr. Thomas Rivers of the Rockefeller Institute, who had not even seen Rife's equipment in operation. Rivers claimed evolved forms of viruses did not exist. Conflict broke out between those persons who had seen viruses changing into different forms beneath Rife's microscopes and those who had not. Because his microscope did not reveal them, Rivers argued that there was no logical basis for belief in this theory, evolving forms of viruses, explained national radio commentator Jeff Rents. The same argument is used today in evaluating many other alternative medical treatments. If there is no precedent, then it must not be valid. Nothing can convince a closed mind. Most had never actually looked through the San Diego microscopes of Rife. Air travel in the 1930s was uncomfortable, primitive, and rather risky. So, the debate about the life cycle of viruses was resolved in favor of those who never saw it. Even modern electron microscopes show frozen images, not the life cycle of viruses in process. Overworked and underfunded, Rife and his associates were easy targets for attack. The health authorities made false claims against him, altered his test procedures so that his demonstrations would fail, and made impossible demands on him. In 1934, Rife declined an offer to partner with Morris Fishbein, then head of the American Medical Association. We may never know the exact terms of this offer, but we do know the terms of the offer Fishbein made to Harry Hoxie for control of his herbal cancer remedy, reported Rents. Fishbein's associates would receive all profits for nine years, and Hoxie would receive nothing. Then, if they were satisfied that it worked, Hoxie would begin to receive 10% of the profits, Hoxie decided that he would rather continue to make all the profits himself. When Hoxie turned Fishbein down, 
Fishbein used his immensely powerful political connections to have Hoxie arrested 125 times in a period of 16 months. The charges, based on practicing medicine without a license, were always thrown out of court. But the harassment drove Hoxie insane. Reif's troubles turned more serious. His lab was ransacked on several occasions, but no suspect was ever caught. He was also harassed by health officials. Baseless and costly lawsuits were brought against him, resulting in his bankruptcy. The suits, some filed by persons with connections to pharmaceutical corporations, ultimately failed. The USC's Special Research Committee was disbanded. Reif was marginalized, and his device today is available only as a costly research instrument employed by a few doctors and private citizens. Reif died a broken man in 1971. Although Reif's work has been confirmed by scientists and researchers outside the United States, the conventional medical community still ignores the benefits of this technology and continues to prosecute those who do. Those Americans who have confirmed or endorsed various areas of Reif's work include Dr. Edward C. Rose now Sr., former chief of bacteriology at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Arthur I. Kendall of Northwestern Medical School, Dr. George Dock of the Los Angeles County Medical Association Library, Dr. Alvin Ford, Professor of Pathology at the University of Southern California, Rufus Kleinschmidt, President of USC, Dr. Milbank Johnson, Director of the Southern California AMA, Waylon Morrison, Chief Surgeon for the Santa Fe Railway, Dr. George Fisher of Children's Hospital, New York, Carl Meyer with the Hooper Foundation, and many others. Barry Lines, a California investigative reporter, learned of the Rife story through John Crane, who had worked at Rife's side from 1950 until Rife's death in 1971. Initially skeptical of the claims of the healing benefits of Rife technology, after studying the documentation held by Crane, Lines became outraged by the injustices that had wrecked Rife's life's work. Lines' 1987 book on Rife and his work entitled The Cancer Cure That Worked, Fifty Years of Suppression, became an underground favorite and sparked renewed interest in Reif's work. Starting in 1995, San Diego manufacturer James Folsom marketed and distributed Reif-type devices when he took over the Royal Reif Research Society. He claimed to have hundreds of testimonials that his devices improved physical symptoms and in many cases led to remission in cancer. According to Folsom, he had no dissatisfied customers. Folsom was raided by the FDA in 2003 during Operation Cure-All, a campaign that targeted various companies in the alternative health market. Although Folsom's equipment was confiscated, Folsom heard no more about it for years. But then, in October 2007, just days before his vulnerability would have ended under a statute of limitations, Folsom was arrested and charged with several felonies, including selling a Class III medical instrument without a license. Folsom argued he did not need a license because his equipment was a Class I biofeedback device. These devices were exempt and had been used for more than 70 years with no known harm or side effects. Regardless, the FDA claimed these biofeedback devices were under its jurisdiction over medical devices under a 1976 law. That law allowed for the prosecution of selling high-voltage medical devices. However, it should be noted that Folsom's machine at that time could be powered by a 9-volt battery. Despite being offered a plea bargain that would allow him to plead guilty to a misdemeanor and make him pay a $250 fine and suffer one year of unsupervised probation, Folsom decided to go to trial. According to U.S. Attorney Karen Hewitt, Folsom's business generated more than $8 million in revenue over its years in operation. Assistant U.S. Attorney Melanie Pearson said the case was the largest involving illegal medical devices that she had seen in 20 years working as a prosecutor in San Diego County. The trial was held in U.S. District Court, where no discussion of the effectiveness of Rife's technology was allowed. Originally, Folsom wanted to produce stacks of testimonials from satisfied customers but Melanie Pearson objected. 
Folsom then tried to assert that for more than 70 years, no harmful effects had been documented from the devices. This, too, was not allowed. Folsom then tried to argue that none of his customers had been dissatisfied, but to no effect. Aside from prosecutors and government officials, the only witnesses at the trial were 24 of Folsom's friends and fellow device distributors. They unanimously testified to Folsom's good character and clean business practices. Incredibly, the prosecution used this testimony against Folsom, claiming that, in fact, Folsom was such a brilliant fraud that even his peers and customers weren't aware they'd been defrauded. Prosecutors claimed Folsom used the false name Jim Anderson to avoid being caught by the FDA, and that he gave buyers the false impression that the FDA had approved the devices for investigational purposes. Folsom admitted he had used the name as a salesman at a different company, but had used his real name on all official government correspondence. In February 2009, a U.S. federal jury in San Diego convicted Folsom of 26 felony counts for selling Rife devices under the name of Naturetronics, Astropulse, BioSolutions, Energy Wellness, and Global Wellness. Folsom, 68, faced more than 140 years in prison, literally a life sentence at his age, and $500,000 in fines is being held in the federal government's Western Region Detention Facility in San Diego, now managed by the private firm Geo Group Incorporated. A few weeks after Folsom's trial and conviction, the FDA issued a news release announcing that manufacturers of 25 types of medical devices marketed prior to 1976 must submit safety and effectiveness information to the agency so that it may evaluate the risk level for each device type. Supporters of Folsom said the FDA's decision to scrutinize such pre-existing technology was most likely the result of his trial. One Folsom supporter stated, Jim stood on his principles for his innocence and to clear the rife name. It was an impossible task. Jim was up against an endless supply of money through the FDA and an unjust system. Research has found since Jim's conviction that our judicial system is more of a money machine than Big Pharma and the medical industrial complex. Observers saw Folsom's conviction as a blow against those supporting Rife technology. They also predicted that those interested in the technology would have to go to foreign websites, such as www.rife.de. Rife is spelled R-I-F-E, a site in Germany where the sales and use of Rife-type devices are legal. With the FDA seeking to require prescriptions for everyday vitamins and suppressing potentially useful medical technologies like Rife's, not to mention the new government-controlled National Health Care Plan, it would appear as though there is a conscious effort to prevent the public from acquiring healthful alternatives to chemical drugs. But why would the government harm us with untested vaccines and the suppression of potentially healthful therapies? Wouldn't such actions also adversely affect the health of the global elite? Some researchers believe the answers may be that the inner core globalists already utilize such technology or something even more advanced. Is it possible they can cure themselves of the same illnesses they allow to be inflicted on others? The globalist elites may not be worried that their eugenics plans will touch their families, they may believe they can protect their own DNA with race-specific pathogens. If they should contract some dire affliction, might they easily eliminate it with just a few short hours of frequency technology or advanced antidotes for immunization? Therapies cloaked from the general population. The possibility of holding such publicly denied therapies that might end disease and halt or regress the aging process would prove a most effective enticement in the recruitment of minions to aid in the advancement of their globalist agendas. Drugging the Population There will be, in the next generation or so, a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorship without tears, so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies. 
so that people will in fact have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it, because they will be distracted from any desire to rebel by propaganda or brainwashing, or brainwashing enhanced by pharmacological methods. And this seems to be the final revolution. Aldous Huxley, 1961 Big Farm Drugs are big business. Only five biopharmaceutical companies, Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Medimmune, the Australian firm CSL, and Sanofi Pasteur, have been awarded massive contracts by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, to develop and produce more than 195 million doses of swine flu vaccine. This is in addition to the seasonal flu vaccine. According to Dr. Joseph Mercola, an osteopathic physician and author of 16 books on health and alternative medicine, including two New York Times bestsellers, CSL has contracts to supply $180 million worth of bulk antigen to the U.S. Metamune will supply 40 million doses of its live attenuated nasal spray swine flu vaccine for more than $450 million. And Sanofi Pasteur, is providing more than 100 million doses of monovalent swine flu vaccine, a $690 million order. About half of the world's largest pharmaceutical corporations are not American, but rather European. Among the top 10 pharmaceutical companies are the American companies Pfizer, Merck, Johnson & Johnson, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Wyeth, formerly American Home Products. The rest of the top pharmaceutical companies are the British companies GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca, the Swiss companies Novartis and Roche, and the French company Aventis, which in 2004 merged with another French company, Sanofi Synthalabo, putting it in third place. These corporations essentially function alike, but their drug prices in America are much higher than in other nations' markets. For example, a bottle of 1,000 aspirin costs less in Mexico than a bottle of 500 across the border in the United States. And obviously, no company will sell a product without making a profit. To give some indication of the money involved in the modern drug business, the legal pharmaceutical market totaled $712 billion globally in 2007, of which about $80 billion was for psychiatric drugs. According to several authorities, including Harvard psychiatrist Dr. Peter R. Bregan, Bruce Wiseman, national president of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, geneticist Dr. Thomas Roeder, Dr. Hyla Cass, a former assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA School of Medicine, and David Healy and David B. Menkes, both of the North Wales Department of Psychological Medicine, Psychiatric drugs may be the culprit behind many homicides, suicides, and school shootings. Even worse, the $80 billion doesn't even include the illegal drug market. A former editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Marcia Angel, wrote in the New York Review of Books, The combined profits for the ten drug companies in the Fortune 500, $35.9 billion, were more than the profits for all the other 490 businesses put together, $33.7 billion. Over the past two decades, the pharmaceutical industry has moved very far from its original high purpose of discovering and producing useful new drugs. Now, primarily a marketing machine to sell drugs of dubious benefit, this industry uses its wealth and power to co-opt every institution that might stand in its way, including the U.S. Congress, the FDA, academic medical centers, and the medical profession itself. In her 2004 book, The Truth About the Drug Companies, How They Deceive Us and What to Do About It, Dr. Angel argues that the current power of the pharmaceutical industry can be directly traced to the industry's phenomenal growth during the Reagan years with George H.W. Bush and his globalist supporters in command, 
following Reagan's wounding during an assassination attempt in March 1981. The watershed year was 1980, she noted. Before then, it was a good business, but afterward, it was a stupendous one. From 1960 to 1980, prescription drug sales were fairly static as a percent of U.S. gross domestic product, but from 1980 to 2000, they tripled. Now they stand at more than $200 billion a year. Of the many events that contributed to the industry's great and good fortune, none had to do with the quality of the drugs the companies were selling. The success of Big Farm has more to do with marketing than with the effectiveness of its drugs. Dr. Michael Wilkes, a professor of medicine and vice dean for medical education at the University of California, Davis, joined other critics in describing a recent phenomenon called disease-mongering, an activity in which large drug corporations attempt to convince healthy people they are sick and need drugs in order to boost sales. Most pharmaceutical companies devote huge amounts of money to prevent, control, and cure diseases, he added. When their profits don't match corporate expectations, they invent new diseases to be cured by existing drugs. Countless examples of disease-mongering are driven by the pharmaceutical industry's drive to sell drugs, wrote Dr. Wilkes. Conditions such as female sexual dysfunction syndrome, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, toenail fungus, baldness and social anxiety disorder, a.k.a. shyness, are a few places where the medical community has stepped in, thereby turning normal or mild conditions into diseases for which medication is the treatment. Ironically, though Big Farm invents new diseases, they rarely invent a new drug. Surprisingly, most new and important drugs brought to market in recent years were based on taxpayer-funded research at universities, small biotechnology companies, or the National Institutes of Health, NIH. In fact, most supposedly new drugs are merely a variation of older drugs. If I'm a manufacturer and I can change one molecule and get another 20 years of patent rights and convince physicians to prescribe and consumers to demand the next form of Prilosec or weekly Prozac instead of daily Prozac just as my patent expires, then why would I be spending money on a lot less certain endeavor? which is looking for brand new drugs, asked Dr. Sharon Levine, Associate Executive Director of the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group. What's true of the 800-pound gorilla is true of the colossus that is the pharmaceutical industry. It is used to doing pretty much what it wants to do, wrote Dr. Marsha Angel. The most important of these laws that relax restrictions on pharmaceutical corporations is known as the Buy dole Act, after its chief sponsors, Senator Birch Bayh, Democrat, Indiana, and Senator Robert Dole, Republican, Kansas. Bayh Dole enabled universities and small businesses to patent discoveries emanating from research sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, the major distributors of tax dollars for medical research, and then to grant exclusive licenses to drug companies. Until then, taxpayer-financed discoveries were in the public domain, available to any company that wanted to use them. But now, universities, where most NIH-sponsored work is carried out, can patent and license their discoveries and charge royalties. Similar legislation permitted the NIH itself to enter into deals with drug companies that would directly transfer NIH discoveries to the industry. Thus, when a patent held by a university or small biotech company is eventually licensed, to a big drug company. All parties cash in on the public investment in research. Under this system, research paid for by public money became a commodity to be sold for profit by privately owned companies. Dr. Angel provides examples of the large consulting fees paid by pharmaceutical corporations to individual faculty members and to NIH scientists and directors. These fees allow for globalist pharmaceutical corporations to further intrude into the nation's medical education. The lucrative connection between Big Farm and medical schools and hospitals has brought about a definite corporate-friendly atmosphere. One of the results has been a growing pro-industry bias in medical research in both schools and hospitals, 
exactly where such bias doesn't belong, stated Dr. Angel. She noted that the huge amounts of money flowing from Big Farm began to change the ethos of medical schools and teaching hospitals. Such non-profit institutions began to view themselves as partners of industry. Faculty researchers were encouraged to obtain patents on their work, which were then assigned to their universities. The schools then sold the right to Big Farm and shared in royalties. Many medical schools and teaching hospitals even created technology transfer offices to capitalize on faculty discoveries. Dr. Angel noted the excessive salaries for pharmaceutical executives. Take, for instance, the whopping $74,890,918 salary paid to Charles Heimbold, Jr. in 2001, the former chairman and CEO of Bristol-Myers Squibb. This does not count his $76,095,611 worth of unexercised stock options. At the same time, the chairman of Wyeth made $40,521,011 in 2001, not counting his $40,629,459 in stock options. DTC Ads Selling is the name of the game. Drug advertising is now ubiquitous in all major media outlets. Despite spending 7.1% less on direct-to-consumer or DTC drug advertising in the third quarter of fiscal 2008, a Nielsen Media Research report showed that pharmaceutical firms still spent about $4.8 billion on DTC advertising for television, radio, and print ads in magazines and newspapers. Here's how the top few drugs worked out in sales per advertising dollar spent. The cholesterol drug Lipitor earned $34.09 for each ad dollar spent. The asthma drug Advair Discus earned $27.98 per ad dollar. The heartburn remedy Nexium earned $44.92 per ad dollar. The allergy drug Singulaire earned $45.24 per ad dollar. The allergy medication Zyrtec, now available without prescription, earned $33.86 per ad dollar. DTC advertising more than tripled between 1997 and 2005, growing from $1.3 billion to $4.2 billion since the U.S. Food and Drug Administration eased restrictions governing these types of drug ads. It has been estimated that $8 billion of the $235 billion spent by consumers on prescription drugs in 2008 came from DTC advertising. And the 2008 decline in DTC advertising, a first in recent U.S. history, was offset by launch campaigns on drugs such as Cialis, Abilify, Nasonex, and Plavix. While TV ads show visuals of happy people, idyllic countrysides, laughing children, and playful pets, a droning audio voice rapidly skips through possible side effects. The pain medication Viox was heavily advertised by its maker, but later recalled when it was shown the drug increased the risk of heart attack in some people. The fact that it was so heavily marketed magnified its ultimate damage, said Michael Russo, a health care proponent for the public advocacy group California Public Interest Research Group, or CalPERG. Perhaps Big Farm cares more for promoting their drugs than developing something better and safer. Published estimates predict that whereas the drug industry spent about $57.5 billion on U.S. marketing in 2004, it spent only $31.5 billion on research and development. Percentage-wise, of the $235.4 billion in U.S. sales in 2004, promotion consumed 24.4% of sales dollars, while R&D only took 13.4%. Although some academic studies suggest that DTC advertising can help people who need to start taking drugs and others to remain compliant with existing treatment regimens, the lack of fair balance in many DTC ads that promote drug benefits and downplay risks is what is driving legislation to curb its use.
stated a comment posted on biojobblog.com, a website dedicated to bio-industry employment. Interestingly, about 10 years ago, a friend who works for a major pharmaceutical company told me that she always waits five years before using a new approved drug. At the time, I thought it was an odd thing for her to say since she had been in the business for over 15 years. However, over the past five years or so, several high-profile drugs that were heavily promoted by DTC advertising had to be withdrawn from the market. To that end, while DTC advertising may be great for business, it may not always be in the best interest of American consumers who use prescriptions. The site also noted that DTC advertising is allowed in only two countries, New Zealand and the United States. The ever-increasing predominance of DTC drug advertising has prompted several members of Congress to introduce legislation to curtail the ads. Legislators were disgusted with tax deductions for drug marketers using DTC advertising and commercials offering products that gave four-hour erections during primetime television hours. Not only did drug advertising trouble the public, but so did the disproportion of actual drug costs to retail sale price. In 2003, the website thepeoplesvoice.org posted this chart of the actual price of active ingredients used in some of the most popular drugs sold in America. This chart shows four columns labeled brand name, consumer price per 100, costs of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules, and the percent markup. Brand name, Celebrex, 100 milligrams, consumer price per 100, $130.27. Cost of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules, 60 cents. Percent markup, 21,712%. Brand name Claritin, 10 milligrams, $215.17, consumer price per 100. 71 cents, cost of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules. 30,306% markup. Keflex, 250 milligrams. $157.39 consumer price per 100. $1.88 cost of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules. 8,372% markup. Lipitor, 20 milligrams. $272.37 consumer price per 100. $5.80 cost of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules. 4,696% markup. Norvask, 10 milligrams, $188.29 consumer price, 14 cents cost of general active ingredients, 134,493% markup. Paxil, 20 milligrams, $220.27, $7.60, 2,898%. Prevacid 3C3, 30 milligrams, $44.77, $1.01, 34,136%. Prilosec 20 milligrams, $360.97, 52 cents, 69,417% markup. Prozac 20 milligrams, $247.47 consumer price, 11 cents cost of general active ingredients, 224,973% markup. To Norman, 50 milligrams, $104.47 consumer price, 13 cents general cost of active ingredients, 80,362% markup. Vasotech, 10 milligrams, $102.37, 20 cents, 51,185%. Xanax, 1 milligram, $136.79 consumer price, 2.4 cents cost of general active ingredients, 569,958% markup. Zestril, 20 milligrams, $89.89, $3.20 cost of general active ingredients. 
2,809% markup. Zithromax, 600 milligrams, $1,482.19 consumer price, $18.78 cost of general active ingredients, 7,892% markup. Zocor, 40 milligrams, $350.27, $8.63, markup. Zoloft, 50 milligrams, $206.87 consumer price per 100, $1.75 cost of general active ingredients per 100 tablets or capsules, 11,821% markup. Fortunately, the government has acted in response to the growing public awareness of Big Farm malfeasance. In September 2009, Pfizer Incorporated, the world's largest drug manufacturer, was ordered to pay a record $2.3 billion civil and criminal penalty after the government found the firm guilty of unlawful prescription drug promotions. Prosecutors charged the company with promoting four prescription drugs, including the painkiller Bextra, taken off the market in 2005, after studies indicated that the drugs increased the chances of heart attack and had been used as a treatment for medical conditions different from those for which federal regulators had approved. A spokesman for the Justice Department said the fine, which included both criminal and civil penalties, was the largest criminal fine in U.S. history. Authorities noted that this was the fourth settlement involving false and misleading advertising claims in the past ten years. They called Pfizer a repeat offender, and said the company's conduct would be monitored for the next five years. Previously, Pfizer was accused of inviting doctors to all expense-paid meetings at resorts as consultants. U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts Mike Lauks said, They were entertained with golf, massages, and other luxuries. He added that Pfizer continued to violate the same laws with other drugs, even while negotiating the Bextra settlement with Justice Department attorneys. New York Attorney General Andrew Cuomo told the media, Pfizer ripped off New Yorkers and taxpayers across the country to pad its bottom line. Pfizer's corrupt practices went so far as sending physicians on exotic junkets, as well as whining and dining healthcare professionals, to persuade them to prescribe the company's drugs for patients in taxpayer-funded programs. Another big farm giant's consolidation efforts point to high-level connections with both the globalists and the Nazis. GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, the second largest pharmaceutical company in the world after Pfizer, was founded in London in 1880 by two American pharmacists, Henry Wellcome and Silas Burroughs, as Burroughs, Wellcome and Company. Glaxo Laboratories, originally a baby food manufacturer, went multinational in 1935. After the post-war acquisition of other companies, including Meyer Laboratories, Glaxo merged with Burroughs Welcome in 1995. The new name of the company was Glaxo Welcome. In 2000, after merging with Smith Klein Beckham, the firm became Glaxo Smith Klein. The original Burroughs Welcome drug firm was wholly owned by Welcome Trust, whose director was the British Lord Oliver Franks a man described as one of the founders of the post-war world. Franks was ambassador to the United States from 1948 to 1952 and was also a director of the Rockefeller Foundation and its principal representative in England. It was a director of the Kurt von Schroeder Nazi Bank, which at one time handled Hitler's personal bank account. Franks also was a director of the Rhodes Trust, which was used in the late 1800s by the African diamond magnate Cecil Rhodes to create his round table groups, a forerunner of the Council on Foreign Relations. As a Rhodes director, Franks was in charge of approving Rhodes scholarships, such as the one awarded Bill Clinton in 1968. According to former intelligence officer Dr. John Coleman, members of Rhodes round tables armed with immense wealth gained from control of gold, diamonds, and drugs, fanned out over the world to take control of fiscal and monetary policies and political leadership in all countries where they operated. 
This conspiratorial network was confirmed by President Clinton's academic mentor, the Georgetown University historian Carol Quigley, who wrote, There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or most of its aims and have, for much of my life, been close to it and many of its instruments. In general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. While Franks is known as director of the trust that owned a large drug company, most people do not know the extent of the Rockefeller's influence over modern medicine and drugs. According to Eustace Mullins, the drug industry is controlled by a Rockefeller medical monopoly, largely through directors on pharmaceutical boards representing Rockefeller entities. The American College of Surgeons maintained a monopolistic control of hospitals through the powerful Hospital Survey Committee, with members Winthrop Aldrich and David McAlpin Pyle representing the Rockefeller control. Winthrop Aldrich, whose sister was married to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., served as president and board chairman of Chase National Bank from 1930 to 1953. He also served on the Committee of the Cost of Medical Care, CCMC, which was started by Dr. Alexander Lambert, the personal physician to Teddy Roosevelt and a president of the AMA beginning in 1910. According to Dr. Charles C. Smith, a physician who researched the activities of the committee and published a report in 1984, he, Dr. Lambert, obviously was to be the needed figurehead. The full-time staff was headed by Harry H. Moore of Washington, who in 1927 published American Medicine and the People's Health, while a member of Public Health Service. His main tenets were the need for a system to distribute medical care and an insurance plan to pay for it. So early in the 20th century, administrators and economists were deciding the future of America's health care. Moore was aided by C. Rufus Roram, who received a Ph.D. in economics at the University of Chicago which was founded and funded by Rockefeller. Roram, according to Smith, was more concerned about hospital prepayment than in health care. Following his work for the CCMC, Roram went on to become executive director of the Blue Cross Plan Commission between 1936 and 1946. I think the most important principle spawned by this committee was not at all what was planned wrote Dr. Charles C. Smith, Jr., who authored a medical history study paper on the committee. A minority on the committee fruitlessly recommended that government competition in the medical practice be discontinued. They also argued in opposition to corporate medicine being financed through intermediary agencies, such as health maintenance organizations, or HMOs. Allegedly, these types of organizations exploit the medical professions, and failed to provide high-quality health care. The tenor of the CCMC report was such that one can read into it the seeds of everything that led to the health care system we have today. So at least we find ourselves, as always, in a health care crisis, Dr. Smith wrote in 1984. This health care crisis continues today. Rockefeller's General Education Board has spent more than $100 million to gain control of the nation's medical schools and turn our physicians to physicians of the allopathic school, dedicated to surgery and the heavy use of drugs, wrote author Mullins, who spent more than 30 years researching the Rockefeller medical monopoly. Recalling how John D. Rockefeller Sr.'s father, William Big Bill Rockefeller once tried to sell unrefined petroleum as a cancer cure, Mullins wrote. This carnival medicine show Barker would hardly have envisioned that his descendants would control the greatest and most profitable medical monopoly in recorded history. Mullins reported that the German chemical company IG Farben and its subsidiaries in the United States, through the Rockefeller interests, 
such as the cartel between Rockefeller's U.S.-based Standard Oil Company and I.G. Farben, as revealed in a 1941 investigation by the government, were responsible for trying to build a monopoly by suppressing discoveries of its own drugs. From 1908 to 1936, I.G. Farben withheld its discovery of sulfanilamide, an early sulfa drug, until the firm had signed working agreements with the important drug firms of Switzerland, Sandoz and Sibagaygi. After years of a working relationship, these two firms were finally joined in 1996 to form one of the largest corporate mergers in history, Novartis. During the first half of the 20th century, the Nazi drug cartel IG Farben, along with the drug companies controlled through Rockefeller interests, dominated the development, production, and distribution of numerous drugs, including substances that are downright dangerous. Aspartame Americans aren't just being affected by chemicals in pharmaceutically produced drugs. One of the many controversial chemicals now being used by millions of Americans is aspartame, an additive sugar substitute found in most diet soft drinks and more than 5,000 foods, drugs, medicines, and most sugar substitutes such as NutraSweet, Equal, Metamucil, and Candorel. When heated to more than 86 degrees Fahrenheit, aspartame releases free methanol, which breaks down into formic acid and formaldehyde in the body. Keep in mind the human body temperature is 98.6 degrees and that formaldehyde is a deadly neurotoxin. The remaining formaldehyde from free methanol then breaks down into formic acid, the venom of ant stings. In 1987, Dr. Louis J. Elsis, a professor of pediatrics and director of the Division of Medical Genetics at Emory University, testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources about phenylalanine, one of the two amino acids in aspartame. He said, In the developing fetus, such a rise in maternal blood phenylalanine could be magnified four to sixfold by the concentrative efforts of the placental and fetal blood-brain barrier, and this concentration kills such cells and tissue culture. The effect of such an increased fetal brain concentration in vivo would probably be much more subtle and expressed as mental retardation, microcephaly, or potential certain birth defects. When Dr. Elsis told the senators about phenylalanine in 1987, Infant autism rates were 1 in 1,500. Today, they are 1 in 150 and rising. It would appear that certain drugs are wrecking our newborn children. Dr. Madeline Price, a professor of neurobiology at Washington University, said, Aspartic acid, aspartate, has been known to be a neurotoxin for 30 years, now 40 years. Rodents that have ingested too much aspartame as infants are stunted as adults, obese, and have sexual and reproductive dysfunctions. Until the Reagan administration, the Food and Drug Administration had refused to approve the use of aspartame. The FDA's own toxicologist, Dr. Adrian Gross, told Congress that aspartame could contribute to or even cause seizures, brain tumors, and brain cancer, and violated the Delaney Clause which forbids putting anything in food that is known to cause cancer. And if the FDA violates its own laws, who is left to protect the public, he asked. Dr. H. J. Roberts, with the Palm Beach Institute for Medical Research, devoted an entire chapter of his book, Aspartame Disease, an Ignored Epidemic, to aspartame interaction with drugs such as Coumadin, Dilantin, antidepressants, and other psychotropic agents, as well as Inderol, Aldamet, hormones, and insulin. Robert said aspartame interacts with all cardiac medication and even noted drug reactions after a person stopped using aspartame products. The issue of sudden death related to aspartame and its breakdown products has been raised a number of times, particularly among previously well individuals using such products, including pilots and drivers and athletes. He added, 
The need for clinicians and corporate neutral investigators to evaluate the contributory role of aspartame in cardiopulmonary disorders and sudden death and drug interactions with aspartame is underscored by the frequency of persons dying unexpectedly being categorized as death due to causes yet to be determined. Dr. Betty Martini, a 22-year veteran in the medical field and founder of Mission Possible International, has worked with doctors around the world to remove aspartame from food, drinks, and medicine. She recounted how pharmaceutical interests subordinated public welfare. Donald Rumsfeld was CEO of Searle, that conglomerate that manufactured aspartame. For 16 years, the FDA refused to approve it, not only because it's not safe, but because they wanted the company indicted for fraud. Both U.S. prosecutors for the FDA hired on with the defense team, and the statute of limitations expired. They were Sam Skinner and William Conlon. Skinner went on to become Secretary of Transportation, squelching the cries of the pilots who were now having seizures on this seizure-triggering drug, aspartame, and then Chief of Staff under President Bush's father. Some of these people reach high places. Even Supreme Justice Clarence Thomas is a former Monsanto attorney. Monsanto bought Searle in 1985 and sold it a few years ago. Yet even with friends in high places, the FDA still refused to allow NutraSweet on the market. Termed a deadly neurotoxic drug masquerading as an additive by opponents, aspartame interacts with antidepressants and also interacts with vaccines and other toxins and unsafe sweeteners like Splenda. Both being excitotoxins, the aspartic acid in aspartame and MSG, the glutamate, People were found using aspartame as the placebo for MSG studies even before it was approved. The FDA has known this for a quarter of a century and done nothing even though it's against the law. Searle went on to build a NutraSweet factory and had $9 million worth of inventory, said Martini. Donald Rumsfeld was on President Reagan's transition team and the day after Reagan took office, Dr. Arthur Hall Hayes, the man who would approve aspartame, was appointed as FDA commissioner. Former Searle salesperson Patty Wood Allett supported the idea that Rumsfeld was behind the approval of aspartame by stating that in 1981, Rumsfeld told company employees he would call in all his markers and that no matter what, he would see to it that aspartame be approved that year. FDA Commissioner Hayes had previously served in the U.S. Army Chemical Weapons Division and initially had approved aspartame only as a powdered additive. But in 1983, just before he left his position for a public relations job with Burson Marsteller, the chief public relations firm for both Monsanto and Searle, Hayes approved aspartame for all carbonated beverages. Since that time, he never spoke publicly about aspartame. Hayes died in February 2010. Rumsfeld is merely one example of the cozy relationship between government and Big Farm. A former CEO of Searle and a member of the Trilateral Commission, a globalist group designed to foster economic cooperation between the United States, Japan, and Europe. Rumsfeld is also a major stockholder in Gilead Sciences, a California biotech firm that owns the rights to Tamiflu. When the population was being threatened with the bird flu in 2005, CNN reported Rumsfeld's Gilead holdings at somewhere between $5 million to $25 million. The incestuous relationship between big farm corporate business and the government makes a mockery of American free enterprise. While it is free to decide which drugs to promote and distribute, it is also free to price them as high as the traffic will bear. Yet Big Farm is dependent on government in the form of patent protection and FDA approval to protect its drug monopoly. In a move bewildering to those who are not aware of the globalist agenda and its control, Congress expressly prohibited Medicare from negotiating lower drug prices through its bulk purchasing power. The excesses of the globalists' pharmaceutical corporations have prompted many Americans to seek price relief by traveling to Canada or Mexico to purchase drugs. Dr. Angel said the pharmaceutical industry has moved very far from its original high purpose of discovering and producing useful new drugs 
and it is now primarily a marketing machine to sell drugs of dubious benefit. Big Farm uses its wealth and power to co-opt every institution that might stand in its way, including the U.S. Congress, the FDA, academic medical centers, and the medical profession itself, as most of its marketing efforts are focused on influencing doctors, since they must write the prescriptions, she said. Don't look for any real relief from either Democrats or Republicans. While campaigning in 2008, both then-Senators Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton pledged to fight the huge pharmaceutical and insurance industries. These promises echoed similar promises made by Mrs. Clinton during her husband's administration. Yet campaign contributions data showed that both Obama and Clinton were the largest recipients of big farm donations in 2008 campaign funding. According to the Center for Responsive Politics, Obama received $1,425,501 from the health service sector and health maintenance organizations, or HMOs, while Clinton came in second with $575,746 in contributions. Trailing both Obama and Clinton were $427,228 for John McCain and $186,700 for Mitt Romney. Only an awakened American public can rein in the power of the globalists' pharmaceutical monopoly, concluded Angel. Drug companies have the largest lobby in Washington, and they give copiously to political campaigns. Legislators are now so beholden to the pharmaceutical industry that it will be exceedingly difficult to break its lock on them. But the one thing legislators need more than campaign contributions is votes. That is why citizens should know what is really going on. Contrary to the industry's public relations, they don't get what they pay for. The fact is that this industry is taking us for a ride, and there will be no real reform without an aroused and determined public to make it happen. Drugging the Kids In years past, if a child was acting up or caught staring out the window, he or she received a rap on the knuckles with a ruler and was told to stay with the rest of the class. Today, the child is sent to the school nurse, who often tells the parents the student has been diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, and advises them to see a psychiatrist who usually recommends the administration of Prozac, 94% sodium fluoride, Ritalin, or Zoloft, psychotropic drugs that have been shown to produce psychoses in lab rats. At least one state has put a stop to this practice. In 2001, the Connecticut House of Representatives voted 141 to 0 on a law prohibiting school personnel from recommending to parents that their children take Ritalin or other mood-altering drugs. One of the bill's primary sponsors, Republican State Representative Lenny Winkler, quoted studies showing the numbers of children taking Ritalin nationally jumped from 500,000 in 1987 to more than 6 million by 2001. The bill also prohibited the State Department of Children and Families from taking children away from parents who declined to put their children on mood-altering drugs. If the fact that unaware parents are being urged to drug their children is bad enough, Consider that the effectiveness of the medication they're being asked to use has come under scrutiny. A 1999 study at the Human Development Center at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire found that 13 ADHD children on medication performed progressively worse over four years on standardized tests than a group of 13 normal children with similar IQs and other characteristics. Another study by Dr. Gretchen Lefevre an assistant professor of pediatrics and psychiatry at Eastern Virginia Medical School, revealed that while children in her community use the drug Ritalin two to three times more than the national rate, their academic performance in relation to their peers showed no improvement. Her persistence in questioning the rising incidence of drug use in school children was muted in 2005 when she was fired. Alan Larson a former secretary of the Oregon Federation of Independent Schools, criticized the expanding diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, ADD, stating, The labeling of children with ADD is not because of a problem the kids have, 
and is because of a problem teachers who cannot tolerate active children have. Other questionable diagnoses include syndromes concerning children who are victims of obesity, junk food, lack of exercise, and inattentive parents. Clearly, some children have serious mental disorders, but these are relatively few compared with the number of currently medicated children. There is also the possibility that some of the diagnoses that doctors give to children are for non-existent diseases. In his 1991 book, Toxic Psychiatry, psychiatrist Peter Bregan wrote, Hyperactivity is the most frequent justification for drugging children. The difficult-to-control male child is certainly not a new phenomenon, but attempts to give him a medical diagnosis are the product of modern psychology and psychiatry. At first, psychiatrists called hyperactivity a brain disease. When no brain disease could be found, they changed it to minimal brain disease, or MBD. When no minimal brain disease could be found, the profession transformed the concept into minimal brain dysfunction. When no minimal brain dysfunction could be demonstrated, the label became attention deficit disorder. Now it's just assumed to be a real disease regardless of the failure to prove it so. Biochemical imbalance is the code word, but there's no more evidence for that than there is for actual brain disease. Textbooks of psychological disorders blossomed in size after programs such as Project Paperclip brought German psychiatrists into the military and intelligence fields after World War II. In its 1952 Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, DSM, the American Psychiatric Association defined only 106 mental disorders. By the publication of DSM-4 in 1994, the number had grown to 374. Meanwhile, the number of child psychologists in U.S. schools grew from a mere 500 in 1940 to more than 22,000 by 1990. In 2006, the number of school psychologists, including clinical and consultation, had grown to 152,000, with an anticipated 176,000 by 2016. The unscientific and political nature of psychiatry was noted in a resignation letter to the APA from Dr. Lauren R. Mosher, former chief of the Center for Studies of Schizophrenia at the National Institute of Mental Health. Why must the APA pretend to know more than it does? DSM-4 is the fabrication upon which psychiatry seeks acceptance by medicine in general. Insiders know it is more a political than scientific document. It is the way to get paid. This growth of an immense and well-funded field of psychiatry is worrisome to those who recall that in both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, the incarcerations and, ultimately, the genocides practiced there all began innocuously as mental health programs. Persons who were considered defective, either physically or mentally, were the first victims of the Nazis, long before they turned to the Jews. Today, though psychiatry may still be suspect among the public, it has won over both government and the media. The profession and its treatments inundate talk shows, magazines, and the front pages of our papers, wrote Bruce Wiseman, the U.S. National President of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and former chairman of the History Department at John F. Kennedy University. Lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD, was initially studied as an antipsychotic and antidepressant, as well as a truth drug by the military. When LSD was outlawed in 1968 for its dangerous side effects, drug companies sought substitutes. They developed the antidepressant Prozac, Fluoxetine, then Zoloft, Sertraline, Effexor, Venlafaxine, and Paxil, Paroxetine. These companies also developed the drug Ritalin. Long after the war, Dr. Helmut Remschmidt proposed a genetic answer to hyperactivity and was a leading proponent of the use of drugs such as Ritalin. Remschmidt was the director of the Society for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and studied under Dr. Hermann Stutt, a man associated with Nazi psychiatrists involved in the German euthanasia program. Remschmidt received his doctorate from Robert Sommer, 
director of the Deutscher Verband für Psychische Hygiene, or the German Association for Mental Hygiene, the institution that in the late 1920s laid the psychiatric groundwork for the idea of mental hygiene. The end result of this attempt at eugenics was the hands-on Nazi sterilization and euthanasia programs that led to the Holocaust. Long after the war, Remschmidt still proposed a genetic answer to hyperactivity and was a leading proponent of the use of drugs such as Ritalin. Could it be that Ritalin is doing more harm than good? A 1986 edition of the International Journal of the Addictions listed 105 adverse reactions to Ritalin, including serious ones such as dangerously high blood pressure, aggressiveness, restlessness, hallucinations, unusual behavior, and suicidal tendencies. Investigative reporter Kelly Patricia O'Meara spent 16 years working as a congressional staffer before writing investigative articles for Insight magazine. Her reports on child vaccines and mood-altering drugs prompted congressional hearings. She wrote, Thirty years ago, the World Health Organization, WHO, concluded that Ritalin was pharmacologically similar to cocaine in the pattern of abuse it fostered and cited it as a Schedule II drug, the most addictive in medical use. The Department of Justice also cited Ritalin as a Schedule II drug under the Controlled Substances Act, and the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, warned that Ritalin substitutes for cocaine and deamphetamine in a number of behavioral paradigms. O'Meara referenced a 2001 study at the Brookhaven National Laboratory that confirmed the similarities between cocaine and Ritalin, but found that Ritalin is more potent than cocaine in its effect on the dopamine system, an area of the brain many doctors believe is most affected by such narcotics. Although Americans wonder why there has been a rash of school shootings and teen suicides in recent years, you take into account that virtually all of these killings have involved a student who was on, or was just coming off, mood-altering drugs. In five cases of school shootings between March 1998 and May 1999, including the tragedy at Columbine High School, the students involved with the shootings were medicated. Though it was downplayed by the media, Sung Hui Cho, the gunman in the Virginia Tech shootings in April 2007, had been undergoing psychological counseling and possessed prescription psychoactive drugs. In his book, Reclaiming Our Children, psychiatrist and drug critic Dr. Peter Bregan argued that Eric Harris's violence at Columbine was caused by the prescription drug Luvox. I also warned that stopping antidepressants can be as dangerous as starting them, since they can cause very disturbing and painful withdrawal reactions, said Dr. Bregan. The claim that drugs are behind school shootings was echoed as far back as a 1999 article in Health and Healing, written by Dr. Julian Whitaker. Virtually all of the gun-related massacres that have made headlines over the past decade have had one thing in common. They were perpetrated by people taking Prozac, Zoloft, Luvox, Paxil, or a related antidepressant drug. A website called TeenScreenTruth.com is dedicated to gathering information off the Internet to help teens connect the dots to see the revealing connections between mood-altering drugs and teen violence. The site compiled a list of violent episodes dating as far back as 1985, when Stephen W. Brownlee, an Atlanta postal worker on psychotropic drugs, killed two co-workers. Despite sealed medical records, the sheer totality of evidence pointing to psychiatric drugs as the culprit behind most school shootings, teen suicides, and other violent behavior is most compelling, if not overwhelming. It would appear from the evidence that German drug science and German psychiatry have provided the foundation for today's schools where children increasingly are being steered to drugs for any complaint, from true antisocial behavior to merely daydreaming. The effort by Big Farm to mold education, physicians, politicians, and even health care in general to its will requires massive amounts of money. 
Such great sums are only available to the globalists, with Nazi roots and well beyond the reach of even well-off Americans, thanks to a crumbling economy and never-before-seen debt. Psychiatry and Eugenics By applying psychological techniques developed by the Germans, Big Farm, the corporate mass media, and even education have been turned into tools for mind control. But before examining how this has occurred, one must first understand the history of psychology and psychiatry. History of Psychiatry Prior to the late 1800s, the mentally ill were treated little better than torture victims, chained to the walls of basements, cages, or dungeons, beaten and subjected to therapies such as bloodletting, partial drowning, and primitive shock treatments. A change to these treatment methods came when, in the 1860s, German medical doctor Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt proposed the idea that man is simply a higher-order animal and that feeling and emotions may be studied and altered scientifically rather than through physical punishment. Wundt's work emphasized the physiological relationship of the brain and the mind. He explored the nature of religious beliefs, denied the human soul, and began to identify mental disorders and abnormal behavior, which led to the creation of the field of psychology. His Lectures on the Mind of Humans and Animals was published in 1863, and a year later, he was promoted to assistant professor of physiology at Heidelberg University. There his work continued, and, with the support of German militarists and aristocrats, he became known as the father of experimental psychology. Wundt, who found studies of the human soul incompatible with scientific empirical investigation, set out to explain what had previously been metaphysical matters in terms of mere animalistic and body chemical reactions. Many believe that Wundt's studies, as well as other European studies of the human mind, were major influences on the Nazi eugenics programs, which ultimately led to some of the greatest horrors of the 20th century. Thus, some of Germany's most learned men provided justification for Nazi euthanasia and extermination programs. Hitler's philosophy and his concept of man in general was shaped to a decisive degree by psychiatry. An influential cluster of psychiatrists and their frightening theories and methods collectively form the missing piece of the puzzle of Hitler, the Third Reich, the atrocities, and their dreadful legacy. It is the overlooked yet utterly central piece of the puzzle, wrote Dr. Thomas Roeder and his co-authors Volker Kubelis and Anthony Burwell in their 1995 book, Psychiatrists, the Men Behind Hitler. Psychology, the scientific study of the human mind, and psychiatry, the study and treatment of mental disorders, go hand in hand and led to a viewpoint that certain people, endowed with better education and presumably understanding, were more competent to judge the behavior of others. As the field of psychiatry grew, so did its definitions, often to the point of absurdity. In 1871, a paper was published entitled Psychical Degeneration of the French People, which purported that simply being French constituted a mental illness. One of psychiatry's leading figures, Richard von Croft Ebing, added to his list of varieties of mental disorders political and reformatory insanity, meaning any inclination to form a different opinion from that of the masses, stated Roeder, Kubelis, and Burwell. At the time of World War I, the attempt to bring respectability to the emerging psychiatric profession resulted in a certain bond that had been created between psychiatry and the aristocratic German government. The German military was particularly interested with the treatment of Fritz Kaufmann's electroshock therapy because it helped minimize war neurosis or shell shock and quickly returned disturbed soldiers to the front. It was more of a disciplinary measure than true medical therapy. After being electrically shocked, most soldiers quickly agreed to return to service. 
psychiatry continued to grow in power even as its agenda continued to widen. Psychiatrist P.J. Mobius, who had lectured on the psychological feeble-mindedness of the woman, pronounced, The psychiatrist should be the judge about mental health because only he knows what ill means. The rush to isolate and cure mental defectives in Nazi Germany quickly was interpreted to include malcontents and dissidents opposed to Hitler's regime. This concept resulted in the Nazi Sterilization Act, which went into effect in July 1933, just six months after Hitler's ascension to power. This law provided for the compulsory sterilization of anyone deemed defective, deficient, or undesirable by the state. One of the leading and articulate authorities behind this act was Dr. Ernst Rudin, a psychiatrist who in 1930 had traveled to Washington, D.C. to present a paper on the importance of eugenics and genetics in mental hygiene. It was well received by many Americans, especially among the globalists, who had come to embrace the racist and elitist views of the German philosophers, such as Georg Hegel, Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, and Rudolf Steiner. Just after Hitler took office in 1933, Rudin, by then director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, supported the law for the prevention of genetically diseased children, the initial step toward the sterilization of those deemed unworthy of life. Rudin continued to be acknowledged as a leader in psychiatry. In 1992, the prestigious Max Planck Institute praised Rudin for following his own convictions in racial hygiene measures, cooperating with the Nazis as a psychiatrist, and helping them legitimize their aims through pertinent legislation. Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather of two U.S. presidents, along with being a member of the Secretive Skull and Bones fraternity, was among those Yale activists promoting the Mental Hygiene Society. This organization evolved into the World Federation of Mental Health, which included the prominent Montague Norman, a former partner of Brown Brothers, governor of the Bank of England, 1920 through 1944, and godfather to Nazi banker Yalmar Schacht's grandson. Norman, himself a mental patient, appointed Brigadier General John Rawlings Rees, the former chief psychiatrist and psychological warfare expert for British intelligence, as the director of the Tavistock Psychiatric Clinic. Dr. John Rawlings Rees, a co-founder of the World Federation for Mental Health, spelled out the Federation's agenda before the annual general meeting of the National Council for Mental Hygiene on June 18, 1940. We can therefore justifiably stress our particular point of view with regard to the proper development of the human psyche, even though our knowledge be incomplete. We must aim to make it permeate every educational activity in our national life. We have made a useful attack upon a number of professions. The two easiest of them, naturally, are the teaching profession and the church. The two most difficult are law and medicine. Public life, politics, and industry should all of them be within our sphere of influence. If we are to infiltrate the professional and social activities of other people, I think we must imitate the totalitarians and organize some kind of fifth-column activity. If better ideas on mental health are to progress and spread, we, as the salesmen, must lose our identity. Let us all, therefore, very secretly, be fifth-columnists. Beverly K. Eekman, an author and a commissioner for the Citizens' Commission on Rights, wrote, Colleagues of Rees, such as Canadian doctors Brock Chisholm and Ewan Cameron, progressive U.S. educators like Edward Thorndike, James Earl Russell, John Dewey, and Benjamin Bloom, and a bevy of foundations, associations, and tax-supported research centers, became Rees's enablers. This cadre of like-minded and self-styled experts first seized upon Russian Ivan Pavlov's classic conditioning, followed that up with German psychologist Kurt Lewin's group dynamics, 
Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria's disorganization of behavior, and the U.S. psychologist B.F. Skinner's deprivation-based operant conditioning, coupled with U.S. social psychologist Elliot Aronson's cognitive dissonance. Together they created Rees's Dream, a controlled psychological environment. Today the Department of Defense, DOD, has a new name for it, Perception Management, or PM, and the psychopharmaceutical industry has hit the jackpot. Perception management to the Department of Defense simply means getting the public to respond as DOD officials wish without their realizing it. Knee-jerk reactions, leaving reason behind, much like subliminal advertising. An early yet clear use of this technique was the name change in 1947 from the War Department to the Defense Department. In so doing, the subject of perception management is thrust unawares into the twisted view of reality. In today's politically correct environment, this unorthodox technique is sold as intellectual and academic freedom, explained Beverly Eekman. Similarly, encounter sessions or therapy groups are predicated on fostering emotional toughness. Facilitators lead participants to accept ideas and deportment they normally would not tolerate. What they actually get is re-education, Soviet style. Schools of behavioral science, such as Esalen Institute and the Western Training Laboratory for Group Development, allude to consensus, group thinking, as being the objective. Encounter groups deliberately heighten peer pressure, isolating holdouts of a viewpoint and intimidating weaker individuals by ridiculing them, cursing at them, yelling at them, and ostracizing them until they cave some even commit suicide. That's why NTL, the National Training Laboratories Institute, for example, carries a disclaimer which the applicant must sign prior to admission, stating, no person concerned about entering a stress situation should participate in NTL programs. A small percentage of participants have experienced stress reactions in varying degrees. There is no means of predicting such reactions or screening out or otherwise identifying those predisposed to such reactions. Now, any thoughtful person upon reading this would realize that the very concept of psychological screening must be a sham. If psychologists are unable to predict or screen out individuals predisposed to become upset by NTL's daunting program, then how do they expect to screen the entire population for mental illness? Yet just such an initiative was funded by Congress in 2002, with copycat bills set for launch in several states. Could our nation's leaders be looking to avert political dissent under the pretext of preventing emotional diseases? Wouldn't be the first time. Eugenics The perception management activities of twisting semantics and promoting groupthink were psychological methods employed by the German Nazis that resulted in the deaths of millions of innocents as a matter of state policy a holocaust in anyone's book. Although most Americans are aware of the horrors inflicted by Hitler's Nazis on Europe's citizens in pursuit of their creating a master race, and many see eugenics as a racist pseudoscience seeking to eliminate anyone whom a self-proclaimed elite views as undesirable, few realize that the theological and scientific basis for the Nazis' beliefs originated in the United States, particularly in California, long before the Nazis came to power in Germany. In the late 19th century, the United States had joined 14 other nations in passing various types of eugenics legislation. Thirty states had laws providing for the sterilization of mental patients and imbeciles. At least 60,000 such defectives were legally sterilized. In 1925, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, writing for the majority in a Supreme Court case, stated, It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Sir Francis Galton, English psychologist and father of the eugenics movement, defined eugenics as 
The science of improving the stock to give more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable. In order to determine who was dirtying the gene pool requires extensive comprehensive statistics on the population. So in 1910, the Eugenics Records Office was established as a branch of the Galton National Laboratory in London, endowed by Mrs. E. H. Harriman, wife of the U.S. railroad magnate Edward Harriman and mother of diplomat and early-day globalist Averill Harriman. After 1900, the Harrimans, the family that gave Prescott Bush's family their start, along with the Rockefellers, provided more than $11 million to create the privately owned Eugenics Records Office of Charles B. Davenport at Cold Springs Harbor, New York, as well as eugenics studies at Harvard, Columbia, and Cornell. The first International Congress of Eugenics was convened in London in 1912, with Winston Churchill as a director. Clearly, the concept of bloodlines was as significant to the British and American elite as it was to Hitler and the Nazis. In 1932, when the Congress met in New York, it was the Hamburg America Shipping Line, controlled by Harriman Associates George Walker and Prescott Bush, that brought prominent Germans to the meeting. In attendance was Dr. Ernst Rudin, aforementioned authority behind the Nazi Sterilization Act, and member of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Genealogy and Demography in Berlin. Rudin was unanimously elected president of the International Federation of Eugenics Societies for his work in founding the Deutschen Gesellschaft für Rassenhygiene, or the German Society for Racial Hygiene, a forerunner of Hitler's racial institutes. But as stated previously, the groundworks for eugenics was laid in the United States. California was considered the epicenter of the American eugenics movement, according to Edwin Black, author of War Against the Weak, Eugenics and America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. During the 20th century's first decades, California's eugenicists included potent but little-known race scientists, such as Army venereal disease specialist Dr. Paul Popineau, citrus magnate and polytechnic benefactor Paul Gosney, Sacramento banker Charles M. Goeth, as well as members of the California State Board of Charities and Corrections and the University of California Board of Regents, wrote Black. Black said that within the first 25 years of eugenics legislation, California sterilized 9,782 individuals, mostly women, many of whom were classified as bad girls or diagnosed as passionate, oversexed, or sexually wayward. Some women were sterilized because of what was deemed an abnormally large clitoris or labia. In 1933 alone, Black found at least 1,278 compulsory sterilizations were performed, 700 of which were on women. He said California's two leading sterilization mills in 1933 were Sonoma State Home with 388 operations and Patton State Hospital with 363 operations. Other sterilizations were also performed in centers at Agnews, Mendocino, Napa, Norwalk, Stockton, and Pacific Colony. Black noted, Eugenics would have been so much bizarre parlor talk had it not been for extensive financing by corporate philanthropies, specifically the Carnegie Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Harriman Railroad Fortune. They were all in league with some of America's most respected scientists, hailing from such prestigious universities as Stanford, Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. These academicians espoused race theory and race science, and then faked and twisted data to serve eugenics racist aims. He described how the Rockefeller Foundation helped create the German eugenics movement and even funded the program that the infamous Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele worked in before he became the Angel of Death at Auschwitz. The grand plan was to literally wipe away the reproductive capability of those deemed weak and inferior, the so-called unfit, said Black. The eugenicists hoped to neutralize the viability of 10% of the population at a sweep, 
until none were left except themselves. One solution offered was simply execution or euthanasia, as listed in a 1911 study funded by the Carnegies entitled Preliminary Report of the Committee of the Eugenics Section of the American Breeders Association to study and to report on the best practical means for cutting off the defective germ plasm in the human population. Interestingly enough, the most popular idea for euthanasia in the United States at that time was the employment of gas chambers. Black concluded, Hitler studied American eugenics laws. He tried to legitimize his anti-Semitism by medicalizing it and wrapping it in the more palatable pseudo-scientific facade of eugenics. Hitler was able to recruit more followers among reasonable Germans by claiming that science was on his side. When Hitler's race hatred sprung from his own mind, the intellectual outlines of the eugenics Hitler adopted in 1924 were made in America. Despite much public renunciation of eugenics following the revelations of the Nazi racial extermination programs at the Nuremberg trials, work on population control continues right up to today under more politically correct names. Some conspiracy-oriented researchers see the fingerprints of eugenics theology in today's efforts to reduce the human population as previously discussed. Many of the same families and foundations that support birth control organizations today were connected to the eugenics movement of the past. According to its summary of financial activities ending in June 2008, Planned Parenthood ended the year with $966.7 million in revenues. Of this amount, $349.6 million came from unspecified government grants and contracts, compared to $374.7 million from its health care centers and $186 million in private contributions and bequests. The Psychology of conservatism. In August 2003, the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, and the National Science Foundation, NSF, announced the results of a $1.2 million taxpayer-funded study. The conclusion was that people who believe in traditional values, such as monogamous marriage, balanced budgets, strict interpretation of the Constitution, are mentally disturbed. In studying what they called the psychology of conservatism, the researchers wrote that the core of political conservatism is a resistance to change and a tolerance for inequality that promote fear and uncertainty. This results in psychological factors commonly linked to conservatism, such as fear and aggression, dogmatism and intolerance of ambiguity, uncertainty avoidance, a need for cognitive closure, and terror management. In their paper entitled Political Conservatism as Motivated Social Cognition, the authors concluded that political conservatism stems from the need to satisfy various psychological needs, but admitted that it is unlikely that conservative ideology can be ascribed to a single motivational syndrome. The researchers also admit in the paper that their term motivated social cognition refers to a number of assumptions about the relationship between people's belief and their motivational underpinnings. They compared Hitler, Mussolini, and President Ronald W. Reagan as right-wing conservatives, saying they all shared a resistance to change and the acceptance of inequality. So, in addition to being identified in FEMA materials as potential terrorists, thanks to psychobabble funded by NIMH and the NSF, Constitutionalists are now in danger of being diagnosed with a mental disorder. And what should be done with political conservatives suffering from motivated social cognition? Dr. Jose M. R. Delgado, a former professor of neuropsychiatry at Yale University Medical School, and a man who has been connected with the CIA's MK Ultra mind control experiments, has recommended. We need a program of psychosurgery for political control of our society. The purpose is physical control of the mind. Everyone who deviates from the given norm can be surgically mutilated. The individual may think that the most important reality is his own existence, but this is only his personal point of view. 
Man does not have the right to develop his own mind. We must electronically control the brain. Someday armies and generals will be controlled by electronic stimulation of the brain. Dr. Delgado will enjoy living in the Orwellian digitally controlled New World Order. Drug the women and children first. It is very possible that the globalists are now trying to control the minds of American citizens by funding research facilities and by supporting specific legislation. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has urged routine screening of all American teenagers for depression, and politicians were ready to step up to the plate. Just three months into 2009, Congress was introduced to eight bills on widespread mental health screening. In 2007, legislation entitled the Postpartum Mood Disorders Prevention Act was introduced. It called for the mental screening of mothers for signs of depression. Such screening for depression may soon become state law in Illinois. Similar legislation has already been adopted or at least introduced in several other states. In 2009, this mass screening scheme was brought up again as the Melanie Blocker Stokes Mom's Opportunity to Access Health, Education, Research, and Support for Postpartum Depression Act of 2009, otherwise known simply as the Mother's Act. This law was reintroduced into both bodies of the new Congress in January 2009, after the 2007 bill died in the Senate in 2008. Critics see the Mother's Act as an insidious plan that essentially would allow for infants, pregnant women, and nursing mothers to be drugged even more than usual. The legislation would allow Child Protective Services to take children from their parents with fewer restrictions. This legislation is similar to bills Congress has declined to pass for eight years. The true goal of the promoters of this act is to transform women of childbearing age into lifelong consumers of psychiatric treatment by screening women for a whole list of mood and anxiety disorders and not simply postpartum depression, stated investigative journalist Evelyn Pringle writing for the political newsletter Counterpunch. Enough cannot be said about the ability of anyone with a white coat and a medical title to convince vulnerable pregnant women and new mothers that the thoughts and feelings they experience on any given day might be abnormal. Any woman who has gone through pregnancy knows that there are accompanying periods of ups and downs. Mood swings while carrying a child have been part of the experience since the beginning of time. Except for the few exceptional cases of true clinical depression, to many, it appeared unnecessary to subject normal, healthy women to a regimen of psychiatric drugs at the first sign of a bad day. Another common concern for parents is autism. A recent U.S. government study stemming from the 2007 National Survey of Children's Health reported that autism rates climbed 200 percent between 2001 and 2009. This new estimate indicated about 673,000 American children have autism. This is an alarming increase in a disease that many ill-informed doctors and scientists still brush off as being genetic in origin, said Mike Adams, editor of Natural News, a widely read natural health source. But genes can't explain such a rapid increase in the number of children being diagnosed with the disease. Clearly, some other factor is at work and many parents suspect vaccines are one of the primary contributing factors. In 1998, the Daw Barnes Law Firm of Norfolk, England, along with Freeth Cartwright of Nottingham, filed lawsuits against three manufacturers of measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR, vaccine after parents reported more than 1,500 instances of perceived side effects following the administration of MMR vaccines introduced there in 1988. The firms succeeded in obtaining legal aid for the children, and management of the cases was transferred ultimately to Alexander Harris, Solicitors of London, in 1999. Despite assurances from British health officials denying any connection between side effects and the vaccines, cases were set for trial in the High Court to decide the preliminary issue of whether the vaccine caused symptoms of autism and bowel problems among the claimants. 
The cases were funded under the English legal aid system and supported by 27 experts who prepared reports supporting the children's case. The parents believed their children were normal before being vaccinated and saw nothing but the vaccinations to account for the changes in their children. The cases stalled and have not proceeded after legal aid was withdrawn in August 2003. The June 2009 issue of Toxicological and Environmental Chemistry included a paper that concluded the routine administering of childhood vaccines containing a mercury substance called thimerosal could cause significant cellular toxicity in human neuronal and fetal cells. This latest study confirms that damage from the mercury-based preservative thimerosal does occur in human neuronal and fetal cells even at low concentrations, wrote Dr. Joseph Mercola in the comments section of his Natural Health newsletter. Mercola, owner of the Illinois Natural Health Center, said, Rates of autism in the U.S. have increased nearly 60-fold since the late 1970s rising right along with the increasing number of vaccinations added to the childhood vaccination schedule. Although autism may be apparent soon after birth, most autistic children experience at least several months or even a year or more of normal development, followed by regression, defined as loss of function or failure to progress. Typically, by the age of three, at which time the child has received at least 24 of their scheduled vaccinations, Symptoms of autism are fully apparent, affecting their communication and social skills, and impairing the child's ability to play, speak, and relate to the world. Many people feel the drugs and vaccines being administered to children are not fully tested or guaranteed safe. They feel children are being used as guinea pigs for Big Farm. Mike Adams also spoke out against the exploitation of young children for drug testing and claimed that it amounts to nothing less than chemical child abuse. So-called bipolar disorder was wholly invented by psychiatrists with strong financial ties to drug companies, Adams wrote on his website. The purpose of this disease is not to help children, but to sell drugs to anyone and everyone, including toddlers. He added, I often wonder when the rest of the country will wake up and notice that the mass drugging of our nation's children has gone too far. Why isn't the mainstream media giving this front-page coverage? Why aren't lawmakers demanding an end to the chemical abuse of our children? Why isn't the FDA halting these trials on toddlers out of plain decency? You already know the answer, because they're all making money from this chemical assault on our nation's children. The doctors, hospitals, drug companies, psychiatrists, and mainstream media all profit handsomely from the sales of mind-altering drugs to children. Ethics will never get in the way of old-fashioned greed. Adams said children should be given some sunshine, playtime, and some time with nature instead of drugs. You then get balanced, healthy children. It's no secret. It's just common sense. But psychiatry has no common sense, argued Adams, and no one in the industry dares mention that most so-called mental disorders are really just caused by nutritional imbalances, because to admit to the truth about the mental health of children would be to render their careers irrelevant, and no psychiatrist is going to commit career suicide by admitting that bipolar disorder was just made up, or that toddlers need good food, not expensive drugs. Just like conventional doctors, psychiatrists have to protect their egos and revenue streams. And that means convincing parents that little Johnny has a brain chemistry imbalance and he'll have to take psychotropic drugs for life. The parents, as gullible as ever, naively go along with the scam, usually after being frightened into compliance by a psychiatrist who warns them what might happen to little Johnny if they don't drug him. He might commit suicide, they're sternly warned. Bipolar disorder is a psychiatric diagnosis describing persons, usually children, who display a wide range of emotions, who experience exuberant highs and depressing lows. Others do not see such behavior as a disorder, but rather the normal ups and downs of the growth process. There is no scientific means to confirm a diagnosis of bipolar disorder.
David Healy, a former secretary of the British Association for Psychopharmacology and author of Mania, a book on bipolar disorder, said this disorder is somewhat of a mythical entity. The problems that currently are grouped under the heading bipolar disorder are akin to problems that, in the late 1960s and 1970s, would have been called anxiety and treated with tranquilizers or, during the 1990s, would have been labeled depression and treated with antidepressants, said Healy in a 2009 interview in Psychology Today. Referring to what he described as biobabble, Healy said this refers to things like the supposed lowering of serotonin levels and the chemical imbalance that are said to lie at the heart of mood disorders. This is as mythical as the supposed alterations of libido that Freudian theory says are at the heart of psychodynamic disorders. While libido and serotonin are real things, the way these terms were once used by psychoanalysts and psychopharmacologists now, especially in the way they have seeped into popular culture, bears no relationship to any underlying serotonin level or measurable chemical imbalance or disorder of libido. What's astonishing is how quickly these terms were taken up by popular culture and how widely, with so many people now routinely referring to their serotonin levels being out of whack when they are feeling wrong or unwell. In the case of bipolar disorder, the biomyths center on ideas of mood stabilization, but there is no evidence that the drugs stabilize moods. In fact, it is not even clear that it makes sense to talk about a mood center in the brain. A further piece of mythology aimed at keeping people on the drugs is that these are neuroprotective, but there's no evidence that this is the case, and in fact, these drugs can lead to brain damage. Some historians believe Vincent van Gogh suffered from bipolar disorder. Fortunately, there were no synthetic psychiatric drugs available in his day to dull him down and prevent him from completing his works of art, today considered masterpieces. Flu and Other Swinish Ideas I'm going to get the swine flu vaccination, if that helps at all. But I'll tell you, my wife is not going to immunize our kids. Dr. Mehmet Oz, Vice Chair and Professor of Surgery at Columbia University and host of The Doctors, when asked on CNN if his family would be inoculated with the swine flu vaccine. The United States was once an industrial fountainhead, spewing forth streams of consumer goods such as automobiles, televisions, and refrigerators in international trade. Now, America is merely a nation of zombies working in the service industry. Today, America's largest consumer goods industries are health care and legal drugs. Not feeling well? Just take a pill, even if you think you don't need one. Big Farm Pays Off In Surviving America's Depression Epidemic, Dr. Bruce Levine explained how the pharmaceutical industry's psychological drug cartel works. Mental health treatment in the United States is now a multi-billion dollar industry, and all the rules of industrial complexes apply. Not only does Big Pharma have influential psychiatrists in their pocket, virtually every mental health institution from which doctors, the press, and the general public receive their mental health information is financially interconnected with Big Pharma. The American Psychiatric Association, psychiatry's professional organization, is hugely dependent on drug company grants, and this is also true for the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill and other so-called consumer organizations. Harvard and other prestigious university psychiatry departments take millions of dollars from drug companies, and the National Institutes of Mental Health funds researchers who are financially connected with drug companies. Sometimes the money goes to the people right at the top of these organizations. Dr. Charles Nemeroff, chairman of Emory University's psychiatry department, was one of several academics who came under investigation by the Senate Finance Committee for failing to disclose millions of dollars in income from pharmaceutical corporations. According to Senate Finance Committee reports, Nemeroff was paid more than $960,000 by Paxil maker GlaxoSmithKline from 2000 through 2006. Yet Nemeroff listed less than $35,000 on his Emory disclosure forms. 
Apparently, Nemiroff had earnings that totaled $2.8 million from speaking and consulting arrangements with drug companies between 2000 and 2007, but only disclosed a fraction of that amount. Compare that to the fact that Emory University's entire Department of Psychiatry received only $25,000 in 2008 from drug manufacturer Eli Lilly, according to the first quarter report of that firm. After the controversy, Nemiroff stepped down as department chairman. In late 2009, Nemiroff was named chairman of the psychiatry department at the University of Miami. Nemiroff joined other prominent psychiatrists who recently have been exposed for extensive conflicts of interest due to millions in undisclosed funding from pharmaceutical corporations. There was also concern over big farm funding selected advocacy groups. The majority of the public may or may not be familiar with these so-called mental health advocacy organizations, such as the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, CHAD, or the myriad of bipolar depression or ADHD support groups that are inundating the Internet. But they need to be, advised the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, CCHR. These are groups operating under the guise of advocates for the mentally ill, which in reality are heavily funded pharmaceutical front groups, lobbying and working on state and federal laws which affect the entire nation, from our elderly in nursing homes to our military, pregnant women, and nursing mothers and school children. Another issue that is as troublesome as that of Big Farm lining the pockets of academics is the revolving door between government drug experts and Big Farm executives. In 2009, former CDC chief Dr. Julie Gerberding became president of Merck's vaccine division. Thus, the former chief of the top public disease agency now oversees the $5 billion Merck division that markets the vaccines for cervical cancer, chicken pox, and of course, H1N1 swine flu. Natural News Editor Mike Adams noted, The CDC has been running defense for Merck for many years, downplaying vaccine side effects and insisting that Merck's vaccines are safe. Now that the president of Merck's vaccine division and the former chief of the CDC are one and the same, it brings up obvious questions of whether there was some level of ongoing collusion between the CDC and Merck and how deeply Dr. Gerberding might have been involved. Adams, who advocated a law prohibiting government public health officials from ever working for pharmaceutical corporations, added, There's just too much risk of cross-contamination of influence, which is why we have the corruption and collusion problems we're seeing today with the FDA, FTC, and CDC, all of which seem to be operating as marketing extensions of the pharmaceutical industry. Adjuvants and Squalene in mid-2009, the World Health Organization, WHO, and the CDC predicted a death-dealing onslaught of swine flu, a curious mixture of older human influenza viruses mixed with strains of avian, bird flu, and swine flu designated H1N1, a subtype of the influenza A virus. Both the WHO and the CDC talked seriously about instituting mandatory inoculations during the swine flu scare of 2009. Even in the midst of the flu scare, critics were accusing pharmaceutical corporations of manipulating the WHO in an effort to sell swine flu vaccines so as to recoup the millions of dollars they had invested in researching and developing pandemic vaccines following the bird flu scares of 2006 and 2007. In early 2010, Dr. Wolfgang Wudarg, the president of the Health Committee of the Council of Europe, accused the pharmaceutical lobbies and the governments involved of a great campaign of panic based on the swine flu. A German epidemiologist by profession, Wudarg won unanimous approval from the Health Committee of the Council of Europe for a commission of inquiry into what he described as a massive operation of disinformation. Others had even deeper suspicions. Could it be that the swine flu epidemic was manufactured? There is strong evidence that this man-made disease comes from post-World War II era biological warfare experimentation, as discussed in the section on mycoplasmas. 
It is obvious that the vaccine manufacturers stand to make billions of dollars in profits from this WHO government promoted pandemic, said Dr. Russell Blaylock, a board certified neurosurgeon, author and lecturer. Novartis, the maker of the new pandemic vaccine, recently announced that they would not give free vaccines to impoverished nations. Everybody pays. One must keep in mind that once the vaccine is injected, there is little you can do to protect yourself, at least by conventional medicine. It will mean a lifetime of crippling illness and early death. There are much safer ways to protect oneself from this flu virus, such as higher doses of vitamin D3, selective immune enhancement using supplements, and a good diet. In an article titled, The Vaccine May Be More Dangerous Than Swine Flu, Blaylock examined the swine flu pandemic from both 1976 and 2009 and pointed out that Novartis made an agreement with WHO for a pandemic vaccine. What is terrifying is that these pandemic vaccines contain ingredients called immune adjuvants that a number of studies have shown cause devastating autoimmune disorders, including rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and lupus. Animal studies using this adjuvant have found them to be deadly. A study using 14 guinea pigs found that when they were injected with the special adjuvant, only one animal survived. A repeat of the study found the same deadly outcome, reported Blaylock. The adjuvant Blaylock mentioned in his article is called squalene, a chemical that may have something to do with Gulf War syndrome, the mysterious illness that afflicted many Gulf War veterans. Squalene is an unsaturated organic compound that acts as an intermediary in the production of cholesterol. Squalene occurs normally in the human body, but at low levels in blood plasma and at elevated levels in viral influenza. Squalene was initially derived for commercial use from shark liver oil. Today, a synthetic form of squalene is used in a number of pharmaceuticals. For years, the Department of Defense denied the presence of squalene in the anthrax vaccine. However, the FDA tested several samples of the vaccine and found the compound throughout in varying levels. Citing the Military Vaccine Resource Directory website, Dr. Anders Brun Larsen, who has written extensively on vaccines in general and squalene in particular, noted, the average quantity of squalene injected into the U.S. soldiers abroad and at home in the anthrax vaccine during and after the Gulf War was 34.2 micrograms per billion micrograms of water. According to one study, this was the cause of the Gulf War syndrome in 25% of 697,000 U.S. personnel at home and abroad. Larson said these values were confirmed by Professor Robert F. Gary in testimony before the House Subcommittee on National Security, Veterans Affairs, and International Relations in 2002. Gary was the man to first discover the connection between the Gulf War syndrome and squalene. Squalene was subsequently banned from use by the Pentagon by a federal court judge in 2004. The Constitution of the United States makes it clear that the sanctity of the individual person is inviolate, except under a court order following due process. Article 4 of the Bill of Rights states, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, house, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Articles 9 and 10 clearly restrain any act of the federal government against the states or the people. Forcing people to submit to an involuntary injection is an egregious form of restricting freedom. How can we call someone free if that person cannot determine for themselves what may be injected into their own body? There are many people who believe that they should be able to object to mandatory inoculations. These people should consider the State Emergency Medical Powers Act and Patriot Acts 1, 2, and 3 and BARDA or Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. These acts make it legal for mandatory vaccinations or druggings to take place without exemptions. Regarding the dangers of swine flu inoculations, Dr. Larson said that many people's fears are with the adjuvants in the vaccines, in particular squalene, which in all probability was responsible for the Gulf War syndrome. 
There is also a great deal of fear over the virus's antigens condition, dead, attenuated, live, and a deeply rooted mistrust in our politicians and the vaccine producers' motives and morals. Larson said one vaccine allotment contained 10.68 milligrams of squalene per 0.5 milliliters. This corresponds to 2,136,000 micrograms per billion micrograms of water. That is, one million times more squalene per dose than noted in the military vaccine resource directory. There is every reason to believe that this will make people sick to a much higher extent than in 1990-91. This appears murderous to me. Larson said he contacted the medical authorities in Denmark, where the government has ordered mass vaccinations, only to discover they knew nothing about the composition of one vaccine called Pandramix, manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. Then I addressed the Danish Medicinal Agency, they admitted that the Pandramix vaccine from GlaxoSmithKline does contain squalene and thimerosal, noted Larson. They've not rejected my remark that the squalene concentration is dangerous. In contrast, the AstraZeneca Metamune nasal vaccination avoids squalene side effects. Although in the past the FDA has banned squalene, this ban may have been ignored during the rush to develop a swine flu vaccine after President Obama declared swine flu a national emergency in late October 2009. Clearly, bypassing the FDA requirements for safety testing of these new adjuvants and the vaccines which contain them puts the entire population at risk for serious, possibly life-threatening side effects, particularly any of the 12,000 paid trial participants 6,000 children who are unfortunate enough to be randomized into the adjuvant-containing groups, warned Larson. My advice, if you are forced to be vaccinated against the harmless swine flu, H1N1, demand a vaccination with the AstraZeneca nasal vaccine, Metimmune, thereby avoiding squalene side effects. Actually getting the swine flu vaccination can be a painful ordeal. According to information supplied by the vaccine manufacturer Novartis, reactions to the vaccine's injection site may include pain that may limit limb movement, redness, swelling, warmth, ecchymosis, which is bleeding, and induration, or loss of feeling. Possible side effects to the swine flu vaccine may include hot flashes or flushes, chills, fever, malaise, shivering, fatigue, asthenia, loss of strength, facial edema, excess moisture, immune system disorders, hypersensitivity reactions, including throat and or mouth edema, cardiovascular disorders, vasculitis, blood vessel inflammation, syncope shortly after vaccination or temporary loss of consciousness, digestive disorders, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, blood and lymphatic disorders, metabolic and nutritional disorders, loss of appetite, arthralgia, joint pain, myalgia, muscle pain, myasthenia, muscle weakness, nervous system disorders, headache, dizziness, neuralgia, paresthesia, tickling or numbness, febrile convulsions, glan barre syndrome, myelitis, including encephalomyelitis, and transverse myelitis, inflammation of the spinal cord or bone marrow, neuropathy, abnormalities in the nervous system, including neuritis, paralysis, including Bell's palsy or facial paralysis, respiratory disorders, dyspnea or shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, pharyngitis, throat inflammation, rhinitis, nose inflammation, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, a life-threatening skin condition, pruritus, skin itching, urticaria, skin eruptions, and rashes. In rare cases, hypersensitivity reactions may lead to anaphylactic shock and death, stated Novartis literature on the vaccine. The extremeness of these side effects may explain why several physicians publicly issued warnings against the swine flu vaccine. Some pointed to some unsavory history regarding vaccines, these warnings were not lost on thoughtful Americans who also questioned the effectiveness of the vaccine. 
A September 2009 poll by the University of Michigan's C.S. Mott Children's Hospital indicated that out of 1,678 parents, 60% decided against vaccinating their children. About half of the parents who objected to the H1N1 flu shot expressed concern about possible side effects of the vaccine. Only 40% said they would agree to an inoculation against the swine flu. Almost half of those polled indicated they did not expect their kids to become infected or did not believe in the seriousness of the flu pandemic. Dr. Matthew Davis, University of Michigan Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine and the poll's director, noted differences along racial and ethnic lines in parents' responses. More than half of Latino parents said they would bring their kids to get vaccinated, whereas only 38% of white parents and 30% of African-American parents said they would do so. A September 2009 Canadian study from researchers at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control and Laval University also called into question the effectiveness of the swine flu vaccine. The study indicated that people vaccinated against seasonal flu are twice as likely to catch the swine flu. The lead researchers from the study were prevented from speaking in public until their study is reviewed and published. Despite skepticism over the study's results, which contradict previous governmental assurances that swine flu inoculations are safe, several provincial Canadian health agencies announced that they were suspending seasonal flu vaccinations. It has confused things very badly, said Dr. Ethan Rubenstein, head of adult infectious diseases at the University of Manitoba. And it has certainly cost us credibility from the public because of conflicting recommendations. Until last week, there had always been much encouragement to get the seasonal flu vaccine. He said the study methodology appeared sound. There are a large number of authors, all of them excellent and credible researchers of this study. And the sample size is very large, 12 or 13 million people taken from the central reporting systems in three provinces. The research is solid. Many people were objecting to the hype over the pandemic, though it was not reported much at all. The results of a mid-2009 survey of Hong Kong healthcare workers indicated that more than half of the doctors and nurses questioned would decline the swine flu vaccine if they were offered inoculation. In fact, an initial study of 2,225 healthcare specialists in the Hong Kong public hospital system showed that only 28.4% indicated an overall willingness to accept pre-pandemic H5N1 vaccine. The most prevalent reasons that the healthcare workers declined shots were a fear of side effects and doubts about the vaccine's efficacy. Only after the media started spreading fear about the flu and after the WHO raised the pandemic alert level to Phase 5 did a second survey show the above percentage rise to 47.9. The most common reasons that respondents gave for why they would accept the vaccine were wish to be protected and following health authorities' advice. Apparently, some American workers won't even get a choice when it comes to vaccinations. Albany Medical Center spokesman Gregory McGarry confirmed that corrective action might be taken against workers who did not follow orders to get a flu shot by October 16, 2009. Under emergency regulations adopted by the State Hospital Review and Planning Council in August 2009, officials for Capital Region Hospitals in New York State threatened disciplinary action and even termination if all workers, including janitors, food service workers, doctors, and nurses, refused to take the vaccination shots. Elmer Streeter, a spokesman for St. Peter's Hospital in Albany, told newsmen in August, There are very few exceptions. We will be requiring flu shots of all our employees as a condition of employment. Local news reports stated that workers first would be suspended for five days if they refused the shot. After another five days, they would face possible termination. Despite the fact that President Barack Obama declared swine flu a national emergency, and despite the WHO's classification of the disease as a worldwide pandemic, serious researchers and some mainstream news outlets, such as CBS, reported that the counting of swine flu victims was widely overestimated, 
and that many people diagnosed with the flu did not have it at all. According to CBS reporter Cheryl Atkinson, in late July 2009, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, abruptly advised states to stop testing for H1N1 flu and stopped counting individual cases. The rationale given for the CDC guidance to forego testing and tracking individual cases was, why waste resources testing for H1N1 flu when the government has already confirmed there's an epidemic? CBS News learned that the decision to stop counting H1N1 flu cases was made so hastily that states weren't given the opportunity to provide input. CBS requested state-by-state -state information on swine flu victims, but the news organization was stalled for some time by the CDC. Everyone was shocked when the figures for state flu cases were finally released. The vast majority of cases were negative for H1N1 as well as seasonal flu, despite the fact that many states were specifically testing patients deemed to be the most likely to have H1N1 flu, based on symptoms and risk factors such as travel to Mexico, CBS reported. Even real cases were hyped by a compliant corporate media. One headline in September 2009 stated, H1N1 flu infects over 250 Georgetown students. Yet a closer investigation at Georgetown University showed the number of sick students came only from estimates made by counting students who went to the student health center with flu symptoms. Students at the emergency room and even those who called the H1N1 hotline or the health care center's doctor on call, not from laboratory tests. In early February 2010, the whole stressful pandemic of swine flu was unraveling, with vaccines being returned to manufacturers unsold. Sanofi Pasteur in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, issued a nationwide recall of its H1N1 vaccine after it was discovered to have a lack of potency. The discovery was made after allotments had been shipped to all 50 states. The Kansas City Pandemic of 1921 The swine flu pandemic may be just the latest occurrence in a history of instances where powerful organizations exaggerated the dangers of a disease in order to profit from scaring the population. In the early 1920s in Kansas City, Missouri, a citizen's watchdog group called the Advertisers Protective Bureau successfully prosecuted the Missouri State Chapter of the AMA, the Jackson Medical Society, for unduly spreading fear about a smallpox pandemic when none existed. The Bureau reported, In the fall of 1921, the health of the city was unusually good, but slow for the doctors, so the Jackson Medical Society met and resolved to make an epidemic in the city. According to the minutes of this meeting, a motion was made and seconded that a recommendation be made by the committee to the Board of Health that an epidemic of smallpox be declared in the city. It was moved and seconded that a day be set aside, termed Vaccination Day, on which physicians would be stationed at all schools, clinics, public buildings, and hospitals to vaccinate free of charge. It is further recommended that wide publicity be given, stating that vaccination is a preventative of smallpox, and urging the absolute necessity of vaccination for every man, woman, and child in the city. Dr. A. True Ott, a naturopathic medical doctor and talk show host who specializes in health and medicine issues, researched this case and noted the Jackson Medical Society's propaganda blitz was highly successful. Over a million previously healthy and happy American citizens were hypnotized and terrorized into placing the vaccine toxins into their bloodstreams. All public school children in the region were vaccinated while at school. Parents who dared question the vaccination of their children were ostracized and publicly vilified. The court record on this case is very clear. In the weeks and months following the mass vaccinations, the area's hospital beds were filled to overflowing with vaccine-induced smallpox cases. Tens of thousands of people became ill and many hundreds of innocents died, and many more were permanently crippled. 
Of course, the newspapers then trumpeted how wise the medical establishment was to promote the vaccines, stating how much worse the death toll would have been without the vaccination campaign. Evidence presented in court showed there was no epidemic at any time, either in Kansas City or the state. However, the Jackson Medical Society produced large quantities of posters, flyers, newspaper stories, and ads featuring lurid pictures of children covered with massive smallpox sores and open wounds. The Advertiser's Protective Bureau later proved that these photographs came from British newspapers. According to Dr. Ott, while the Protective Bureau won the criminal court case, the American people lost. The case should have made front-page headlines around the nation, showing the modus operandi of certain corrupt medical practitioners, how, by means of fraud, treachery, and trickery, the Jackson Medical Society made millions of dollars in windfall profits while thousands of innocent, trusting, and naive Americans suffered and died. The entire sordid affair with all its damning details was kept out of the American press. John D. Rockefeller's AMA, American Medical Association, with its millions of dollars of influence, made sure of that. The polio vaccine of the 1950s is yet another instance in which a vaccine has hurt Americans more than it has helped. Prior to the polio vaccine, parents were deathly afraid their children would contract polio, an infectious viral disease often resulting in paralysis or permanent disability, such as suffered by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The population was greatly relieved with the discovery and distribution of the Jonas Salk polio vaccine beginning in the mid-1950s. But after millions of Americans and others around the world were given the new vaccine, scientists discovered the vaccine contained a cancer-causing monkey virus called simian vacuolating virus 40, or SV40, a virus closely related to human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and one that was born through the manufacture of the polio vaccine from infected monkey glands. SV40 has been connected to brain tumors, bone cancers, lung cancers, and leukemia. It can be transmitted from mother to child in the womb as well as through sexual intercourse. There's been a good deal of documentation over how pervasive this disease has become in the American population. Yet, very little of this story has been brought to the attention of the public by the corporate mass media. Conspiracy-minded researchers are suspicious that no samples of pre-1962 polio vaccine can be found. Although more than 10 million people were inoculated with potentially contaminated batches of vaccine, there is now no way to determine if they were exposed to the SV40 virus which can lie dormant in the human body for years before causing tumors and cancer. And one should not forget the swine flu scare of 1976 when President Gerald R. Ford and some 40 million Americans dutifully took swine flu shots. And what was the death toll from that flu? Exactly one. The poor soldier who started the scare in the first place. The soldier died after his body reacted to an experimental vaccine while he was completing a forced march during training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Others in the country had received the same experimental vaccine, and several deaths were reported. Just as disturbing, hundreds of others who were vaccinated suffered from Guillain Barre syndrome, GBS, a debilitating response to the immune system that causes lupus or paralysis in the extremities and the facial muscles. Gilan Barre is one of the world's leading causes of non-trauma-induced paralysis. Court cases against the government and the vaccine manufacturers stacked up in the years following the 1976 scare. In July 2009, the media reported that Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius had taken steps to prevent a recurrence of lawsuits similar to those from 1976 by signing an order granting legal immunity to vaccine makers. This order was issued under provisions written into a 2006 law for public health emergencies. Paul Pennock, a New York plaintiff's attorney on medical liability cases, was critical of the grant of immunity. He stated, 
If you're going to ask people to do this for the common good, then let's make sure for the common good that these people will be taken care of if something goes wrong. Though some may argue that liability is not an issue to consider in vaccination cases, the case of Lance Corporal Yosef Lopez of Missouri is an appropriate rebuttal. After being deployed to Iraq for just nine days, Lopez ended up paralyzed in a coma and unable to breathe on his own. Had he been shot? Had his truck come too close to a roadside bomb? No. Lopez suffered a violent reaction to a smallpox vaccine administered by the military. Three years later, Lopez still had to wear a urine bag, walked with a limp, suffered short-term memory loss, and was taking 15 pills a day to control leg spasms. Yet when Lopez applied for GI benefits, the Veterans Administration rejected him, claiming that benefits are for traumatic injury, not disease, not illness, not preventative medicine. Stephen Wirtz, the VA's Deputy Assistant Director for Insurance, said administrators were simply trying to follow the intent of Congress. It has nothing to do with not believing these people deserve some compensation for their losses. VA officials were unable to say how many claims have been rejected because of vaccine-related injuries. The Military Vaccine Agency, which is in charge of troop vaccinations, did not respond to repeated requests for comment from a reporter. Despite Lance Corporal Yosef Lopez's debilitating reaction to the flu vaccine, the Defense Department announced on September 1, 2009, that swine flu vaccines were mandatory for all military personnel, including health care workers, deploying troops, those serving on ships and submarines, and new enlistees at the top of the list. Any place where we take a lot of people, squash them all together, and put them under stressful conditions will get the vaccine first, stated Army Lieutenant Colonel Wayne Hashey, Director of Preventative Medicine for Department of Defense Health Affairs. The vaccination program was to begin in early October 2009 and millions of doses had been ready. Despite the fact that only 29 swine flu deaths were reported in Mexico by September 1, 2009, the U.S. corporate mass media continued a blitz of coverage on what was described as the pending pandemic. That's not an epidemic. This has all the markings of a propaganda campaign benefiting the huge pharmaceutical firms producing vaccines. It's more than monetary motives that are driving this push. There seems to be a long-term agenda of making people totally dependent upon government money and actions to manage health, wrote Joel Skousen of World Affairs Brief, a long-running Internet news roundup service. During the height of the swine flu scare, the Centers for Disease Control earmarked $16 million for an outreach program in major metropolitan areas that was aimed at garnering support for the swine flu inoculations. At the same time, major TV networks such as ABC and NBC were refusing to air ads that warned of the dangers of the vaccines or that criticized President Obama's health care plan. Your biggest threat is first, schools, if you have children, and second, the workplace, if they task employers to demand compliance of their employees. I oppose these measures as a matter of personal liberty and also due to the long history of vaccine contamination with immune-damaging adjuvants like squalene and mercury, warned Skousen. Of course, public schools, incubator of all things contagious, are back in session in September. Newscasters fret that the swine flu vaccine won't be ready for school children until mid-October, clearly implying that an all-school children vaccination campaign is coming. All of this hype is aimed at priming everyone with sufficient fear so they will clamor for the vaccine, which could be very dangerous to your health. If history is any indicator, you won't see a dramatic rise in swine flu cases until the vaccine is administered. Vaccines often carry some live virus by mistake. As the school year began across the nation, schools prepared for what the Associated Press described as the most widespread school vaccinations since the days of polio. The National School Boards Association told the AP that three-quarters of the districts in a recent survey agreed to allow vaccinations in school buildings, and according to an AP poll, almost two-thirds of the parents queried said they would give permission to have their children vaccinated if the vaccines were offered for free 
through the school. South Carolina School Superintendent Jim Rex said his state planned at least one vaccination clinic in each of the state's 85 school districts. South Dakota planned to offer both regular and swine flu vaccinations in many schools, said South Dakota State Health Secretary Deneen Hollingsworth. In mid-September 2009, more than 700 health and school officials participated in the National Association of County and City Health Officials online seminar about how to run school flu vaccinations. Despite all the media hype, official hand-wringing, and experts predicting a deadly repeat of the 1918 killer pandemic, as of this writing, the swine flu appeared to be just another scam to increase profits for the pharmaceutical corporations and a failed attempt to see how much public control could be garnered by the global fascists. Flu Fears with the history of the false smallpox epidemic in Kansas City as an indication of corporate malfeasance, one should look at who profits from pandemics. With swine flu, there should be public scrutiny of Baxter International, the giant worldwide pharmaceutical conglomerate that was given millions to develop a swine flu vaccine. In 2008, 44% of its total profits 5.3 billion dollars came from pharmaceuticals and vaccines. In 2010, several websites were claiming that President Obama, as a senator in 2005, bought $50,000 worth of stock shares in two companies, one being Baxter. Apparently, in March 2005, Senator Obama attached an amendment to the Foreign Relations Committee Authorization Act, S-600, authorizing $25 million for international efforts to combat the avian influenza. On April 28, 2005, Obama introduced the Avian Act, S-969, a comprehensive bill addressing the threat of an avian flu pandemic. Interestingly enough, major outbreaks of the avian flu took place in 2006 and 2007, which prompted some to wonder how Obama could have known about the problem in 2005. Baxter has been the center of several controversies, one of which was the adulteration of an avian flu vaccine with a pathogen. In late February 2009, a batch of the usual seasonal flu vaccines from a Baxter lab in Austria was contaminated with live H5N1 avian flu viruses, which has a 60% kill rate, and shipped to subcontractors in several countries. Luckily, some cautious researchers in the Czech Republic decided to inject the vaccine into laboratory ferrets to observe any side effects. The ferrets all died. Baxter officials quickly said the offending vaccines were destroyed and that preventative and corrective measures had been instituted. Baxter's distribution of the adulterated flu vaccine caused concern. To many, it illustrated how sloppy corporate handling of deadly viruses could break out into a full-blown public disaster, and others even saw this as an attempt to spread a pandemic for which the company could provide an antidote. For a price, of course. Christopher Bona, Baxter's Director of General Bioscience Communications, confirmed that the experimental virus material contained live avian flu virus but explained this was the result of just the process itself and technical and human error in this procedure. One great fear of combining seasonal flu virus with a virulent avian flu virus, a process called reassortment, is that such mixing could produce new hybrid bird human viruses with dire consequences for the human population. The Czech media publicly questioned if Baxter's distribution of the deadly virus might have been a conspiracy to initiate a multi-nation pandemic, a charge that may not be that absurd. According to routine laboratory protocols for vaccine makers, it is virtually impossible to accidentally mix a deadly live virus with a vaccine. Mike Adams, editor of Natural News and a former trial tester for pharmaceutical companies, wrote... Baxter is acting a whole lot like a biological terrorism organization these days, sending deadly viral samples around the world. 
If you mail an envelope full of anthrax to your senator, you get arrested as a terrorist. So why is Baxter, which mailed samples of a far more deadly viral strain to labs around the world, getting away with saying, essentially, oops? It seems Baxter has a long history of problems and controversies with its operations as well as its products. Beginning in the mid-1990s, more than a half dozen persons in the United Kingdom tried to sue Baxter, Bayer, and four other pharmaceutical firms in the United States, claiming all had shipped blood contaminated with the HIV virus to Britain. The suits were continuing in 2007 after an American judge ordered the case moved to the United Kingdom. In 2008, Baxter was charged with the distribution of contaminated doses of the Chinese-produced drug heparin, a blood thinner that is used in kidney dialysis. The heparin was provided to Baxter by Scientific Protein Laboratories of Wanakee, Wisconsin, and emanated from its plant in Changzhou City, China. The company is Baxter's main supplier of the active pharmaceutical ingredient in heparin. In 2009, Baxter's subsidiary, Baxter Healthcare Corporation, settled a suit over excessive Medicaid billing in Kentucky for $2 million. Following an investigation, that state's attorney general, Jack Conway, had charged Baxter with charging the Kentucky Medicaid program inflated average wholesale prices for its intravenous solutions, bearing no relationship to prices the firm charged its customers. This created an artificial large gap between Baxter's published prices and the real prices. At times, this difference exceeded 1,300 percent, causing the Kentucky Medicaid program to pay substantially more for Baxter's drugs than their actual cost. On August 15, 2001, two elderly patients in Spain died within hours of receiving dialysis from Baxter products. Eventually, 51 more patients would die. Though the cause was unclear, the company issued a worldwide recall of Baxter's two lines of filters, the sole common link between all the equipment used by the patients. Harry Kramer, the company president at the time, apologized for the errors, shut down the factory producing filters, alerted competitors of the issue, and took a 40% pay cut along with a 20% cut for other executives. The company's earnings dropped by $189 million as a result of the issues. The company took quick action to reduce the impact of the event and prevent future recurrence and as a result suffered minimal damage to its reputation. Despite Baxter's troubled past, at the end of 2009 the company remained one of the top contenders for making the swine flu vaccine. This is perhaps due to the fact that in 2008 Baxter was the first pharmaceutical company to announce the development of a swine flu vaccine. What is suspicious about the timing of Baxter's 2008 announcement is that the company applied for a patent on several viruses, including swine flu, on August 28, 2007, nearly two years before the disease was said to have suddenly appeared in Mexico. The fortuitous timing of Baxter's patent claim provides much grist for the mills of conspiracy theorists. One of Baxter's competitors was Novartis Pharmaceuticals. In 2006, Novartis acquired the Chiron Vaccine Company, which at the time was embroiled in controversy after Britain's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency suspended the company's license to make the influenza vaccine Fluvirin in 2004. Both firms had agreements with the World Health Organization to produce a pandemic vaccine. Author, lecturer, and neurosurgeon Dr. Russell Blaylock warned, The Baxter swine flu vaccine called Selvapan has had fast-track approval. It uses a new varicell technology which utilizes cultured cells from the African green monkey. This same animal tissue transmits a number of vaccine-contaminating viruses including the HIV virus. Adjuvants are oil-based additives placed in vaccines that prompt the body to create antibodies against the targeted virus. Adjuvants can cause extreme inflammation. Animals injected with such adjuvants develop painful incurable autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus. 
Blaylock said that after reviewing a number of studies on the adjuvant MF-59, which contained squalene, he noticed something interesting. Several studies done on human test subjects found MF-59 to be a very safe immune adjuvant. But when I checked to see who did these studies, I found, to no surprise, that they were done by the Novartis Pharmaceutical Company and Chiron Pharmaceutical Company, which have merged. They were all published in prestigious medical journals. Also, to no surprise, a great number of studies done by independent laboratories and research institutions all found a strong link between MF-59 and autoimmune diseases. It is interesting to note that Daniel Vassella, chairman and CEO of Novartis, has regularly attended the secretive Bilderberg meetings since 1998. One would be foolhardy to believe that sheer coincidence could explain that, just two months after the 2009 Bilderberg meeting in Athens, the U.S. government gave Novartis $690 million to manufacture swine flu vaccines. It should be no secret how such deals are accomplished, considering the globalists in government service who attend Bilderberg meetings, such as Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and others. It might also be noted that Novartis came from the 1996 merger of Siba Geigy and Sandoz Laboratories, both originally German entities and part of the massive IG Farben chemical cartel. The full name is Interessengemeinschaft Farben Industrie Aktiengelschaft, or Syndicate of Dyestuff Industry Corporations. It was the world's greatest chemical drug combine from its inception in 1925 and a major supporter of the Nazi regime until broken up by the Allies at the end of World War II. This, once again, establishes a clear link between the old German Nazis who desired to clean up the human gene pool by killing off undesirables and the giant pharmaceutical houses of today, run by globalists who also desire to trim the human herd.